The Necklace Written and published by Jane Vergara Part 1 Chapter 1 The first thing that Rachel Smith saw as she entered the doctor's clinic was the stack of medical books neatly arranged on an old oak bookcase. At the bottom was a set of hardbound encyclopedias, all 26 books with golden embossed titles. To the right wall was a grandfather clock, and on the side table was an old family picture in a wooden frame with the tiny heads all smiling up at her. These made her think that the doctor she was visiting could probably have a penchant for antiques for who in this day and age, who would still buy an encyclopedia set. She smiled inwardly. At least there was something that made her smile today aside from Dave, her husband, who she left at home with their son. Please have a seat, said a low deep voice. Rachel took the chair in front of Dr. Alex Jones's desk. She stopped fidgeting with her fingers when she noticed that one of her nails had a chipped polish, and took to twisting her handkerchief as an alternative. She had been up all night wondering what she must do in case it was bad news. Her hands were now daintily spread out on her lap, stiff from fear. She looked at Dr. Jones's big eyes, and she was immediately sidetracked to the past month when she consulted the internet for a list of oncologists. She had worked with a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer, but Rachel didn't bother getting her colleagues oncologist because she wanted to keep her consultation secret. The coughing, the back and chest pains, coupled with shooting pains in her legs were what brought her to heel to set an appointment with Dr. Jones. Do you smoke? He had asked, to which Rachel had nodded, trying to recall when she started the gruesome habit. It was with little thought that she accepted an offer of a cigarette from a colleague, not really believing that it was addictive. She reasoned that if so many of the sales agents smoked and the smoking sessions were what brought them together, it wouldn't hurt to puff on a few sticks. The problem was that the habit stuck. Dr. Jones leafed through the results of Rachel's test results, the doctor's thick fingers grazing the pages. Dr. Jones wet his forefinger with saliva twice before turning to the next page. His forehead creased as he studied the papers. Then he closed the file and swallowed. He opened his mouth as though to say something, but shut it again like he wanted to not say anything anymore. Probably buy more time, which he did by sanitizing his hands first before he looked up to meet Rachel's gaze. Today's the fourth time that Rachel consulted with him, and each time, her heart raced, afraid to hear the news. The cancer nodes are present in both lungs, and I'm afraid cancer has metastasized to other organs. Rachel hung on to her composure. She'd prepared for the worst, and although she'd rehearsed this scene many times in her head, hearing the words coming from the doctor's mouth was still shattering. Dr. Jones was trying to read her, his calm words were spoken slowly. They're all the same, he said, shaking his head. I'm really sorry. It's stage four. You have to start with the treatment plan immediately. I've prepared one for you, chemotherapy cycles. I've also included radiation therapy. However, you must know that there are no promises. The success rate is low, but these treatments will help you cope better daily. Also, I would suggest. Dr. Jones continued speaking, rambling on and on about cancer, but Rachel's brain had frozen, and all she heard were drones. When she was diagnosed with stage 2 cancer a month ago, she had researched over the internet, skimming pages and websites about cancer. What were the things she should do? How could her life be prolonged? At one point, she even considered joining a support group, and in a mocking tone, she'd practice saying in her head, Hi, my name's Rachel, and I've been diagnosed with cancer of blah blah blah. She knew it was crazy, but she was badly edgy and didn't know what to do. Once again, she wished that she'd told her husband about cancer and that he was here with her inside Dr. Jones's clinic. She'd been sure about one thing though, she believed that every day, miracles could strike. She clung to the hope that one of these days, she'd wake up with none of the chest pains, back pains, and coughing, and she wouldn't have to consult a physician anymore, and this diagnosis would just be a bad dream, barely remembered. So, why bother her husband about it? To her, not telling him was stupidly logical. How did it happen? I've read about it. That there are instances that it progresses faster but. The words came out as a croak, and she regretted having spoken out. What we initially found was not where most of the cancer cells were. 
When the test result of the recent scans came back, the cancer nodes were present in both lungs. And they're already huge, he paused. It has metastasized to other body parts. You see, non-small cell lung cancer is difficult to detect during the initial stages and... Dr. Jones continued explaining, but Rachel's mind was already flying. She sat rigidly and put her arms around herself, but the coldness from the air conditioner still found its way into her body, wiggling through her layers of fabrics. He had told her bits and pieces of all this before, about non-small cell lung cancer. Rachel, drive, Jones said. Rachel, he repeated. Yes. I'm sorry. Did you say something? She stirred in her seat, annoyed that she was caught not listening to him. Dr. Jones looked at her, concern etched on his plump face. Will you be all right? What kind of a question is that? She said. Then, shaking her head, bit her lip to avoid venting out on the doctor. There was silence afterward. I'd like to discuss with you the treatment that I prepared. No, Rachel said. Shaking her head, she continued, please, I need time to take this all in. Dr. Jones stared at her, studying her. He wouldn't have guessed that she had cancer if he met her on the road, or brushed against her in the mall, or been behind her at the counter of a pastry shop. She looked healthy. Her blonde hair was arranged carefully in a ponytail with some stray curls that she had to tuck behind her ears habitually. And although her physique was on the lean side, it had not taken on the sickly thin level yet. Of course, he said hesitantly. But you have to come back soon. If tomorrow isn't okay with you, how about the day after that? Or a week from now? Yes, I will. I'll call you tomorrow. Why? Rachel asked. Do doctors do that? Check on patients, I mean. Dr. Jones stared at her and lifted his wire-rimmed glasses. He shook his head slowly. Not usually, but if I don't, I'm not sure when I'll see you. And you have to see me soon. What makes you so sure? He hesitated before answering, your shoulders. They have a proud, I don't know, bearing. They kind of give away a somehow stubborn streak. Rachel nodded, blinking back her tears, the soft lines on the corner of her eyes showing. I should leave now, she paused, there's something I have to attend to. Rachel stood up so abruptly that her purse almost fell to the floor. She headed towards the door, but she was stopped by Dr. Jones's words. You don't have to take off your wedding ring each time you visit me, Rachel, he said. The test results are all in confidence and I'll leave it to you to discuss this with your family, with your husband. How did you know? Rachel asked and then looked at her ring finger. Sure enough, there was a mark where the ring had always been. She looked at Dr. Jones and tilted her head to one side. She couldn't bring herself to open her mouth and say another word, so she turned away and headed outside the clinic. On the exterior, there were no noticeable signs of her fortress breaking. Still, inside, the turmoil had started, spiraling out of control like when the clouds blended with air, and together they kissed the ground, building into a tornado that could eventually crumble anyone's facade. To Rachel, the apprehension was brought about by one question, how would she tell her husband? The thought lingered inside her head as she closed the clinic's door. One uncertain step at a time, she told herself. In time, the blur will be gone. Rachel called her secretary and advised that she would be taking the week off. She continued walking along the streets of New Jersey, floating in her sea of insecurity. When should she start the medication? She'd read that chemotherapy would make her weak, and she could be wasting time in bed rather than spending her days with her family. The stories were scary, telling her that the effect of chemotherapy could vary depending on the person, stage of cancer, and gender, there were too many factors, and she wondered what they would be on her. Knowing that the result of her treatment plan was going to be a gamble left her all the more indecisive. Treatment or live her last days normally? But she wondered if her life would ever really be normal again. She wanted to fight cancer, but that meant that she would undergo the medication, which was guaranteed to be painful and could result in her wasting precious time in bed. All her worries shy away when her biggest fear comes to mind, though. 
Her heart started pumping rapidly when she thought about her husband, and she asked herself why she hadn't already told him. If only she could go back to that first day when she paid a visit to Dr. Jones, she would take David with her so there would be no secrets between them. Somehow, she felt she had lied. Rachel had met David when they were in college. She was a business student while he studied fine arts. There were activities during college that made their paths cross, but neither paid attention to the other as they were both in relationships. Coincidentally, when Rachel broke up with her boyfriend during her sophomore year, David stopped dating his longtime girlfriend. Their paths crossed again, and this time, it wasn't because of a university event. It was Rachel who approached David. It didn't take long after that first meeting before they entered into a committed relationship. When they graduated from college still madly in love, they decided to tie the knot. David had wanted a son immediately after marriage, but Rachel argued that they were still young, and she didn't want to get pregnant soon. She wanted to be a CEO, she would tell him, and he would just laugh at her. Although this was true, more than anything else, Rachel was terrified of sporting stretch marks across her stomach. Fifteen years had faded away as they pursued their careers and started making names for themselves, but it was only from two years ago that what David had been praying for materialized. Rachel was about to be assigned to a branch in Middletown, and when David heard about it, he said that the commute would be stressful for her. She argued that it wouldn't be since going to Middletown was not part of her daily itinerary. Regardless, David didn't relent and said that she has to get an apartment there, if only for a few months. He insisted on coming with her. Rachel pointed out that it was just until she could close the contract on a project, and it'd probably take only a few months, so there'd be no need to move out of New York. Still, David wouldn't listen and said that they'd move together to Middletown. He then quit his job in advertising and focused entirely on painting. David had not pictured himself living anywhere else, but the decision was a no-brainer because he knew that his place in this world was beside his wife, no matter where her being a sales agent would bring them. He said that as an artist, he's more amenable to relocation since a fresh start somewhere else could always give him new ideas. Rachel was deeply touched when her husband gave in to what her career was demanding of her. And thus, when they were finished unloading their boxes from the trucking services and into their new apartment, she told him, I will give you what you've always wanted. David had raised his eyebrows at her, waiting for the gift that she'd give him, but none came. When Rachel moved towards him and started kissing him, he suddenly understood and chuckled softly. The kiss had begun tenderly, the kind that made one feel weak and strong, and giving and insistent at the same time. The boxes were cluttered all around, and the bed was not yet assembled. David was laughing when Rachel became aggressive and started undoing the buttons of his shirt, kissing him on his chest and tracing a finger down his spine. David kicked some of the boxes that were getting in their way. He returned her kisses with more ardor this time. When Rachel took her blouse off and teased him by slowly dancing against him, he grabbed her and carried her to the table after realizing that the bed was not yet set up. To his dismay, he saw that boxes were also piled up on the table. He put Rachel back on her feet and looked for a place unoccupied by boxes or furniture. At that moment, Rachel took David's hand and pulled him to the floor. The years of togetherness had not lessened their desire for each other, and they lay on the floor, satisfied after a few minutes. Three weeks later, Rachel started having morning sickness. There were times that she had to cancel a meeting with customers or phone in sick due to nausea. There were mornings that she'd go running to the bathroom to throw up, but nothing ever came out. After a week, she bought a pregnancy test kit. That was just two days away from their twelfth wedding anniversary. When she saw what the result was, she carefully wiped the plastic strip and wrapped it with Japanese paper, smiling to herself and wondering if she should sanitize it with alcohol. Knowing what a neat freak David was, he'd probably flip when he opened the gift and found himself touching the plastic strip, that was if he had any idea what it was. Their anniversary had come, and they were sharing delivery food in the new apartment. The scent of braised beef hung in the kitchen. Here you go. David said as he handed Rachel his gift. Happy anniversary, darling. Oh, thank you, she said. This is huge. Rachel ripped the wrapper and found herself staring at a painting of herself. 
She remembered the photo it was copied from, the one that was taken a few weeks ago before they moved to Middletown. David grinned, proud of himself for finishing the painting in just a few days. There were still some areas with fresh paint on the canvas. Fearing that he wasn't able to perfectly capture the scene, he made sure that he got the perfect frame. As an artist, he knew that the frame was as important as the painting itself, so he took his time choosing a four-inch thick wooden frame in its natural color with carvings of lilies on the edges. The painting showed Rachel standing outside the apartment. Her back was mostly to the camera, and she was framing their newly rented place. David took it at an angle that caught her chin a bit upturned. It's as though her face was painted with a big smile, stray blonde curls were falling down from her ponytail. She was wearing a clean, white long-sleeved blouse, tucked into fashionably faded jeans. Thank you, Rachel said, leaning over to his side to kiss him. This is fabulous. David grinned. Great. You didn't notice that I had to work my way to hide some muffin tops. She punched him lightly. I have none. David laughed. The painting's nice. She smiled at her husband. But, she paused, just this once, I think I got you a better gift. Really? David feigned dismay and put his hands on his chest and said, how's that even possible? He frowned, then smiled again so quickly that Rachel knew all was said in jest. Quit playing around and open your gift, Rachel said, enjoying her husband's antics. She handed him her gift. It was a small box made of recycled paper, which she had picked out from a local store in town. Inside, she placed a card with her message and put the plastic strip, wrapped in paper, on top. As a finishing touch, she put a blue ribbon outside the box. David took the gift with arched eyebrows. Darling, you didn't have to propose. It's not a ring, Rachel said just before David winked at her to indicate he was kidding. She rolled her eyes at him. David shook the box, all the while smiling at her. It's so light I doubt if this gift will ever top my masterpiece, he added jokingly as he pulled the ribbon and opened the box. David's lips thinned, his eyebrows creased in tilted quarter moons. Two lines, he said and looked at her with a question in his eyes. There's a card underneath, Rachel said. David checked inside the box again and saw what Rachel was referring to. He pulled the card and read it out loud, taking the time to savor each word coming out of his mouth. To the man in my life. You've been a friend. You've been a husband. David stopped reading the card and looked at Rachel, his eyes grew serious. He stood up, and knelt in front of her, kissing her where his lips could reach her, on her knees, legs, and hands. Then he embraced her, and in her ear, he continued reading the card, and now you're a soon-to-be dad. Quickly, he stood up, and before she could protest, he lifted her from the chair. He twirled her round and round, all the while laughing. Thank you, my darling. Thank you. He was still laughing. Definitely better than my masterpiece. Stop it. The baby, she said. Whirling me up in the air could be bad for the baby. She was laughing too. I love you, my exquisite darling. David kept saying repeatedly. Really? Exquisite? Rachel said, laughing, to which David no longer replied. After several weeks, David had asked her over breakfast, his face peering from the newspaper he's reading, Darling, why didn't you tell me immediately about the baby? Rachel couldn't respond. She thought it over. In her heart, she knew that if there was something good going on, she would share it with David as soon as the news unfolded. But if she weren't yet sure if the matter was good or bad, she'd keep it to herself. When she discovered she was pregnant, she couldn't decide at first. She was ecstatic, true. But she was also afraid because she wasn't certain if she's ready to become a mother. I wanted to surprise you, baby, she said instead. It was a good answer, she thought because David smiled at her and continued reading his newspaper. Rachel spotted a coffee shop. She had to clear her head. How would she tell David now? It had been a mistake to not tell him about cancer, but that was a mistake that could be corrected promptly. 
she knew she couldn't just spill the bad news, not after keeping it from him for so long. And she was scared. He would be mad at her. She crossed the street and immediately entered the coffee shop. There were a few occupied tables. She selected one table away from the bar, thinking that the cafe would be a good place to clear her head. Chapter 2 A leather-bound journal was wide open in front of Rachel. Her notes occupied the two pages, some post-it notes added color to the otherwise dull sheets. She had been sitting in the coffee shop for two hours already, and her legs had gone numb. She stole a glance at her watch, feeling uneasy over how time flew. At two in the afternoon, the coffee shop was almost empty. She noted that none of the patrons that she saw when she entered were still there. New customers had come in instead. She browsed her notes again, leafing through the journal's pages. Random questions were running in her head, and she was irritated that her time in the coffee shop didn't seem to help at all. Sighing, she stared blankly at the counter and got that funny feeling someone was watching her. Her eyes slid to the left, and true enough, the waitress was staring at her. Their eyes locked for a brief moment. It was Rachel who broke it. Rachel urged herself to focus on the notes in her journal, although she also knew that right that moment, she wouldn't be able to come up with something rational. In bold black letters, she wrote down what she wanted to do and frowned upon realizing that it was a bucket list she's looking at. Isn't it what people who find out they are sick usually do? Closer scrutiny revealed though that her notes consisted mostly of mere necessities she had to attend to. For one, she listed her top priority as meet relatives. This had to be done, she believed, at least so that a proper goodbye could be made. It was almost similar to the other two items on her list, spend more time with mom and dad and say goodbye to friends. The other items on her list included converting David's and her joint account to be only under his name. Review her insurance plan. Rachel's eyes clouded as she read the last item, review the memorial plan. David had objected to her getting one, but now she realized that it was a good move. When she's gone, she wouldn't want David to have to handle every painful detail of arranging for her necessities. Rachel tapped her pen on the table as she sorted out what was still missing from her already three-page long list. Acceptance. It dawned on her that she needed an activity to help her accept her fate. Although a part of her raged against it as it meant she was accepting demise, maybe unnecessarily. Still, she began writing it down, acceptance. Then she stopped short as a thought crossed her mind. Doesn't acceptance usually come after she has gone through the other emotional stages like anger, sadness, or desperation? She thought. Acceptance often would come at a much later stage. Regardless, she knew that if she had to make the most of her time, she had to accept sooner. She wouldn't stop believing in and hoping for miracles, but she had to be prepared. In slow movements, her left hand grazed across her journal. She was careful that her left palm didn't come in contact with the still wet ink, or she would have a hard time removing the smudge. Being left-handed has turned her from a sloppy writer to a careful one. Upon finishing, she stared at her words, go away for two weeks. No, that's too long, she thought. Maybe two to three days. Spend some time alone to accept and just accept. She looked at it thoughtfully as she fought yet again another foreboding of unshed tears. In her head, she conjured the picture of her husband when she left him at home earlier. He was wearing a crew neck shirt and faded denim, and she knew that he would probably spend the entire day painting. He had kissed her before she left, and he had brushed his hand over her hair tenderly. Their son Jeremy had been asleep. Rachel shook her head, shut her eyes tightly, and clamped her mouth shut. It's not yet time to go back to the beautiful picture of their home. She needed to accept her situation first so she'd be more composed when she tells her husband. All the more reason that I should go away for a few days, the thought taunted her. She folded the journal and put it inside her bag. At that point, she noticed that the waitress had started walking towards her. The room reverberated in silence, and only the footsteps of the waitress who approached her broke it. Refill? The waitress asked. Even in the placidity of her tone, the question manifested concern, and for that, Rachel was grateful. Her gaze fell upon the white letters on the woman's name tag, which read Betty. An appropriate name for what seemed like a kind lady. 
Rachel wondered if it would be overly dramatic if she jumped to her feet and hugged the woman for showing the tiniest shred of affection towards her, notwithstanding that in other circumstances, Rachel would have hated being talked to in her private moment. A speck of attention and anonymity broke what she'd been trying to bury inside her chest, and she sighed sharply. Yes, please. And some water, Rachel said as she studied Betty. The waitress's hair was in a bob with some orange highlights. Her forehead was raised high over round eyes. By simply looking at her, Rachel felt a certain level of comfort. Something altogether familiar like what one feels upon accidentally meeting old friends in the street. Sure, Betty said. Betty strutted away and proceeded to refill her coffee. Each movement of hers was rushed and measured like it had been rehearsed. Rachel kept her caramel brown eyes fixed on the stranger she first talked to after the diagnosis sank in. She remembered the visit to the doctor earlier, a visit that put an end to her, hoping that the diagnosis would not be so harsh. She shivered as her hand darted up in the air in a sudden movement to tuck her blonde curls behind her left ear. Here you go, Betty said. Then as though she read what Rachel was thinking, continued, it's going to get better. Rachel's lips parted slightly as though to say something. Her shoulders quickly moved as she heaved another sigh. This time, it was longer. I'm that transparent, huh? She asked. Yep. Betty put the coffee cup and a glass of water on the table before pointing to another empty chair and asked, Do you mind? Rachel shook her head. Since leaving the hospital, she had been in deep thought. Looking at Betty, she wondered if a stranger to open up her thoughts could be what she needed. She refrained from heading home, afraid of telling her husband about cancer. Usually people come in here to meet friends, wait for lovers, talk. You know the type. Betty stopped before adding hesitantly, while some just sit here, sip on their coffees, and remain silent for as long as they can bear it. Betty was hinting that Rachel belonged to the last category. She decided to let the comment pass, uncertain of whether or not she should share her story. I don't know, Rachel said after a while. Her usually confident voice came out soft and uncertain. One day, I woke up coughing horribly. My lungs were burning. I waited for the coughing to stop, and when it did, I dressed to go to the office, working as I always had for the past 15 years. Then seeing that I have free time on my hands, I told myself that maybe it's high time I get a consultation. Betty pinched her lower lip as she listened intently. Rachel wondered if it was right that she spilled this out on Betty. She seemed to be genuinely concerned, but what did it matter anyway? Rachel reached for the sugar bowl. She paused for a moment before adding the two sugar cubes to the coffee. Then she took a sip. She felt acid rising in her throat but ignored it. A day passes. Two. Everything's the same except that now, the test results from the clinic came out. Betty stared at her, unmoving. And, Rachel paused. You know how one day everything was all right, and then the next day, nothing seemed to matter? Because nothing really does anymore. Her voice broke. If Rachel surprised Betty with her revelation, the woman did a good job hiding it. But she touched Rachel's hand. Rachel's eyes slid to the hand that was comforting her, wishing that instead of the hand with manicured nails, it was her husband's hand. It wasn't his fault he wasn't beside her. Had he known, Rachel was sure he'd go through all the tests with her. Rachel's eyes began to water, but she blinked them back by focusing on the calloused hand of the woman in front of her instead of the tenderness that came with the touch. It's okay to cry, Betty said quietly. For the second time that day, she managed to read through Rachel. Oh no, I'm not going to cry, Rachel blurted out, faking a laugh. This isn't, really, I mean. She stopped, her hands moved crazily about in the air. In one fluid motion, she sent her cup of coffee toppling down the table. Oh shit. Rachel stood up abruptly. I'm sorry I'm so jerky. Hey, it's okay, Betty said, forcing out a smile. Rachel's eyes rolled, and she cursed to herself. She collapsed on the chair with her feet spread as wide apart as her skirt would allow her. She was usually more composed than this, she thought. She was mentally chastising herself for her clumsiness when Betty returned with a mop and cleaned the spill. The woman bent and retrieved the cup with a broken handle, frowning slightly. Oh well, this one's got to go. I should have put your order in a paper cup. It's just that you're so dainty, I thought you could never break porcelain, she said. Then she glanced at Rachel and offered a weak smile. 
Rachel surprised herself by giggling. I'll pay for it, don't worry. At least I managed to make you smile, Betty said. You should keep on smiling, really, you've pretty eyes. Betty left with a mop on her right hand and what remained of the broken cup on the other. Rachel stopped laughing and straightened herself on the seat, murmuring to herself that she was a formidable woman, and no amount of bad news should be able to shake her. Being in the sales department with deadlines to beat and sales targets to achieve, and meeting and dining with the big bosses for the past 15 years had made her that. When she was still a sales agent, she used to ride pickup trucks, haggle and discuss numbers with clients so that by the closing of a quarter, the sales volume would not be stricken out as insignificant by her boss. The days she had spent under the scorching sun not only gave her the tan she so wanted to have but also honed in her the patience required to succeed in the field that she had chosen to pursue. Thousands of cases of condiments sold later, which translated to three years of her life, she joined another company and engaged her hours dealing with doctors and pharmacists. If she thought that selling condiments was like standing on the edge of a sword, dealing with the doctors and pharmacists was like tiptoeing on an ice pick. She's done with that chapter in her life now. With the change in her job function, she had begun spending most of her time flying halfway across the world to market the software their company carried. She was grateful for the advent of the internet and teleconferencing that resulted in her less frequent fly-ins. Rachel recalled those days of unparalleled challenges and silently applauded that she never winced at the hardships she encountered, which was why she's having a hard time figuring out the reason her emotions were out of whack today. Here you go, Betty said. I know there's nothing I can say to make it better, but no one has ever resisted our carrot cake. It's on the house. Betty smiled slightly in an awkward manner. Oh, Rachel said, surprised. It's so nice of you, but you didn't have to. Don't be too quick to thank me. It's been on the counter for a week, she said in jest. Rachel laughed, although her heart wasn't in it. She had hated carrots all her life. Maybe if she liked it in the first place, she wouldn't have gotten cancer. A few minutes later, after Rachel finished half of the carrot cake, she gathered her things and stood up. The acceptance part has got to start. Now, she thought sadly. Chapter 3 Outside, the wind blew softly, and Rachel appreciated the chill that coursed her body. It kept her grounded and prevented her mind from flying elsewhere again. When she calls David later, it is important that her voice retains the usual easygoing tone that she uses when she talks to him. She stood in front of the coffee shop and was frustrated that she had stayed in that position for several minutes already. She took out her mobile phone, selected David's name from the address book, and pressed the phone icon to make the call. Hey, baby, my schedule's a mess, she began as she tried to speak calmly. There was a brief tremor on her last word, but she prayed that the static concealed it. Hello, darling, he said. Rachel's face split into a huge grin as she listened to her husband's voice. Every time, she thought to herself, his voice still sends that warmth through to her, enabling her to dream with eyes open. If there was an aftertaste in words, she bet that David's was warmth. She imagined his dark hair, which she loved to touch, his soft blue-gray eyes, which melted her every time they looked at her, and his chiseled jaw, which only accented his masculinity. He was the kind of handsome that mothers delighted at, but not good-looking enough for Rachel's contemporaries to envy her. She could hear the smile and the tone of his voice. The familiar endearment tugged at her heart. Calling her darling started off as a joke when, during the early months that they were dating, she let it slip that she had a thing for men with a British accent. David told her that the best he could give her was to call her darling, to which she had laughed. The joke died, the years came by and passed, but the term of endearment lingered. You've only been gone a few hours this morning, and you're already missing me? David asked. He was teasing her as usual. We both know your schedule's a mess. What's up? Rachel's grin faded into a thin smile that left the dimple on her left cheek visible as though a nickel was pressed against her cheek. I need to fly to California tonight to meet with a client. I wasn't supposed to do this, but Paul, my agent, called in sick last minute. There's no one else who could replace him in such a short time. She paused and ran through in her mind what she just said and hoped that David didn't hear the lie in her words. She bit her lip as she waited for his response. Her hands become clammy. Are you sure it's a client you're meeting and not some spunky surfer? 
He teased again, and Rachel laughed. Give me a ring when you get there, okay? Rachel smiled. He hadn't caught on her lie. California? Fly to California? She had no intention of going there. It was some sort of a last minute, I'm not accustomed to lying lie. She would probably check into a hotel in New Jersey, and lock herself in a room for three days or a week at most to get acclimated to her fate, to be rational about it, or probably to sulk. It doesn't matter how long it takes. I need to clear my head. Okay, babe. Got to go now, Rachel said. Love you, David murmured. He always took a childish tone every time he said those words. Rachel's left cheek flashed a dimple as she smiled again. Even after all these years, David never forgot to be endearing. I love you too, she whispered. This time, the smile had left her lips. Initially, it was his dark hair and blue-gray eyes that won her over, but as she looked back now, she realized that David's character was what enchanted her. She waited until David ended their conversation. She listened patiently until she heard the soft beeps of her phone, indicating that the connection was cut. For the first time, she wasn't the one to hang up. Chapter 4 Vehicle after vehicle roared on the street, causing Rachel to jolt as they passed by. The weather did not help in her decision about where she should head next. Although the coffee shop was not busy, being back on the street proved that the city wasn't sleepy either. Rachel wanted a change in scenery, some more of that peace and quiet. Or perhaps not. Maybe distraction was what she really preferred. Or needed. Looking at the cars passing in front of her reminded her that life would go on for her regardless of the bad news she heard earlier. The decision she had to reach was simply whether she would choose to wallow in sadness or live life the way she wanted to. The way she knew she deserved to. Indecisiveness was not one of Rachel's traits. In fact, she had a huge dislike for people who couldn't make up their minds immediately. But right now, it was only a simple question that stumped her, where to? She admitted to herself that she couldn't answer that question. She crossed the street. At least that for her was a start. The street on the opposite side showcased a line of boutiques, and she stopped to gaze at the displays on the windows. There were items on sale, and while on another occasion she would have rejoiced over the goodbyes and immediately would have taken a peek inside the shop, today she was not in the mood to do so. She jerked her head away from her reflection that was mirrored on the glass panels, not wanting to see herself. But the sky was beginning to get cloudy, and so the darkness that suddenly veiled the street made her image translucent against the smoked glass walls of the shops. She didn't feel any different than she had when she got dressed that morning, and yet there was something pulsating, a random indefinable feeling that hung at her back, which could take her so easily if she would allow her fear to grow wings inside her heart. Rachel's caramel brown eyes gazed back at her. Some of her blonde locks were hanging loosely behind her ears, so she removed the scrunchie holding her tresses in a ponytail. She shook her head, loosening the strands, and brushed her hair with her fingers. Satisfied, she started walking again. The wind that made her hair dance comforted her. If she would not going home for the next few days, perhaps she should check out new clothes. She's been playing with the question of whether she should go back to her place to pick up some stuff or just to buy new clothes. Should David ask why she didn't pick up some clothes, she tell him that since the trip was urgent, she had to go straight to California and buy a new set of clothes there. Rachel left the coffee shop an hour ago, she realized, as she checked her watch, yet she still felt as though she was in a special place where nothing seemed to touch her, no emotions, no sense of responsibility, no familiar people. She was thankful for the cloak anonymity offered her, but she had to break past the bubble she created around herself so she could come up with better decisions. She found it ironic that when time's running out, she can't make up her mind about her destination. She clutched her purse tightly to her chest in an attempt to stop herself from yelling. The day was frustrating for her, and confusion tore at every corner of her mind. There was severe taunting inside her head, voices telling her to stop and cry. On the other hand, there's an even stronger voice that kept on pushing her to walk on, to not give up, and to start believing in miracles. But cancer? If it weren't stage four, maybe she would believe in miracles. But it was stage four, and no matter how optimistic she had always been, she felt an unfamiliar emotion ripping her across the chest. It was sharp and left her wincing in pain. 
It wasn't the pain though that made her breathless and confused, it was in knowing that all of a sudden, everything, her life, could end. She came across a woman carrying her son, and Rachel was immediately reminded of Jeremy. A man wearing a hat to her looked a lot like David. A car that passed in front of her right before she crossed the street taunted her about the road trips she would miss out on. The amber traffic light that turned red mocked her that time would soon be cut short for her. It was a wild morning, and no matter how hard she tried to fight the daunting images in her head, she still stumbled on an epiphany of sorts. Her right hand closed tightly on her purse, and she glowered at the half-moon dents that her nails left on the leather strap. The wind tousled her blonde curls once more, and this time she was irritated. She wondered if the wind usually blew this often, or it's just her being overly dramatic about her surroundings. It's either that or she's been watching too many soaps. The only thing missing right then was her theme song. In her mind, it would have to be a melancholic infusion of different stringed instruments blending with a deep vibrato and the growl of a seasoned artist. But should any music play right now, she swore that she would end up in a heap on the sidewalk, weeping. So she pushed the thoughts aside. Rachel looked around and found herself standing, with the wind cutting sharply against her flushed face, in front of a street sign that was already loose on its hinges. It kept on swaying back and forth. Oddly, the sign pointed to the left. Rachel dismissed the urge to laugh at the sign giving her a sign of where she should go, but she helped herself to a grin at the thought. David would have a fit laughing if he heard me saying that out loud, she thought. She crossed the street yet again and continued walking. This journey on foot took her to the other side of New Jersey that she wasn't familiar with. It amused her that there were still some areas that appeared new to her. Her job was in sales, and it's always been important that she knew local geography by heart. She blamed the lack of knowledge on the decreasing field assignments she's had over the years. An old church stood several yards away from her, its door was opened wide and welcoming. Its wall paint had peeled off. The structure looked dilapidated, and yet, as is usual with churches, the soft chirping of the birds that resonated inside enticed her to enter. There was no mass being held, in fact, there was no one inside, so she walked until she reached the front row. Not having been to church in a long time, she felt strangely at home. The wooden pew felt cold against her skin beneath the fabric of her dress. What was she doing here, anyway? She didn't even know what to ask of him. He was the one who could make this, this sickness, go away. Should she dare? Should she ask him to give her a miracle? Rachel sat silently on the first pew. As she closed her eyes, a tingling ran down her spine, a tingling that continued down to her fingers and toes. It remained a mystery to her how being in a place one hadn't frequented in a long while just because it's a place of worship brought comfort to whoever was seeking solace. It's like the feeling one gets upon hearing a child's words for the first time. A consolation when one feels defeated. A spark of a candle lit during a storm. After a few minutes, Rachel knelt, and her knees hit the cushioned wood. She racked her mind for the prayers that were taught to her as a child and couldn't remember an appropriate one for today. She inhaled sharply and closed her eyes. Do not fear, she remembered reading from the Bible. Dear God, she paused. It's been quite a while. She stopped again as though cautious that she would be chided about bad behavior. After a few awkward moments, it all rushed out like a flowing river. Dear God, I know I don't have the right to question you. I have my faults. I've sinned. And I know that I had a hand in what's happening to me now. She winced. I'm afraid, she said, choking on the last word. I'm terrified. My words may seem scattered. And they are, because at this moment, I don't glean anything good is about to unravel before me. I have this pain in my heart that only you can take away. If it is any other challenge that involves me, only me, I can handle it. But to know I'll hurt the people I love, that they'll hurt when I leave. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. There was nothing but silence. Please, 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 give me strength. Reluctantly, she opened her eyes. There was still no one inside the church but her. A few birds flapped their wings over her head, and she gazed up. Dear God, I pray for a miracle, she whispered. I pray for a miracle so that I'll get to spend more time with my husband and son. I don't want to leave them. What will become of Jeremy when I'm gone? Will he grow up to be a good kid? Her voice broke into tiny pieces that to any ears, but God's would seem inaudible. 
It's not right for me to leave him with my husband, alone, especially when my Jeremy's still so young, and he needed a mother to care for him. Afraid that she would cry, Rachel stood up. She put her hand on the wooden backrest of the pew to steady herself because she didn't trust her knees just yet. Life seemed such a huge blessing that was being robbed from her, and she felt cheated that she had a taste of how good life was only to then learn that it would be taken away from her so soon. She longed to see the days ahead and to work alongside David until they retire. To watch Jeremy go through school, get married, take on a job, and make beautiful kids. The possibilities clawed at her mind, a future that she knew would find itself materializing, but without her to even take snapshots of the memories. In her mind, the future was now simply equated to dreams, and because there seemed to be no way for her to be a part of them, the images she conjured with honest desperation would always be just dreams to her. She bit her lower lip and surprised herself by shouting, Give me a miracle. She was on the brink of breaking down, of giving in to the constant yammering in her head, to the taunts that pulled her down, pinning her to confusion. Her chin quivered with her outburst. The bird's fluttering became louder, disturbed by her voice. Then they swooped down, flapping their wings noisily before flying out of the church. She stood motionless in an awkward position of being half bent towards the backrest of the pew. She had no energy to at least straighten herself, and she felt cold as though drenched in freezing water. Her cheeks flushed, and her heart started pounding faster. Guiltily, she muttered softly, I'm sorry, dear God, if I offended you. Then she threw her head back and laughed at the silliness of her actions until tears caressed her face. She wiped them away in an irritated manner. Not yet. She shook her head and told herself that the tears were not manifestations of her heart's pining, but rather a result of laughing too much. Before she could think again, she ran outside, her strength returning. Forgetting that she was already in her mid-thirties, she laughed as she ran while tears glistened against her cheeks like small diamonds on mountains of hope. She disregarded the fact that she was wearing a skirt and a pair of four-inch heeled shoes, and each stride she took would only harden the calluses on her feet. For the first time in her life, she didn't care if anyone saw her in that state, a child rushing after the birds and laughing half crazily at the world. She clutched her purse to her chest tightly while her blonde curls blew wildly in the air. And through all this dancing with fate, she prayed fervently for a miracle. Chapter 5 Rachel collapsed on the side of the road with eyes squeezed tightly, trying to catch her breath. How silly of me to run like that. She chastised herself. As if my lungs don't already have issues. Now I'm gasping for breath. Oh, please, not now. Not yet. Please, not yet. After several minutes, when her breathing returned to normal, she stood up and immediately hailed the first cab that passed. The cab driver was an old man. His head was almost entirely bald, and wrinkles that reminded Rachel of shriveled apricots covered his face. Where to? He asked. The mall. Rachel removed her feet out of her shoes and stared at her reddened ankles. Only sneakers could save them now from developing boils. She leaned on the backrest and found herself staring at the driver's head. The old man peered at Rachel through the rearview mirror. Are you mentally picturing me with hair, kid? He asked before laughing. Oh. Rachel felt abashed. I wasn't. She couldn't find the words to explain herself. How would she tell him that, yes, she was trying to imagine how he looked when he still had hair because she wanted to somehow manage her expectations once her blonde curls became affected by chemotherapy cycles. I was teasing you. There's no need to blush, he said. His smile stretched wide across his face, reminding Rachel of the way she drew a boat on paper when she was still in grade school. The old man's pointed nose was angular, a perfect triangle hovering above his boat-shaped lips. Smiling, his wrinkles grew more prominent around the edges of his blue eyes. I'm not, she cut in. The old man studied her from the rearview mirror, squinting. I've been in this business all my life. I can read people, you know. Some actually say I'm a psychic, but hell, no, I'm just really good with people, he said. You seem to be a lovely young woman. I'm not so young. Well, you see, kid, being called young is relative, so don't take it too positively, he said, chuckling. Now we know how fast you can turn a compliment into something insulting, Rachel retorted. The old man laughed, 
and his nostrils flared with each sound that escaped him. He raised a hand and scratched his bald head. As I was saying, the old man continued, I've been in this business for a long time. I've met a lot of people, talked to them, discussed the weather with them, politics. But nothing is more rewarding to me than to meet troubled young people, and somehow share a bit of wisdom, a bit of wisdom I keep on acquiring as I age gracefully. You see my bald head and wrinkled face? This is my aging gracefully. The old man laughed at his own joke, enticing Rachel to join in. Rachel offered a weak but sincere smile, and a dimple appeared on her left cheek. I don't know. I think I should have reservations sharing with you, but there's no sense keeping it in. I have stage 4 cancer. She paused for a while and waited for his reaction. The old man continued to stare ahead as he drove. He appeared to be listening intently to her. When there was no reaction from him, Rachel fought the urge to repeat what she just said. Admitting to others that she had cancer was momentous to her, and in her head, she could almost hear a symphony that was written only for her to begin to play. But contrary to what she expected, the old man didn't manifest the slightest alarm, and she was left wondering if sympathy was the reaction she preferred. This may be the first and last time we meet. You know, you should brace yourself because if I die here in your backseat, that'll spell trouble for you. Rachel wanted to feel his concern towards her because that would confirm that she was not so insignificant. That she would be remembered. At least, in a way. Surprisingly, the old man chuckled. Not today, kid, he said, shaking his head. Not today. You're stronger than I am. In fact, I should tell you, in case I'm the one that gets a stroke, I believe you can carry me single-handedly to the hospital. He laughed at that. Rachel's mouth opened, and the symphony playing in her head came to an abrupt stop, drowned out by the old man's laughter. Her eyes glared through her long lashes. Cheer up, kid. He glanced at the rearview mirror. It's bad enough that we could be losing another beautiful face on this planet in the future. But to lose it now by frowning is just horrible. This time, Rachel laughed until her sides hurt. Then she was back to her reality, in the cab, escaping her fate. Upon realizing that, she stopped laughing. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Hell, why not? The old man asked. What are your fears? He took a turn and gassed up a bit. The view outside was breathtaking, but the more Rachel thought about it, the more she realized that it was really just as it usually was. Trees lined up the sidewalks, and occasionally, modern design houses with huge lawns littered the town. She found it amusing how everything seemed to glow and look frosted upon knowing that it could be the last time she would enjoy such sightings. I don't know, Rachel said. Come on, share it with me, the old man insisted. I'm telling you, better face it early while, he stopped short. Instead of finishing his sentence, he feigned a cough. While it's still early? While I still have some time left? Rachel asked. Why didn't you finish your sentence? Suddenly you're this old man that's so sensitive about what I'll feel if you rub it in my face that I'm running out of time? How dare you? She seethed. Her entire life, she's been able to temper her emotions, but now, one stupid remark from a stranger ticked her, making her blurt out her anger. And to top it off, she had no idea where her surging plethora of emotions were coming from. Then what she was trying to avoid all week happened. In the backseat of the old man's cab, she wept until her shoulders shook. It didn't take long before she had difficulty breathing. She didn't notice that the old man had already pulled over and had opened the car's back door. Come on, kid. Move your butt, he ordered. Don't be a charlatan pretending to be this weak girl when I know how strong you are. Move your butt, he repeated. Shocked at how the old man was addressing her, Rachel followed. She was still choking on her sobs as she wiped her tears with her handkerchief. Blow your nose, the old man commanded. Rachel was annoyed, but she knew that he was right in telling her to empty her nose. So she did while she wiped her tears. They were both standing outside the car with Rachel avoiding the old man's gaze and him trying to catch it. The long road stretched far until the two sidewalks met in a single point. Occasionally, a few cars passed by. The loud revving of an engine sounded, and a young man called out, You rock, old man. Nice chick and then he whistled. Rachel and the old man doubled over laughing, that was the moment the ice was broken. Come on, kid, the old man said. Rachel frowned. 
Why do you keep on calling me kid? It's annoying. The old man just chuckled, and Rachel wanted to hit him at the back of his bald head. They crossed the road, leaving the cab with the hazard lights on. The wind was blowing like crazy. You see, kid. From where we are standing, we can't see the end of this road. Well, we can see it, but it's just a dot. He pointed ahead. But we drive on knowing that it's the way to go. We have our destinies set for us. The only question is, are we ready to face it? And seeing you, I know you aren't. He paused before adding, at least not yet. But we could stay here all afternoon and watch the stars cover the sky. Sit around and watch the sun rise. Still, we know where we should be heading. Lingering here doesn't change a thing. The old man put stress on the word should. What are you afraid of? He asked. Rachel thought for a while. I don't know. Perhaps it's the pain of not knowing what I would be missing in their lives. I have a husband and a son. She looked at him straight in the eye as though helpless, but attempting to be as courageous as a soldier approaching the war's front lines. Her eyes clouded once more, and tears started rolling down her cheeks. Pray for a miracle, the old man said softly. Rachel smiled wanly despite her tears. Funny you should say that. I already did. He moved closer to her and stretched his arms as though to welcome her. He looked old and dusty and unattractive, but the embrace he offered was very appealing. And his oceanic eyes calmed her. Slowly, Rachel moved towards him to accept his embrace. Like a child, her crying turned into sobs. She choked on her tears, but she let them all out because she couldn't hold them in any longer. You'll have your miracle, the old man whispered in her ear. Don't worry. You say it like it's true, Rachel complained. The old man chuckled. Well, if you believe it, maybe it will happen. For a moment, a dash of serenity spread through Rachel's body. She sucked in air, willing herself to stop crying. When she was calm enough, she met the old man's gaze. Her skirt stretched tightly against her legs as she sat down on a patch of grass a few yards from the sidewalk. The old man grunted as he stooped, his back perfecting into a curve similar to the arc of an eyebrow in a motion that looked precise and yet too painful to be beautiful. Upon seating, the old man took something from his pocket. He opened a flip-top box, pulled out one stick and lit it. From where I came from, what I'm about to do will be frowned upon. Then he offered her the pack. One for the road? He asked, smiling. Rachel took one and held the foreign cigarette in her hand. It felt odd now. Her eyes softened as she lit it up and said, yes, probably one for the road. She shook her head at the irony before she puffed out the smoke. Upon arriving at the department store, Rachel scouted for a pair of jeans, a new set of underwear, tees, and sneakers. Then she excused herself from the cashier upon realizing that she forgot to grab a few socks. She checked her watch and sighed. It was almost eight in the evening. Her feet dragged after her as she went to the nearest restroom to change. Inside, Rachel checked out her reflection in the mirror and finally decided on brushing her hair and tying it with a scrunchie. Stray curls hung behind her ears, but she no longer bothered to redo her hair, knowing that the strays would find a way to stick out again. Besides, David had always complimented her hair, saying it was stylishly disarrayed. Her hand went up to her collarbone, grazing the protrusion, wondering why she didn't notice how fast her weight had dropped. If David hadn't known how conscious she was of her body, he would have raised eyebrows at her thinning figure. Her brows furrowed as she remembered that she needed to call David, or he would start worrying. That was something she wanted to prevent because when he does, he will bombard her with phone calls. She closed her eyes as she listened to his voice. The familiar feeling of knowing that he was just on the other line calmed her. For the second time that day, Rachel waited for David to hang up. Although her stomach was not yet complaining, she decided to find a good restaurant to dine in. She went to the concierge and asked for any Japanese restaurant listed. There was none. She remembered that there was a Japanese restaurant she passed two days ago. Watanabe's, if she remembered correctly. It was a few blocks away from the mall, and since it was starting to get late, she quickly headed for the mall exit. Chapter 6 when David Smith visited the house yesterday, the front wall was still untouched by paint, but as he surveyed the house now, it looked just the way he wanted it, 
covered in gleaming white paint. The house was located two miles away from the apartment that he and Rachel were renting. David's soft, sleek hair, combed back and framing his high forehead held firm even as a strong gust of wind blew and made the leaves of the few trees in the yard shake. He scanned the house and wondered if he made a good decision in closing the purchase. His thick lips curved into a faint smile, and he touched his chin unconsciously, feeling the stubbles against his fingertips. The house had two stories, and it was covered in white paint. The roof was red, which broke the monotony of the otherwise bland facade, white picket fences surrounded the lawn. This wasn't exactly how it looked when he initially laid eyes on the property, though. David had seen the advertisement over the internet when he became serious about looking for a house. The white walls and the huge lawn caught his attention, and although there were some aspects about the house that he didn't like, he knew that it would only take some renovations to convert it into Rachel's dream home. He said Rachel's dream home because it had been a long-running joke between them because every time they discussed getting a house, his wife would ramble on and on about what she thought would make for a perfect abode. Yes, that was how she referred to it, the perfect abode. He contacted the agent and inquired about the details, and in a span of three months, he was able to complete the transaction. As soon as the documents were signed, he knew that the hard work was just about to start. It had been almost six months since he started working on the renovations. The first things to go were the windows that were three feet tall and five feet wide with blue shutters and steel frames. He replaced a bank of them with a wide panel of glass that allowed sunlight to luxuriously illuminate the living room. He gave instructions to scrape off the white paint turned ecru and give the walls a nice, fresh coat of white. It had also been his idea to have the roof reshingled red to give it a warmer touch. Inside, the house partitions were completely removed. He instructed the construction agency to adopt a layout he had pictured inside his head wherein the living room became narrower to allow for an island counter in the kitchen. When they had their baby Jeremy last year, he had wanted to leave the apartment immediately and move into a home more suitable to raising their son. Although he didn't make a lot from his profession, he had some family money, which contributed to his finally closing the deal on the property. David entered the house and inspected the white walls, and a speck of satisfaction crossed his angular face. He and Rachel had argued over wall paints in their conversations before because he didn't want white to cover every wall, but Rachel pointed out that nothing could go wrong with white, and if they needed to redecorate or accent the house, all they would have to do was change the furniture, curtains, and replace some decorative items. David would simply end the argument nodding and mumbling like a child, yeah, like Rachel's dream abode. To which Rachel would snap her fingers excitedly and yell, exactly. Followed by, now, you're learning, little boy. David smiled fondly at the memories at each argument they had. He couldn't wait for Rachel to come back from her client's visit. He was looking for a way to tell her that he wouldn't be home for the next few days. A plausible lie that he had thought of, much as he hated the thought of lying to her, was that he would be visiting his mother to spend a few days with her. He couldn't tell Rachel his real reason, that he would be working extra hours to supervise the finishing touches on the house since the house was to be his anniversary gift to her. So even though he hated lying to her, he reasoned that the end would somehow justify the means. But now, there was no need to lie as it seemed like the world had conspired with him to allow him to deliver the perfect anniversary gift. So when she called him earlier about the fieldwork, he couldn't contain his excitement. Please move it a bit to the left, David told the delivery man. He was pointing at the coffee table. Most of the furniture that was already in the house was new because he didn't want Rachel to notice that the things in the apartment were slowly disappearing. He would worry about where to put their old stuff later on. Besides, they would have a huge garage now where they could temporarily store their old furniture while sorting out what items to get rid of and what to keep. But he would keep the barrel, he maintained. Rachel would frown, but the barrel had a history with him. It was the only memory he had of Curly. Curly was the cat his mother gave him as a boy and Curly had used the barrel as a scratch post. When Curly died, he vowed to take the barrel with him anywhere he went. To remember the sweet ball of fur. Yes, he told himself, he would keep the barrel. It doesn't matter if Rachel would taunt him and call him a little boy for being sentimental. He. Will. Keep. The. Barrel. End of discussion. David pointed at the wall. Will you hand me the drill? He reached out to take the tool and his muscled arm flexed. Ray handed the drill over to David. Ray had Curly, 
medium-length brown hair that was beginning to look less wavy as he grew it out, which contrasted with his clean-shaven face. When Ray stood up, his average height and muscle frame became noticeable. He'd been in the construction industry after dropping out of college. Here you go, he said. David pulled the stepladder and placed it beside the wall. He examined the spaces to his right and his left, carefully gauging the distance, and if he correctly estimated the wall's center in the living room. Is it in the center? He asked. Ray looked at where David was pointing the drill. I suggest you measure it, man. Nah, I think this is good enough, David said, chuckling. He proceeded to drill the wall. Can't wait to move in, huh? I'm excited about it, David answered. Ray took a hook and handed it to David. David passed the drill back to Ray and firmly installed the hook in place. A few seconds later, he came down the stepladder and looked up at where he placed the hook. Perfect, he whispered. David had planned on putting his painting of Rachel on this wall. He could only imagine the look of astonishment on her face when she walks in here two days from now and sees the painting. And he wondered, will she still hate surprises? She had always claimed she did. But sometimes, when his timing is impeccable, he manages to make her smile. Regardless, David had always worked on surprising Rachel, remembering that he had made a promise to himself the moment he laid eyes on her that if he can have her, he will never let a moment pass by without reminding her how much she means to him. A memory of their first meeting. The sun was hiding behind the thick cottony cloud formations, shielding David from sunburn. It was hot enough to affirm that he'd made a good decision to continue using oil in his painting. David took out two stools from his pickup truck. He set up the easel and put the canvas on it. On the first stool, he arranged his painting tools, laying down the oils and paintbrushes. He sat on the other one. He took out his painter's hat and wore it. His hand brushed against a lock of dark hair that fell to his forehead. He pulled the other stool closer and picked the palette. Whistling, he began squeezing the oil paints from the tubes in a semicircle on the palette. He studied the details of the School of Business building, and he was proud of the image that had started to come out in the canvas. With just a few finishing touches, he knew that he would be able to capture its old Baroque architectural design. He had been working on the painting for hours, not minding the heat when he realized that there were several college students surrounding him. He reached for his hand towel and rubbed off some of the oil paints that were staining his fingers. When he looked up, he laid eyes on the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She was wearing a light blue, tropical print sundress, and cream peep toe pumps that highlighted her red toenails. He had seen a lot of women with curly blonde hair, but nobody had ever captivated him so fast in the past. He studied her face, her caramel eyes, and her wide lips, but he couldn't figure out what it was that made her stand out. Where his eyes touched her, she seemed to glow, and he wondered if it was what seeing one soulmate was like. But before he made the stupid mistake of blurting it out, he looked away from her. The other students started leaving, and David went to pack his things. He noticed that his hands were shaking slightly because he could no longer focus on what he was doing. Instead, from the corner of his eye, he watched her, wondering to himself what he would do if she should turn away and leave. It won't dry up fast in this weather, she said. He looked at her as she walked towards him. She walked carefully, avoiding the few large stones in the field. He smiled at her, and when she smiled back, he noticed that she had a dimple on her left cheek. That's why I brought the pickup. I'll wait for it to dry back there while I eat my packed lunch. If it's still not dry when I'm done, then I'll put it in the passenger seat. Did you use a lot of turpentine? It's going to stink, she said. No, just cooking oil from my mother's kitchen. The girl laughed, and David relished in the sound she made. So you know about painting, he said, a little about it. I'm David. He extended his hand to her. Rachel. She took his hand. I read about it. I'm interested in painting, but I never thought of it as a career. So whenever I feel like I need a fresh sense of art to capture my soul, I go to museums. She was still smiling. David didn't know what to say. Here he was, standing in front of a beautiful girl, and he couldn't think of a way to keep her interested. He put his hands inside his pockets just as he habitually does when he's uncertain how to approach a situation. How long do I have to stand here before you ask me to dinner? David laughed, thankful for her bluntness. 
I'm not usually like this. I'm funny, you know, he said. Um, claiming that you are funny totally negates it, she said. David laughed until the laughter turned into strange choking sounds. I, he said, searching for words. Will you go out to dinner with me? Rachel laughed. If you can find me. She turned her back to him and started walking away. I'm not difficult to locate, I stay on campus in one of the dorms. 8 o'clock sharp. She waved and turned away again, giggling. David was left standing beside his pickup truck, desperate to find out where she was staying. At 7 o'clock that night, he started his search. He went to three dormitories but couldn't find her room. At one point, he considered stopping the seemingly senseless search, blaming himself for not getting her last name. As he was walking outside the fourth dormitory, somebody shouted from the second floor. Hey, artist. He turned around and looked up. She was framed by the window of her room, wearing her nightgown, her hair was undone, and the wind was playfully tossing her curly hair. She was a mess, but what he thought at that moment was that she couldn't have been more beautiful. I didn't know you would actually look for me, she shouted gaily. How can I resist? David shouted back. She laughed. Wait for me. I'll be down in two shakes of a lamb's tail. David laughed too. Rachel didn't make him wait for long. When she came down, she was wearing a cardigan over a tank top, her neck was covered with a scarf, and her blonde hair was worn loose. She looked lovely. Dinner with a stranger? He asked. I assumed it would be fun, she said and looked at him. He was still smiling. It would be, he promised. David took her to a local diner, carefully picking out a table in the corner. The whole time, he couldn't take his eyes off her even when she asked to be excused and went to the restroom. When she came back, his eyes were still fixed on that area where she disappeared, and his gaze accompanied her until she was sitting in front of him again. It didn't seem like you moved, she said. David grinned. Couldn't help it. You're too much of a delight to look at. Are you always this? Flirty? No. Sweet? Definitely. Uck. Cheesy line, Rachel complained but her voice gave away the flattery she felt. David asked for the bill and settled it. He stood up and followed Rachel as she walked out the door. He slowed his pace and grabbed her arm. Hey, he said. Rachel looked around, brows raised. I hurt my knee playing football. Oh. I'm sorry, you should have told me earlier. David laughed. Actually, I just want you to walk slower so I could be with you for a little longer and you had to lie when you could have easily asked me. Her eyes were glinting with amusement. David smiled and didn't let go of her hand as they started walking to the dorm again. But it was so near that he soon found himself standing outside the building, towering over Rachel and feeling like an idiot for grinning at her the entire night. But he had donned a smile and her mere presence wouldn't allow him to wipe it off. Good night, he said. Ah, she said and nodded. She looked at her toes and then looked up at him again. She was wearing a very playful grin. I love you. David almost choked but instead it ended up laughing. What? He kept laughing until his sides began to hurt. Rachel was looking at him, a smile frozen on her lips. Oh, please stop already, she said, sounding offended. Why would you say that to a complete stranger? He asked. We spend an evening together shared a lovely time over dinner. I could sense, ah, let me rephrase that. I know that you like me. So I told you I love you. But why? David asked. He couldn't understand. He was looking intently at the unbelievably sexy, crazy, beautiful, high-spirited girl in front of him. I have this theory. David laughed all the more. Okay, let's hear it. That if I say it first and don't mean it the first time I say it, it will work for both my partner and me later on. David's eyebrows met, growing more confused. You see, if something happens, whether we separate, later on, he realizes that he's in love with someone else. Or let's say, in case of sudden demise, she said, laughing, before she continued, both of us won't be hurt a lot if we just go back to that moment when I first said I love you. When I didn't mean it yet. That is harsh, David said, nodding slowly while squinting at her. Rachel laughed, I said it's a theory, and you, my dear mister, are the first one I have a practical application of that theory on. 
Her forefinger barely touched his chest as she said it, but David's heart raced. He laughed, enjoying their date. So, good night, David said. You already said good night, Rachel said. Yeah, but we all know a good night isn't supposed to end with words. David smiled mischievously at her before moving closer towards her. She stood there, waiting and smiling brightly at him, her perfect white teeth and dimple showing. This was the moment he was waiting for. He moved closer to kiss her on the lips. When he was only an inch away, she pulled back. I said I love you, but I never said you may kiss me yet, she whispered against his ear. He didn't know if it was her lips being that close or her soft, melodious voice that sent him wanting to just grab her and kiss her. Right there. Right then. It didn't matter if she would slap him. But then he should suppress his feelings because he believed the girl in front of him was extraordinary. She pulled back and turned her head to the right, showing her left cheek to him, pointing to it. He fought the urge to touch her face and kiss her on the lips. Instead, he frowned at her and kissed the dimple of her left cheek. He was still frowning after the kiss and Rachel noticed the dissatisfaction and said, Oh, you're so cute, frowning like a little boy. Then she pinched the tip of his nose and threw her head back, laughing. David playfully grabbed her at the waist and squeezed his face against the curve of her neck. She flailed and continued laughing. You're ticklish. Just my kind of woman, he said as a naughty smile spread across his lips. Rachel pushed at him. Okay, enough, Buster. You've held me way too much already. Then she slipped away from his embrace, and with that, she went upstairs without looking back. And that was how David later realized, she tricked him into falling in love with her. Her spirit, her wit, her silly theory, her gloriously adorable body and the agony of not knowing what her lips tasted like. The following day, Rachel found David waiting for her outside the dormitory holding a bunch of lilies that he handed to her. He walked her all the way to her building for the next class. The flowers come with a note, he said as he handed her a folded paper, winking. Rachel smiled as a deliciously warm feeling spread inside her chest, she stood on tiptoes and kissed him on the cheek, then turned around to walk away. She clutched the lilies to her chest, wondering how she could have favored any other flower over them in the past. Inside the building, she opened the note and read it. Walking along, blending with the crowd. Angular figure sashaying about. Ever so beautiful. Yet visible only to me. Soft blonde curls brushing the shoulders. Face marked with anonymity. Scent freshening as she milled around. Fancy, yet known only to me. With eyes closed my painter's brush perfected you. Depicting a fragrant almost unknown aroma. And nobody else smells you or sees you. Or becomes aware of you. I see you, while everybody else exists unaffected. Love stands out to only another foolish heart. Rachel's dimple showed on her left cheek as she folded the paper following its original creases. She tore a page from her notebook and wrote. Dear David, I don't know what to make of your poem. It's a good thing you were fascinated by me. But really, am I supposed to be flattered by this? Are you saying that nobody else sees me as beautiful? And yet, what can I expect from an arrogant painter? Looking forward to seeing you. Rachel. David laughed as he read the note and knew then that he's got to win her over. He pursued her relentlessly, and his efforts were rewarded when one day, as he was cleaning his paintbrushes, she moved closer to him took from him the brushes, and started removing the stains from each of his fingers. He had stood watching her, fascinated with the grace of her gentle movements. When she looked up and saw him watching her, she leaned forward, lips slightly open. He didn't hesitate and instead met her lips in a kiss that he hoped would last forever. Back to the Present David looked around at the house and mentally went through Rachel's checklist for the ideal home, white, spacious, with a lawn, and with him there to wait for her. The place was, by her standards, magnificent. Now it's time to go back to the apartment and check on Jeremy and his nanny Susie. David was glad that he and Rachel were able to find the stout, fair-skinned woman in her early forties. Susie had often boasted that in the past, she had taken care of four kids, and that she had a lot of experience when it came to child rearing. He checked the time. It was almost eight. Rachel would be calling him soon to let him know she had arrived in California. True enough, 
as he was driving back to their apartment, his phone started ringing. Hey, darling, missed me? Chapter 7 Outside the mall, Rachel decided between hailing a cab and walking to get to Watanabe's restaurant. Yellow street lamps lit the road, and she occasionally saw couples walking, so she decided to do the same, convincing herself that she made the right choice because it would give her time to process her hazy thoughts. Her stomach growled, reminding her that she never had a decent lunch. Her knees had gone weak, too, and her mouth started to water just thinking about sushi. She checked her leather strapped watch that loosely dangled from her left hand and sighed upon seeing that it's 30 minutes past 8 in the evening. She never used to be this conscious about time except when she had booked meetings with clients. Things were changing, though, and she had to ensure that her every activity could be squeezed into her now very tight schedule. Rachel passed by an outdoor bench where a couple was seated, arguing over something. The woman slapped the man's face. She expected the man to retaliate, but instead, he simply touched his face to feel where his lover's hand left an ugly red mark. Rachel continued walking. I said I'm sorry, she heard the man say. Life is short, Rachel thought. Any misunderstanding should be discussed properly instead of being slept over, unresolved. Otherwise, a lot of things could be missed. Seeing the couple together made her think of David again. She missed him, and instinctively, she wrapped her arms around her as though the act could maybe make her remember his touch. She stole a glimpse at the couple she passed by, and she could almost picture David having a discussion with another woman. She's sure he would have someone else when she's gone, and the thought saddened her. It just wasn't fair. What if, when she's gone, and she visits him from heaven, she sees David looking at another woman in the way that he used to look at her? Will she be able to handle it? She dismissed the thought. It wasn't chilly that evening, but she got goosebumps, so she rubbed her palms against her arms. What does David like? He may have a thing for blondes, she thought, because I am. But it would be annoying to find David later on with someone that somehow resembled her. She wanted to stop the images pirouetting their wings inside her head. She saw the sign to Watanabe's. It was about 50 yards from where she was. She longed to sit inside and stretch her legs. Maybe there she could escape from the images. Hurriedly, she crossed the street. Only a few more steps and she would already find herself. Her eyes widened as she craned her neck behind her and saw the flashing lights of an approaching vehicle. Whoever was driving the car might not have been looking. The tires squealed, and at that moment, everything seemed to drag painfully. The car was just a few yards away now, and she stood rooted to the spot. She stared at the approaching vehicle as though she could conjure it to vanish. Miss, watch out. She heard someone scream. She managed to turn away from the approaching car, but its bumper hit the back of her legs, making her fall to her hands and knees. The impact wasn't strong, though. The driver was able to maneuver the car into a quick stop in the last seconds. Rachel squinted around her. Everything was veiled in white, and then nothing until all she could see was darkness as though an artist poured black paint around her. She strained her ears to hear anything, but no sound came, and she wondered if she passed out but she could still feel her knees and palms pressed against the pavement. A few seconds ticked by, but to her, they seemed like hours. She blinked, but her eyes registered nothing. She raised her hand to feel her head. Slowly, her vision started returning. It was blurry at first, like when mist covered the mountaintops. Then her eyes focused. She bent her head down to prevent nausea from sweeping over her and found herself on all fours, staring at the pebbles and the rough pavement under her. She was still in a crawling position, trying to figure out if she was hurt when the sounds became clearer. She looked up and met the eyes of the passersby looking at her with wide eyes. In their faces, she could see the concern. The restaurant seemed to dance as though there were several overlapping images of it before the image solidified. The sound of the car door opening and the rushed footsteps of someone approaching disturbed her. I, a man mumbled. I'm sorry, miss. He crouched beside her. Are you all right? A pair of blue gray eyes filled with worry stared at her. Let me help you. Looking at his eyes made her remember David once more. You weren't looking. She yelled at him. I was crossing the street, and you almost killed me. The young man opened his mouth as if to say something but closed it again. 
His face paled as he studied her. Help her up, someone said. Go take her to a hospital, somebody added. Oh, for Christ's sake, go carry her. I got it. The young man kneeling in front of her shouted back at the spectators. A group of people rushed forward and formed a circle around the two of them. Hurriedly, Rachel stood up, took a step, and winced. Ouch. She blurted out. A few spectators moved closer, but the young man was quick on his feet. He took Rachel's waist, put her arm around his shoulder, and shouted, I got this. Thanks, everyone. I'll handle this. When everybody else was out of earshot, the young man told her, I'm a doctor. You're what? Rachel asked. Doctor, he said. I'm a doctor. He helped her to the passenger seat of his black sedan and closed the door. Then he climbed into the driver's seat, turned on the ignition, and started driving. My name's Michael. But you may call me Mike. He paused, as though wondering why he gave out his nickname to a stranger. Rachel couldn't find her voice again. Does anything hurt? He asked. I think it's just my ankle, she answered. Where are you taking me? The hospital. It's very close, or I'm three miles from here. Oh no, you don't have to do that, she said in a panicked voice. There shouldn't be any record of this accident. Mike was about to object, so she quickly added, I thought you said you're a doctor. Then put a bandage on my ankle, and let's get this over with. She frowned as her gaze fell upon her legs. Her jeans had a tear, and there were scratches on her knee. There was very little blood, but the flesh looked raw. From the looks of it, the bruise would get ugly in the next few days. She examined her palms and noted the scratches. She exhaled heavily after determining that she wouldn't need any stitches. Her stomach growled loudly. Don't be scared, Mike said. His voice was softer, but the hint of fear was still there. I think that's not because of fear. I'm hungry. She doubted what she said, though. Okay, he said, let's get food and head home. I'll take care of that ankle. Mike saw that she was nursing her knee. And that, he said, referring to her knee. I didn't know you hurt your knee too. Instead of indulging in sushi and relaxing in the corner of a cozy restaurant, Rachel squeezed behind Mike at the takeout counter of a fast food chain. The crowd had thinned. Mike asked that she stay inside the car so that her ankle wouldn't be strained, but she insisted on tagging along. Here you go, the waitress said. Two super large burgers and onion rings, take away, she said, flashing a tired smile. Are you sure that'll be all? Mike responded with a simple nod of his head. He took the paper bags, turned to Rachel, and motioned for her to leave the counter. You'll like the burger, he said nonchalantly. The ones they make here are the real king of burgers. Rachel ignored him and focused instead on making her left leg carry her weight. It didn't prevent her from limping, though. Mike glared at her right ankle. I told you to stay in the car, but you just wouldn't listen, he said in an annoyed tone. This place could use a drive through Mike felt guilty for answering his girlfriend's call, which caused him to avert his eyes away from the road. It was only a few seconds, but everything happened so fast. He looked at the lady beside him from the corner of his eye and felt another pang of guilt dominating his emotions. It had been his fault because he and his girlfriend Lee were fighting over the phone, but it was too long a story to rehash now. What was this woman doing in the middle of the street, anyway? Mike frowned. He knew he was just trying to justify the incident. Sighing, he was only thankful that nothing really serious happened. The weird thing was that after he hit her, it took him several minutes, or maybe it was seconds that felt like minutes before he got the strength to stand up from the driver's seat. There was something about her being outlined by the headlights of his car that made him lose himself for a moment. Looking at her standing in the middle of the road, he froze and continued speeding towards her. When his senses returned, he hit the brakes quickly and pulled at the handbrake. His mobile phone flew towards the dashboard and fell down to the floor. He had to be in shock, which was altogether an unfamiliar feeling. He'd seen the shock in patients brought in the emergency room, and on the faces of their families, but he'd never experienced it himself yet. Until now. When they reached the car, he turned to her. She was leaning on the hood awkwardly. I don't think you mentioned your name. The woman's lips opened slightly. 
She hesitated as though trying to decide if giving her name to a stranger, who had struck her with his car no less, was necessary. Call me Karen, she said. Chapter 8 Mike realized that they had not paid any attention to the wounds. Shaking his head, he said, let's have a look at your ankle now. He took out his first aid kit and gestured for Rachel to sit, but she shook her head and excused herself to wash her foot first before letting him look at it. It was one of her fetishes, not wanting to be caught dead with dirty nails or feet or underwear. She swore her corpse would still blush if ever any of these should happen. I've seen worse, he said, dirtier feet, I mean. Mike was appalled at her insistence to wash her feet. This brain is not going to kill me, so indulge me, she snapped. Oh, for the love of God. Mike burst out, not knowing if he would laugh at her quirk. When she came back from the bathroom, her limp was almost gone. By how she walked with her right knee unbending and her shoulders stiff, Mike knew that she was trying to conceal it. Okay, please sit now. I think we've dragged this out long enough. Mike pulled a stool in front of where Rachel sat. Once seated, he asked her to put her leg on his lap, and when she did, he began to examine her foot. Does this hurt? Rachel wiggled her toes. No. Not anymore. Or at least not so much. I'm limping because I don't want to strain it. Mike pressed the flesh behind the ankle and waited for her reaction. Ouch. Of course, if you poke at it, it will hurt. Oops. Sorry. It seems like nothing serious, but I'll wrap it for support. Mike took out an elastic bandage and started wrapping her ankle with it. Then he stood up and got a cold compress from the fridge. He handed it over to her. Put this on top of your ankle. This will help. Rachel stared at it and pursed her lips. There's really no need for that. I should leave. Just the bandage is fine. She squeezed her bandaged foot inside her right sneakers. She had to loosen the shoelace, fold it down, and step on the backside of the canvas. She left the lace untied. What about your knee? I can't let you leave all bloodied. He tried to turn it into a joke, and he looked at Rachel, whose expression remained unreadable. Mike dragged the stool closer to her and started checking her knee. Rachel watched him. He seemed younger than her, perhaps in his late twenties. Blonde hair covered his head and while it's trimmed short behind the ears, some curls hung at the back of his head. When he started peering over her knee, locks of his hair fell across his forehead, and she had the desire to brush them back into place so he could see what he was doing clearly. Mike looked undecided about whether to cut the knee portion of her jeans or to fold the pants leg up over the injury. The fact that she was wearing skinny jeans didn't help. Rachel wanted to tell him that this was the only pair she had with her but seeing him so undecided on what to do was almost hilarious. She will just buy another pair tomorrow. Just cut it, she said, stifling a laugh. Are you sure? More often than not, I rip my patient's clothes off, and usually, they don't have the strength to argue. Since you're conscious, it's harder to decide what the right thing to do is. He winked at her. He cut a bigger hole in her jeans. Then he cleaned the wound and applied antiseptic. It's going to get ugly as it heals, he said. He rubbed his hands with alcohol. Listen, Karen, he started. I'm really sorry about, he stammered, you know, the accident. And thank you for not creating a scene. Rachel flinched upon hearing herself be addressed as Karen. She didn't know where the lie came from. The moment that Mike asked her what her name was, she only had a few seconds to think if she would give her real name. She surprised herself when she gave him a different one. It's not all your fault, she answered. Now that Rachel had felt the comfort of a couch, she realized how exhausted she was. She wanted to just scoot over and sleep regardless of the cramps she may, later on, suffer from for not staying in bed. The trouble was, she also knew she had to get up and look for a place to spend the night. I should really get going. She stood up and tested her right ankle by slowly shifting some of her weight to it. She heaved a sigh of relief when it didn't throb. Stay a while. There's no need to rush, he said. The burgers, remember? Ah, yes. The king of burgers, of course, she mimicked. Never ridicule the king of burgers, Mike cut in before handing her the food. Winking, he added, let's eat outside. I have a porch. 
Mike walked towards the porch, he turned to her and nodded his head slightly, asking her to follow him. Rachel surveyed the living room. Only a couch, a black coffee table, and a matching black side table lay before her. Then something caught her eye. Across the room to the left, two mountain bikes were hung. A lazy smile split her face, and her eyes softened as she remembered the one she had to sell years ago. It was a decision she made when she realized that she no longer had the luxury of time to join bike tours. She moved to where the bikes were hung. She touched a wheel while inspecting the gears of each bike. She was surprised to discover that she's no longer familiar with the models in the market. She pulled herself away from the bikes and followed Mike outside. Though she's in New Jersey, she felt anonymous in the place, in whatever part of Jersey she was right now. The sky was just so dark. She took the burger out of the paper bag, unwrapped it, and took a bite. She caught Mike watching her, grinning from ear to ear, as though waiting for her confirmation that the burger actually was as good as he claimed. Best. She said. With that, Mike bit his burger and grinned widely at her. Listen, Karen, Mike started after taking the last bite of his burger. I want to apologize again, really sorry about what happened. I'm glad nothing terrible resulted from it, I just really want you to know that. It's nothing, she said. I'm thirsty. Do you have anything to drink? Oh right, I'm sorry I didn't offer you one sooner. I don't know where my head is tonight. He stood up and put his hands inside his pockets. What would you like? Coffee? Iced tea? Soda, maybe? Mike shifted his feet in a rather cute but bothersome manner. His hands were still inside his pockets. Rachel's mouth opened in fascination. His actions reminded her of David. God, she's missing her husband so much. Just water is okay, she said after a while. Mike smiled and walked away. The pitcher and two glasses jiggled on a tray. Mike poured some water into a glass and offered it to Rachel. Here you go, he said and sat down opposite her. I can't remember if you bumped your head on the pavement, Mike started. You know, when I hit you, perhaps in shock, I saw this blinding flash of white light. I couldn't see you clearly, and yet it was as if you're standing out. It's like for a moment, I lost my focus. After that, I saw you on all fours. Exactly what happened to me as well. Perhaps that's how it is in accidents. Those telling you that you'll see your life flashing before your eyes, they're wrong after all. She chuckled, oddly surprised that she has relaxed in Mike's presence. What actually one sees is the flashing white light that sort of brings you somewhere else like the event is ethereal. For me, when I opened my eyes, I was bent over like a dog. I got to give it to you, you don't seem rattled at all. Rattled? Dear God, no. I don't think anything can do that to me at this point. Her eyes rounded as though the very notion of being rattled over a few scrapes was ridiculous. You seem tired. You're very observant. Mike regarded her concernedly. I didn't get a decent meal today, and my schedules wearied me. I should really get going. She wanted to, only... She was uncertain where to go. David had always been her home since they got married, but she didn't want to see him just yet. Let me take you home. It's the least I can do. Rachel gaped at Mike as she racked her mind for a good enough hotel. She couldn't think of one. All she wanted to do was hit the bed and sleep, that was, if she could. Though tired, she's afraid that if she's left alone with her thoughts, she would never find sleep. Stay for the night. A smile touched his lips and his eyes were almost begging. Rachel opened her mouth to protest, but before she could voice out her objection, Mike spoke again. Come on, there's a guest room, I won't bother you. Gentleman's promise, he said, putting his right hand over his chest. No, Rachel said. I don't think it's a good idea. Come on. Please. It's the only thing I can do to make up for it, Mike said, gesturing towards her torn jeans, this. It's nothing. I mean, it's really nothing to me now. The burgers evened it out. Mike chuckled. You're very generous. Not really. But I don't want to take up much of your time. If I beg, will you stay? I was raised a good kid by my dad, and he will frown upon me if he learns that I didn't even offer. You offered? That's more than enough. But please. Mike insisted. Really, please. Rachel wondered if it would be okay to stay. 
She was tired, and yet she didn't know this man. And yet, her body wanted to rest. At the last minute, she smiled at Mike. Let's make your father a proud man, Rachel said. Mike smiled at her, and that was the moment Rachel knew she made the right decision. The queen-sized bed covered with white linen and the two pillows on it looked inviting. There was a chrome lamp perched on a deep mahogany brown side table. She put her purse on top of the side table and the paper bags on the floor. The yellow light brought an almost dramatic tone, and to keep from digging into her emotions, she began fluffing the pillows and arranged them on one side of the bed. When she was finished, she flopped down on the bed. She kicked her untied sneakers off. Then she pressed her back against the headrest of the bed and pulled her legs tightly to her chest, her head propped above the knees. Being alone in the room made her think of David, but instead of calling him, she opened her purse. She took out her journal and scanned her notes. With each line, her throat constricted. She choked on a sob. She was furious over a lot of things. For the limited time she probably has. For feeling depressed. For being the one who got sick. It could be any person, and yet, it had to be her. She closed the journal with shaking fingers and put it on the bedside table. Then she laid herself down on the bed against the pillows, her gaze fixed on the leather-bound journal. Sitting under the lamp, the journal vibrated with life as though it were a reminder of what she would go through. Before she could stop herself, she ripped the bedside table drawer open. She shoved the journal inside and closed the drawer loudly, angry at herself. She collapsed back in bed sobbing and pressed her head against a pillow in an attempt to muffle the sounds. A thousand questions ran in her head, an infinite jumble of thoughts without any clear meaning. Before she fell asleep, she managed to utter a quick prayer that sounded more like a melancholic plea, a wish that in her absence, Jeremy would be all right, that her son would grow up well and have a good life. Mike took out the Bible that his father gave him when he was a child. Somehow, he felt like Karen was a long-lost friend, the kind whom one meets and feels an instant connection with. He brushed off the dust that made the Bible seem older than it actually was. Creases in the leather jacket became more visible like a bundle of artistic lines. He would hand the copy to Karen and joke that every hotel has a Bible in each room. When he reached her door, he heard soft muffled cries from the inside. His hand froze in the air as he listened for a few seconds more to confirm if she was really crying. When he was certain, he backed away from the door and regretted that he didn't get the chance to tell his joke. Chapter 9 Mike lay down in bed, falling face flat against two pillows. He liked to sleep with his arms stretched out beside him, his shoulders relaxed. He shifted his head to the left for easy breathing, leaving only half of his face buried against the pillows. He was exhausted from having worked a full shift. Tomorrow and the day after, though, he had no hospital duty so he could get the rest he needed. He stared at the wall and noticed for the first time that the cleaning lady seemed to have forgotten scrubbing the spot that he inadvertently touched after he oiled the gears of his bike, and the ugly patch of black bothered him. If he weren't so tired, he would have gotten up to rub it off, but there were more important things he had to spend his energy on. His thoughts flew to Lee, his girlfriend for the past three years. Their story started out effortlessly, him holding her, her liking his touch, and all the silly butterflies flying inside their stomachs. The years have seen their relationship mature where comfort and knowledge of belongingness became the key factors for keeping their relationship. It's that beautiful taste of affection that hung in his subconscious that made him buy an engagement ring. The ring though still sat hidden inside his dresser. It wasn't forgotten, never, he thought. But rather, had become irrelevant as the days passed by, and he still kept on wondering if he should push through with the proposal. The source of his dilemma, Lee wanted to go back to New York, which was to be expected since she grew up there. But Mike had no intention of leaving New Jersey. He persuaded her to practice their professions in Jersey, him persuading her was because he couldn't see himself living anywhere else her agreeing to it was because of love. Earlier, they had a heated argument. It started as a simple conversation when Mike mentioned that he wanted to buy property in New Jersey. The other end of the phone line went quiet because she despised where the conversation was headed. And true to what Mike was expecting, it erupted into one of those quiet fights that they had become accustomed to lately. 
and the sore topic was always New York or New Jersey. That was when his car hit Karen. He hated to think that because of his relationship issues, he had literally hurt someone. Mike's thoughts shifted to Karen. He liked Karen, but not in a romantic way. He was, after all, really in love with Lee, but there was something about Karen that immediately drew him to her. He couldn't figure out what, but after hearing her crying in the guest room, he felt a certain level of responsibility, a sense of protectiveness, over her. Before sleep settled in on him, Mike wondered if he should make a late-night phone call to Lee. He knew though that it would be better to let things simmer between them. Lee loves him, and they could work things out together. As his eyes fluttered before closing, a chill coursed through his heart for fear that it might not be true anymore. Remembering how she had gone all silent earlier made him uncomfortable. He would have preferred she shouted and argued with him again. But this time, Lee had remained passive. It was the coldness that worried him. It seemed that lately, any simple miscommunication between them could turn into a horrible fight so easily. He fell asleep and had dreams of proposing to her in different ways. Each proposal from him varied, and only her answers remained the same, a collection of blank stares. The alarm clock went off, and a few seconds later, the vibration of Mike's mobile phone joined in. He reached out of his bed covers, fumbling, and turned off the alarm. Then his hand followed a blind trail to the bedside table to locate the vibrating phone. When his hand came into contact with it, he pressed a button, and the phone went still. Through the slits of his heavily lidded eyes, he noticed the faint light seeping through the glass panels above his bedroom door. He tried to recall if he forgot to switch off the lights last night. Mike, irritated at having to get up from bed, knew that he wouldn't be able to sleep again unless he checked on the living room. His hair was disheveled, and his eyes were half opened as he picked up the necklace on the bedside table and put it on. His hand grazed reverently over the pendant with a gentle tug. The necklace had a thin gold chain while the pendant was like a golden egg with five small diamonds that sparkled when the light touched them. He went out of the bedroom without putting a shirt on. From the porch, Rachel heard a door inside the house close, and after a few seconds, it was followed by the sound of Mike's footsteps. Mike walked out to the porch in his pajamas, wearing nothing on top, no slippers too. His hair was still untouched by a comb, and yet, he was wearing jewelry. Rachel grinned as Mike came closer to where she was. Mike, on the other hand, was wearing a surly expression. What in the world? He began. Then he remembered who Karen was and why she was here. Oh, for Christ's sake. He uttered. You must think I'm a complete moron. Last night, Mike was clean-shaven, but this morning, even after only a few hours, Rachel noticed that his chin and jaw were covered with stubble. His hair was a mess of blonde tangles. Uncombed, they were as curly as her hair. Rachel's grin transformed into a slight upward curve, but her eyes remained twinkling. Mike's necklace was so dainty, and on him, it seemed totally out of place. Why are you laughing? He asked. His eyes had opened a little wider, but he was still groggy from lack of sleep. If she didn't have the same mess of blonde curls ruffled from sleep, she would have made a crack about his hair that quite resembled a bird's nest. Nothing, Rachel said. Tell me about that necklace. Her eyes danced. Mike realized what the object of her fascination was, the necklace. Not you two. Give me a minute, I'll get dressed, and then I'll come back down. He rushed to his room to get dressed. In a few minutes, Mike was back on the porch with her. Rachel noticed that his hair looked as though he had run his fingers through them. His eyes were tired, but they were definitely more alert now. Why are you up so early? He asked. Couldn't sleep, Rachel said. I'm sorry if I bothered you. I really didn't mean to wake you. It's just that I had a hard time sleeping, and I wanted some fresh air. Well, you did manage to wake me up. And yes, you did bother me in my sleep, so I guess we're even now. Rachel's nostrils flared as she looked at him with wide eyes, wondering if he was kidding. You think that's even? She said indignantly. Give me your car keys, stand over there, she pointed at a spot on the lawn, and let me hit you. Then I'll go inside this house, sleep, and wait for you to sing. She invited him to object by raising her eyebrows at him before continuing, then when I wake up to the unfamiliar noise, I'll tell you we're even. She put stress on noise. 
Mike laughed. Are you a writer? Because you painted such a lovely scene. She began laughing too. Tell me something about yourself, Mike said. The porch had a wooden table, which was shaped like a poker table. Four wooden chairs surrounded it. Mike took the one facing the lawn. I, Rachel started. Mike was watching her closely as though he was really interested in what she's about to say. I'm in sales, she continued. Rachel figured that the less she shared, the fewer questions she would invite from him. Her concept of telling everything to a stranger vanished. She wanted to kick herself for being so inconsistent, and for not being able to put it past behind her to blame her actions on agitation over cancer. Okay, Mike said. You're in sales. Selling what? It's not interesting. Software applications, she answered. Software applications? My house is graced by a geek, he joked. You are a terrible, judgmental person. I'm kidding, he said. I'm a huge fan of technology. Can we talk about something else? Her gaze fell upon the necklace, and she remembered what Mike said earlier when she made fun of his necklace. That, she said, pointing at the necklace. Oh, this? He asked, half smiling. Yes, tell me about it. Earlier, you said something like, not you too. What's that about? With a sudden shift in topic from Rachel's job to Mike's necklace, his countenance changed, it softened if only for a few seconds. This is where I get my good looks from. He grinned. Come on, tell me a good story, she insisted. Hmm, he said as though he was really thinking of a good enough story to share. There's this one time when Lee and I were together, and she spent the night with me. She noted that her face had marks the following day, he paused. Actually, a chain mark. He was touching the necklace. And then he continued, she was sleeping with her face pressed against my chest, so she got a small thin line across her cheek when she woke up. I like calling it the chain mark and teased her about it. We laughed, and I told her she's lucky it's only a thin line. It would have been more uncomfortable if she slept over the pendant and had the five small diamonds pricking her face. Then, that would be a diamond peel. Rachel laughed at Mike's sorry attempt at a joke. But it was something good enough to laugh at. But you know women, they always ask for a lot, he added, winking. When we were already dating for a month, she told me to take the necklace off before sleeping. He couldn't stop laughing. It seemed that she was asking too much from me, but then I realized that it really was an odd thing to sleep with this necklace on. Absolutely, Rachel agreed. He touched the necklace again, he was toying with the oval pendant. So, I gave her that, but still, I never go out without it. He grinned sheepishly at Rachel, and then he pressed his lips together. To Rachel, he looked like a little boy. But it's so dainty. Doesn't anyone ever tease you about it? I hide it under my shirt, he replied quickly, his grin growing wider. How important is it? I mean, the necklace? This necklace came from a very important person in my life. She wasn't able to tell me a proper goodbye, so she asked that this be given to me. You know, to remind me that when I feel that her love's ebbing away, all I have to do is wear this necklace, and I'll feel her. So I won't forget that distance will never separate us. She believed that this necklace would maybe channel us one day together. His face changed from serious to his usual boyish countenance. He winked at her. Rachel grew confused because his flat tone made her believe what he said, but after he winked, she thought he was kidding her. When she noticed that Mike was smiling fondly at her, she stopped. Perhaps there was some truth in what he said. I'm sorry. I thought you were kidding. You really had to use the word ebbing. A few faint lines formed on the corner of her eyes as she smiled. All true. What's wrong with ebbing? Nothing. Except that it sounded so classic, so old. She laughed, and Mike joined in. Anyway, don't tell that story to Lee, she may get jealous of this other woman. Mike nodded as he smiled at her in response, indulging in the crystal melody of her laughter. He liked seeing her brown eyes twinkling with amusement. It made him feel at home. The memory of her crying last night came back to him, and he tried to bring up the subject. Your eyes look, he started, I hope you won't be offended, but they do look puffy. Mike was watching her reaction, mindful of a twitch her eyelids may make or a pause before she gives her answer. Rachel tensed. I'm just tired. She averted her eyes away from Mike. There were very few houses in his neighborhood. 
Mike's place had two floors and a basement. The house felt too masculine with its gray walls and minimalistic interior design. The door was made of mahogany wood and covered with varnish. From where Rachel sat, the faint scent of the lacquer can still be smelled. Her eyes fell upon the doorframe. There were carvings all across the entire length of the doorframe on its left side. The distance from each mark varied, sometimes, they're too near while at other times, the distance could be several inches away. Then the mark stopped at about two feet below the top of the doorframe. What are you looking at? Mike asked her. Those marks on your door. Is that art or what? Nah, my old man used to measure me against this door frame when I was growing up. He said he wanted to know if he's feeding me right. It's funny how he used only my height to gauge that. And he really had to ruin the door frame. Not exactly. As you said, it's art. That's a question, Rachel pointed out, laughing. I probably should try to catch some sleep now, she said, standing up. No, Mike blurted out. His hand quickly grasped her hand. She raised her eyebrows at him. No? You woke me up, ridiculed my necklace, and now that I'm fully awake, you're going to tell me you're sleeping on me? It's still too early to do anything else. Unless you have anything in mind? Not really. I like to sit here and breathe in the fresh air. A good conversation is going to make it better, though. Mike pulled down on her hand, asking her to sit again. I have an idea, Rachel said. Her eyes brightened up. What? Say yes. No. Way risky. Say yes. Tell me what it is first. Say yes, please. Not without you telling me what it is. Okay, she said reluctantly. I want to go biking. For a moment, Mike's eyes lit up. Then the light faded, and his happiness turned to horror. That's ridiculous. With your sprain and all. It wasn't exactly a sprain, Rachel argued. She moved her right ankle in front of her and wiggled it. She was able to do it without much effort. I sold my bike before moving to Jersey. It's been years since I last rode one. Please. No. Why not? Look at you, you're tired. And you have a sprain for God's sake. Is there really no way you'd? No. Rachel frowned and sat down, knowing that Mike wouldn't change his mind. Maybe she could get the mountain bike from where it was hung, take a few spins, and return it back. Mike looked sleepy enough, and all she had to do was wait for him to fall asleep. She smiled to herself as she thought about it. Then her face became serious again. She broke the silence with a sigh. If only I brought with me more clothes, I would grab that bike off your wall and go out for a spin, she said. Mike studied her. She really looked intent on riding the bike. But with her sprain? What kind of doctor would it make him if he would allow her to go biking? Rachel was leaning against the chair and watching the few stars in the sky. Mike's eyes lingered on Karen's slightly puffed eyes and thought that perhaps biking would help her take her mind off whatever it was she had cried over. After all, biking had always been his and his girlfriend's way of removing stress. It was an excellent activity to veer away from the usual pressures of their jobs. Lee has her biking clothes inside, he started. Rachel's eyes sparkled. Is that a yes? What do you think it is? He stood up and moved closer to her. Let me check your foot. Does it still hurt? He examined her right ankle. Will you try walking without limping? Rachel stood up tested her right foot, and tried to feel if it was still painful. I can manage to pedal as long as the slope is not too steep. Come on, I'm really psyched to do this. I haven't done so. In a long time. Yes, I know. You already said. Mike feigned annoyance but failed. Rachel was excited. She threw her arms around him, giving him a quick hug. Embarrassed, she moved backward. Her cheeks grew hot and she hoped that Mike took the redness of her cheeks as excitement over biking. The bandage held her ankle well, and with the right shoes, she was certain that she wouldn't have a hard time biking. She didn't want to miss the last chance she'd probably get to do it. Let's see if the clothes and gears will fit you, Mike said, already infected by Rachel's excitement. He looked upwards and took in the still dark sky. It's just the right time to go biking. Mike lent Leah's clothes to Rachel. It didn't surprise him when the cycling clothes fit her. Even the shoes fit, 
although wearing them had taken quite a while because of the bandages wrapping her right ankle. Mike almost retracted his approval to go biking. A good 20 minutes passed before Rachel practically dragged him out of the house and into the street. Mike repeatedly asked himself what it was that he agreed to. First, he hit Karen with his car, albeit accidentally. Second, when she asked to go biking, he instantly relented. What was that about? He knew it was a crazy idea, but similar to Karen, he also loved biking so much. Lately, the bikes had started to gather dust due to his busy schedule, and he was missing his adventures on them with Lee. So just a few words from Karen, and he agreed right away. Rachel started pedaling, and when she was in the middle of the road, she raised her arms upwards for a few seconds and shouted. The air sent some locks of hair that hung from under the helmet dancing. The bike wobbled, and she put her hands back on the handle and laughed even louder. Mike laughed after her and pedaled to catch up. Easy on your ankle, please. He shouted. They rode in silence after that. Mike took the lead and steered them straight ahead. The sun was beginning to rise already. They took several turns and passed under a canopy of trees. Eventually, they reached a small hill. Mike dismounted and walked towards her. Come on, Karen, he said. This is as far as our bikes could take us. He pointed to the hill. We could still bike uphill, but I'm afraid for your ankle. He winked at her. I don't want to have to carry you home. Okay, then. Before following him, she took the water bottle from the bike. She twisted the cap and drank, feeling the cold water as it passed her throat. Mike was also doing the same. When Rachel finished, she closed the water bottle and brought it with her as she trailed after Mike. They walked uphill. Rachel felt a splatter of a burning lump in her chest, but she ignored it. Just when she felt like she was too tired to walk, Mike walked slower, choosing a spot for them to sit on, and stopped where the green grass still covered the ground. Come sit with me, he invited. Rachel joined him. The wind was blowing softly against her skin, her hair, and the grass. She wiped the sweat that rolled from her forehead down to her face and caught Mike brushing his gloved hands against his cheeks. It's nice up here, right? Mike said. You would like it even better higher there, but, his gaze fell upon her right ankle, then upon her. Some other time, perhaps? Rachel nodded, her eyes softened as she wondered if there would still be enough time for that. She swallowed hard before breaking away from Mike's gaze. Thankful that she still experienced an odd sense of belongingness to the world, she turned to Mike again. Thanks, Rachel said with a smile. Mike smiled back at her. It's my pleasure. Rachel played with her water bottle as she breathed in the fresh air. It's a day this beautiful that makes one simply want to bum around and enjoy nature. Yeah. I'm glad I did it again. It's been a long time since I had an outdoor activity, Rachel realized. So, really, thank you. Mike beamed upon seeing how delighted she was and told himself that he did the right thing. Yeah, it's nice. Chapter 10 David was exhausted as he maneuvered the car into the garage of their new home. Regardless, he couldn't contain his excitement, so he kept on humming an old tune. Today, He's going to do some last-minute checks on the changes to the house he asked Ray. As soon as he parked the car, he opened the trunk, and a box marked Fragile stared at him. He carefully picked it up and started walking towards the house. Inside, he could smell the fresh coat of paint faintly. He asked Ray to use the water base kind to make sure that the house would be ready for moving in as soon as possible. Ray's friendly voice greeted David. We're done, Ray said, smiling proudly at him. It was true. Every alteration David had instructed Ray to do on the first floor was finished. I'll check upstairs. Come on, David said. Ray had become a friend over the six months they'd been working on the house. He was a good fellow that worked fast, and he easily picked up on just what David wanted to be done. There were times Ray even insisted on doing some alterations to the house, and his recommendations were always good. What's that? Ray asked pointing to the box David was carrying. This? A light, David replied. We're going to install it in the family room. As soon as they were on the second floor, David inspected each room. The place was really ready, he thought. Satisfied, he patted Ray on the shoulder with his free hand. 
Thanks, man. It's customary to say that with a tip, Ray joked. David laughed. You won't be disappointed. That's just my sense of humor talking. Ray grinned. David put down the box on the floor. This is a disco light, he said as he opened the box. Inside was a disco ball two feet in diameter securely cushioned in bubble wrap. As David removed the plastic covering it, Ray reached for the bubble wrap, and started pinching the bubbles. Popping sounds immediately surrounded them. That will have to go. David pointed overhead to the small chandelier with tiny crystal balls. What? Ray said incredulously. No way, man. This chandelier is perfect where it is. We can't take it down on a whim and replace it with, he paused, nose wrinkling, that. Ray said it with such distaste that David almost laughed again. He controlled it nonetheless so that Ray would take him seriously. I've made up my mind. The chandelier has got to go, David insisted. But. You can't argue on this one. Oh, yeah? Well, it's not right for the house. What's not right about it? You're turning this classic beauty into an entertainment room. Ray scowled, and David could hear the frustration in the former's voice. We're installing the disco light there, David said firmly. Another bubble popped as Ray pinched on it. Ray realized that David would not concede, so he took the disco ball and popped a few more bubbles before covering it with bubble wrap again. Fine. And here I am thinking that your house is already perfect. Ray put the light back inside the box and went down to get the stepladder. David grinned as soon as Ray turned his back. For this particular replacement in the house, he wasn't going to explain himself to Ray. This was only between Rachel and him. When Ray returned, he set up the stepladder and went up, then took down the chandelier. I still don't understand. This chandelier is the right size, the right color, and the right number of bulbs. It's perfect, Ray mumbled. Don't be such a baby about it. You have my permission to bring your ladies here and dance in my disco, David added jokingly, which only made Ray sourer than he already was. When David saw that Ray had started installing the light, he went downstairs to check on the other parts of the house, wondering how Rachel was doing. He decided to check on her and dialed her number. After several rings, when she still hadn't picked up her phone, he dropped the call. Chapter 11 The dark sky was bidding goodbye, and it was now being replaced with the sun shyly peering above the horizon. Rachel glanced up and thanked God for the good weather and for allowing her to bike again. She realized that the gratitude had come early as her ankles started to throb painfully. She had to stop biking in a light. Then, she bent down and adjusted the straps of her shoes, but after a few pedals, her right ankle started to hurt more. She was left with no option but to ask Mike to rest for a while so she could work on her ankle. When they found shade under a tree, he took her bike and leaned it against the trunk. Mike was frowning at her. I'll ride home alone and pick you up in the car, he suggested. No, she argued. This will go away in a few minutes. Just give me some time to catch my breath. Okay, but you're sweating so much that I'm not sure if it's because you're feeling pain or if it's because we bike halfway already. Definitely not because of pain. You know from here, I can see one of the veins in your head throbbing. Actually, the closer I take a look, the more certain I become that it's about to pop. Oh, shut up. This is nothing, Rachel said, and then to prove her point, she stood up. Let's go, ouch. 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 She blurted out, hopping. Mike went to her side in a rush, concerned. You sound like a woman in labor. He assisted Rachel into a sitting position. That's it. I don't think you'll be able to ride the rest of the way home. Just wait for me here, okay? Rachel looked at him with resignation in her eyes. I'm sorry for the hassle. Nonsense, Mike cut in as he rode his bike. With a final look at her, he waved goodbye. Rachel looked around her and noticed that the place still didn't look familiar. On the bright side of things, she could have her moment, think things over, and be strong enough to face tomorrow. She hated it that her thoughts sounded so cliché. David's probably finishing up on his painting, she thought. She wanted to call him because she missed her husband, but she remembered that she left her phone in the guest room. Sitting on the grass with her back pressed against the tree trunk, 
she closed her eyes and settled in the comfortable surroundings. It would still be a while before Mike gets back, and she could certainly use a nap. Mike was panting when he reached his house. He wiped the sweat from his forehead with the back of his gloves when he noticed that someone was sitting on the steps of his front porch. Another car was parked in the driveway. Lee, he said. How long have you been here? Lee stirred in her seat and stood up. She started walking towards him. Mike adored Leah's large, sapphire blue eyes, which suited her bright personality. When she's angry though, the same eyes turn into lethal slits. Her shiny, dark hair trailed after her as she walked. Lee took Mike's arm, unconcerned that the sweat would rub off on her. She clutched tightly against his arm as they walked back to the house. I was worried about you, she said quietly. You didn't call me. There was a hint of a frown as she said it, making her red lips curl into a pout. I'm sorry, I was, Mike didn't know what to say. Was he going to tell her that he had been in an accident? That would make her fume. She would want to know why he didn't take the time to call her. My cousin Karen came to visit me, he said instead. And I had to take care of her for a while. What is she, five? Lee asked, her thin nose wrinkling as she voiced out her doubt. Mike was sensible enough to catch the hint of sarcasm in her question. He knew that it was a lame excuse, but he didn't want to have to explain everything. It would only bring up more questions that he didn't think he could handle at the moment. Actually, she hurt her ankle last night, but she was so keen on going biking. On the way back, she had trouble riding, so I went home. I'm going to get the car and pick her up. That's a silly thing to do, going biking when she already hurt her ankle. That's what I told her. Anyway, she said she was up for it, so I agreed, and here we are. She couldn't ride the whole way back. Lee followed him to the garage, still unconvinced. Mike opened the cabinet that contained the bike rack, carried it, and installed it carefully at the rear of the car. When he finished installing the bike rack, he took the car keys and opened the passenger door for Lee. Let's go, he said. Sometimes you infuriate me, but then, you'll be your charming self and, what the heck, Lee said as she moved towards him. I miss you, she said, kissing him on the cheek. Mike wrapped his arms around her and kissed her on the lips. You stink. That last remark made Mike all the more touchy and playful. Instead of letting her go, he squeezed her tighter and rubbed his sweaty face against hers. Inside the car, Lee took a towel from her bag and used it to wipe the sweat off Mike's face and then hers. She flipped down the visor and retouched her makeup. Mike glanced at his watch as he started to drive. A good twenty minutes had passed. So tell me about Karen. How come you never mentioned her before? Lee asked. Karen's a distant cousin, and she's got some issues that she's trying to work through. Mike didn't feel guilty about what he said because he believed there was some truth to it. Or it was, at least, close to the truth. He concluded that after hearing Karen cry last night. You're going to like her, he added. He spotted Karen sitting with her back against a tree. Rachel looked up and saw his car. She stood faster now, with no more traces of the pain as though the short time she rested did her good, Mike noted. He parked the car across the street directly opposite the bike. Sorry it took me a while, Mike said. It's not a problem, Rachel said. She was looking at the young woman stepping out of the car. She was tall and slim with long black hair. Her eyes were huge, doll-like, and beautiful. She concluded that she must be his girlfriend. Hi, Rachel said as she offered her hand to Lee. Lee smiled, squinting as though she was trying to take in who Rachel really was in Mike's life. She clasped Rachel's hand. I have to say when Mike told me that his cousin visited, I sort of didn't believe him. I thought that he cooked up an excuse for not calling me. But looking at you, she paused, I actually believe him. Lee laughed genuinely. Rachel and Mike exchanged glances. She mouthed, cousin? Mike mouthed back, thank you. It was a good thing that Lee wasn't looking at them during this exchange. Nice to meet you, er, Rachel paused, waiting for the woman in front of her to give her name. It's Lee. I'm a complete moron for not giving the introductions. Apologies. Mike shouted as he grabbed the bike and walked it towards the car. He set it on the rack. Accepted, both girls replied. Curious thing, Rachel began, so now you believe him that I'm his cousin? The answer intrigued her. 
Yes, Lee said. Look at him. He's practically you. Rachel was shocked. What? Then she laughed. Look at him, he looks just like you, Lee insisted. Rachel obliged, but she couldn't see the resemblance. It's the hair. Curly tops to the point of almost being frizzy. Refine the sides of his jaws, and you could pass his siblings, Lee insisted. Rachel considered it. No, it's really just the hair, she argued. Turning to look at Lee, she added admiringly, I've always wanted to have black hair like yours. You can experiment and dye your hair, you know, he said. She squinted to mentally picture Rachel with black hair, I think it'd look good on you. Really? Yeah, you should give it a try. Already? Mike asked. He was finished putting up the bike. Rachel limped slightly as she moved towards the back seat. Realizing that she was wearing Leah's clothes, she quickly apologized, Lee, I'm so sorry you had to catch me wearing your clothes. It's okay. They actually look good on you. Rachel smiled at Lee graciously. Thank you. Are we going back to your place now? Lee asked Mike. No, I know it's a girly thing, but brunch? Mike asked. Rachel and Lee laughed. Who could resist that? Lee answered. Mike couldn't, wouldn't. He entered the car and waited for all the doors to close, revved the engine, and drove off. He was thinking to himself how nice it would be to have brunch with two beautiful women. Rachel ordered steak and felt guilty that David wasn't with her as she ate the nice T-bone. She knew how he would have devoured his if he were with them. I'm too full to get back in the car and drive. I need some more exercise, Mike said. Coffee? Lee asked. Well, I don't mind getting a second cup from a coffee shop while I work my leg muscles again he said as he stood and headed towards the door with Lee and Rachel following him. Rachel glanced around Middletown. It seemed veiled with a kind of hazy eccentricity this morning. Sure, the establishments were the same, but there was something about the feel of the place that she was unaccustomed to. She couldn't point it out, though. Is it just me, or has fashion changed overnight? She mused. I don't know. But last time I checked, what I'm wearing is still the in thing, Lee answered. Rachel gave Leah's outfit a second look. Yes, definitely the same. She shook her head and let a short laugh escape her lips. Mike stopped in front of a coffee shop with brown signage. Alexander S., it read. Rachel couldn't remember having been here before. Yet when they entered the coffee shop, and the scent of freshly brewed coffee filled the air, she remembered Betty and the shop she visited yesterday. If she hadn't been so preoccupied, she would have paid attention to the name. Just coffee for me, Lee said. Mike looked at Rachel with raised eyebrows. I'll have the same, Rachel said. Two coffees and one cappuccino to go please, he told the barista. Oh, are we not having coffee here? Lee asked. Nope. I told you I gotta work these muscles. Let's walk around afterward. How inconsiderate. Karen's practically limping. It's okay. She'll. Rachel didn't hear the rest of Mike's words. She was looking around the coffee shop. If she wasn't mistaken, this was the place she visited yesterday. Only, this room had wallpaper as opposed to the paint she thought she saw. She was probably mistaken. The only confirmation that it was indeed the coffee shop she visited was if she could find Betty. Excuse me, Rachel asked the barista. Is Betty around? Slender, hair in a bob, thin lips, a nice smile, around twenty-something. The barista was smiling at her before almost choking on a laugh. I would have said yes, but I believe Betty is in her forties, she said and pointed to the woman who was busily cleaning up one of the tables. Late forties, actually. Rachel glanced at the woman, who was bending down, clearing up the corner table. One look at her with locks of gray hair, and Rachel shook her head. Oh. No, that isn't her. Who's Betty? Lee asked. Um, a friend. Okay, so let's get moving, Mike said as he handed them their drinks. Lee and Mike started towards the door, and Rachel followed. Before leaving the coffee shop, she stole another look at the woman. The waitress glanced up, and for a brief moment, Rachel thought the woman recognized her. A small smile formed on the barista's lips, but it was gone so quickly as soon as it had appeared that Rachel might have imagined it. 
Upon reaching Mike's place, Rachel headed back to the guest room, took a shower, and napped. She woke up at almost four in the afternoon. She was starting to get bored, being cooped up in the guest room, so she went to look for Mike and Lee. It wasn't like that at all, Mike said. Yep, like this place is better than all the other states. Oh, come on. You know that's not what I mean. Rachel went back inside the guest room and closed the door quietly. She found it odd that earlier, they had such a good time, then a few hours passed and now, Mike and Lee didn't see eye to eye. They tried to keep their voices down, but Rachel could sense that they were fighting over something about places. Once in the bed, she thought of calling David to see how he and Jeremy were doing, but she didn't get to do it because her mobile phone was ringing. She quickly grabbed it on top of the bedside table. It was Dr. Alex Jones calling her. This was his second call for the day. Should she answer it this time? She knew what he would say. He'd start with niceties, and would proceed to remind her about the treatment plan that he prepared for her. She didn't want to think about that yet, so she let her phone ring. She put it back on the bedside table, ignored it, and became thankful when, after a few seconds, the phone went silent. The evening had come when Rachel checked out of the room again, praying that Mike and Lee were finished with their discussion. She didn't want to intrude. She breathed a sigh of relief when loud voices didn't greet her in the hall. Moving to the living room, she found Lee and Mike sitting on the couch, arms entwined around each other. Lee stood and came closer to her. She kissed her on the cheek. I have to go now. I'm on my third shift today, and I have to drop by my place first and catch some sleep, Lee said. It was nice meeting you, Rachel said. Lee smiled at her. Same here. Rachel watched by the porch as Mike walked his girlfriend to the car and kissed her on the cheek. With one last wave at them, Lee drove away. The night approached, and after Rachel and Mike dined on frozen pizza, she volunteered to make coffee. She checked the cupboards, and when she found where he kept the coffee beans, she proceeded to grind them and brew up some hot coffee. Mike was grateful for the little gesture. There's also meat and vegetables in the fridge, he said. I'm not a good cook. Brewing coffee, though, is one thing I can do with my eyes closed, Rachel replied. You can always Google or search for a video on YouTube. Oh, no. I tried and tried, but my husband won't even let me turn on the stove now. I think that says a lot about what a terrible cook I make, she said. But then again, my husband's also such a rotten cook. Mike laughed and went to the porch. Rachel poured them both coffees. She added some sugar, skipped the milk, grabbed the cups, and followed Mike. Out on the porch, Rachel handed Mike his coffee. He bent his head closer to the cup and took a whiff before bringing it to his lips and taking a sip. Rachel decided to spend another night at Mike's. She wanted to be alone but didn't really want to be alone. How contradictory was that? The better explanation she came up with for her behavior was that she didn't want to be alone in a hotel room. At least spending time with Mike meant not having to be alone entirely. Rachel could take her moments to ponder about cancer, and when she started to get crazy with the cancer thoughts, she could just as easily get out of the room and banter with Mike. Lovely girl, she said, glancing over at Mike. Can't complain, I've got good taste, he said, smiling at her. Rachel wondered if she should ask Mike about the argument that she overheard earlier, but decided not to pursue the topic unless it was he who opened up on the subject. We're having a lot of fights lately, he said. Rachel nodded thoughtfully. That was what she was waiting for. It's not a big deal, not like there's anyone else involved. We're fighting because she wants to go back to New York, and I want to stay here. Mike was about to frown, but he controlled it. His lips ended up oddly contorted. Really? She asked, amused. There really is no issue that can't be resolved with a good conversation. Do you love her? Of course. I was actually planning to propose to her. But when I realized that she wants to move back to New York, I decided to hold off for a while and sift things through in my head, think it over one more time. Hold on, right there, Rachel cut in. What? She asked. What's so surprising about it? You're holding out on your proposal because she wants to go to New York, and you don't find anything odd in that? Hey, whose side are you on? Don't pull that card on me, Mike. That's not a very good reason. Mike laughed. Okay. 
So it sounded a wee bit odd. Not a wee bit. It sounded totally odd. I have my reasons, you didn't let me finish, he pointed out. Oh. Okay, let's hear you out, she said, her eyes a soft blend of caramel brown over the rims of her cup. I don't want to move out of here, he said. Rachel's eyebrows rose, waiting for what he was going to say next. And? She asked when Mike didn't say anything else. That's it. That's the reason, Mike said, stupefied. Are you serious? Rachel asked, her eyes widening as she stifled a laugh. Why is that so hard to believe? He asked. He sipped his coffee. I don't want to leave Jersey. For someone so big, you're so sentimental, she teased. Mike shot her a dirty look. Oh, so now I'm unreasonable. I'm just saying, Rachel said, and then she laughed. Mike just watched her. When Rachel was done laughing, she prodded, really, what's the story? Mike shrugged. I know it's none of my business, but what's keeping you here in New Jersey? I lived in New York for a long time, and it's beautiful there. Sure, it's a bustling city, but you'll find a good place to practice medicine. For one, I'm still finishing my residency here, Mike became quiet for a while as if thinking things over. I don't want to leave my father here, he finally said. He clasped his hands and bowed his head for a moment. When he looked up, he continued talking. My father loves this house. He said that nothing could make him leave this place. There was a time that I tried talking him out of it, but I realized that he's getting old, and if I want to be with him, I need to support him, whatever reasons he has. Rachel stared at him, not believing what she heard. Mike was still looking at her thoughtfully. You are such an asshole. Using your father as an excuse. Okay, there you go again. Why is that so hard to believe, huh? You've got to be the biggest tease I've ever met. And with those eyes of yours, you actually tricked me into believing you, she said. I'm serious. Mike insisted. So I'm sentimental and an asshole. What else can you think of? Okay, she said. Believing him wasn't easy, but after laughing so hard, she felt like she owed it to him to at least patronize him. Does Lee know? He shook his head and chuckled. No, she wouldn't understand. So, what do you tell her when she asks? That New Jersey is the place where we should raise our kids, it's quiet in this particular neighborhood, and this is where we started our careers. This could be our destiny. Quiet? You're kidding, right? Everybody knows that Jersey is the last place on earth that's quiet. I said this neighborhood. Mike laughed loudly this time. Okay, so bad reason. Still, I like it here and my dad. Very, very lame. This is exactly why I never tell Lee my reasons. He gave Rachel a weak smile. Rachel wanted to ask why his father didn't want to move to another place, if that was true anyway, but figured it might be too personal. Honestly, if I were Lee, and that's what you tell me is an excuse, I might just tell you to go marry your father. Mike shrugged and began running his thumb over his necklace as though counting the five diamonds on the pendant. It's not that. My father's old. He went away to visit my aunt, although he didn't want to leave this place even for a few days. My aunt said that if he didn't come to see her, she'd haunt him when she died. Of course, she was kidding, but my dad didn't want to push his luck. So he went. I see, Rachel said thoughtfully. She's starting to believe him, although his reasons still sounded ridiculous, and she couldn't totally wipe the grin on her face. But you shouldn't live according to what your father wants. Did he even ask you to stay with him? I'm sure that if you... No, he didn't, Mike interjected. He wouldn't do that. He's a good man. Oh my god, you're impossible. I'm sure your father already wants to kick you out of the house. Rachel gave in to the laughter that she was suppressing. Hey, I'm a good cook. I'm handy around the house, so I bet he enjoys having me around, he argued. Yeah, and I'm sure your father couldn't live without his little boy, Rachel said, and then she paused upon seeing Mike frown. He wouldn't look at her. Afraid that she's gone overboard teasing him, she apologized. I'm sorry, it's just so hard not to make fun of you, she said. Then Mike looked at her and grinned. Hook, line, and sinker, he said playfully. She punched him lightly on the arm and laughed again. Then, after that, they fell silent. Rachel sipped on her coffee. 
Mike looked at his necklace and said softly, I guess it was a promise I made to my mom. That I would never leave my father behind. Rachel's smile froze. She could feel Mike's affection as he said those words. She wanted to make fun of him again, but there was something so palpable about how he said those words that immediately touched her. It was a comforting thought to know that there were still promises so strong if ever Mike was telling her the truth. Regardless, she knew he was wrong. If he's happy with Lee, and she was the one he wanted to marry, then nothing should keep him from her. I'm sure your mother would understand. And so will your father, Rachel said. It's tricky, you know, promises and stuff. If you can keep the promise, then that's good, but if your parents knew that honoring your promise would eventually give you heartache, I'm pretty sure that they'd release you of it. It's a promise I made to my mom, but I've only ever said it to myself. Mike laughed loudly, realizing how ridiculous his statement must have sounded. Still, it's a promise, that I wouldn't leave my father behind. Leave him alone. Like a child, he tried to justify his last statement. Rachel's eyebrows shot up, and she stood up. She raised both hands as though in surrender. Okay, one more stupid reason, and I'm going back inside, she said. No. I know. It's preposterous. I wish I could have it my way. Love is a compromise. Sometimes, you have to give in to what she wants. Other times, I'm sure she'll be more than happy to oblige. Love is pretty simple if you just listen to your heart. Mike smiled. I always knew that the time would come that I'd have to leave my father, I just didn't want it to come sooner. Well, it was bound to happen anyway. And maybe that time is now. Mike was still holding the necklace. He turned it in his hand one last time before releasing it. What about you? He asked. His question caught Rachel off guard. She was in the middle of gulping the last of her coffee, and she choked. A horrible projectile of coffee followed. Well, it's payback time. Rachel coughed, wiping the liquid dripping from her chin. I have a husband and a son, she said. Not knowing what to say next, she added, but I have to be away from them for a few days. Mike nodded, and his eyes moved to her hands, searching her fingers. Rings in my purse upstairs, she said. You're so defensive, he said before adding, were you in a fight? No. That's unthinkable. My husband is perfect, she said. Then she remembered how her husband always cut his fingernails in bed no matter how many times she scolded him about it and added, well, not perfect but more than good enough. He's a painter. My father used to paint too. He's a famous chef now. I love artists. They have a different way of looking at things, and they're all true romantics at heart. Mike nodded thoughtfully. They probably are. Rachel glanced at her watch. Midnight was fast approaching, and tomorrow she would go back to David. It would be their anniversary, and she had to be home early. She still wasn't sure how to tell him, but she knew that the time for dallying had passed. She stood up and said to Mike, I have to turn in now. I need to rest. Mike nodded. Before she had walked a few steps away from him, she glanced back. If you have a secret and you need to tell it to somebody, how will you? Let's say it's a really terrible secret, she asked. Mike looked up at her, carefully watching her face. If it's a really terrible secret, I'll make sure that there aren't any guns around, he paused. Rachel rolled her eyes at him. No, seriously. What would you do? She asked. There's no good timing to share a terrible secret. Yet if you believe it has to be done, then you should just spill the beans. I'm sure they'll understand. There isn't anything that love can't forgive or forget. Rachel knew that even before hearing it from Mike. She just needed confirmation, that's all. She bade him good night and went upstairs to the guest room. Mike followed her with his gaze as she left the porch. There's tissue in the drawer, he said. Rachel froze. She turned around, and she was about to say something cutting to him when she saw that his eyes were actually thoughtfully looking at her. There was so much concern in them that she shivered. She nodded at him weakly before turning away. Rachel woke up late the following day. She was sleeping peacefully in the guest room bed with only the sun's rays that entered the room and touched her skin to wake her. It was starting to get hot. Last night, she had been unsure how to tell David, but as the hours drew nearer, she made up her mind, 
firm on the decision to reveal her cancer to him over dinner tonight. She took out her last clean shirt and underwear and walked towards the bathroom. She turned the shower on and adjusted the heat, the warm water relaxed her instantly. Today is our anniversary, and I wasn't able to get him a gift, she realized sadly. And to top it all off, the bad news that she would share with him later gave her a queasy feeling. There was no good way to deliver bad news, Mike was right. She had to come out with it. She needed David more than ever now. She frowned, not liking that last thought, it sounded selfish. She shampooed her hair and lathered her body with the soap. She tried to relax in the bathtub to clear her head. When she felt calm enough, she stood up, rinsed, and reached for the towel to dry herself. On the right side of the bathroom was a full-length mirror. It was only yesterday that she noticed how much thinner she had become. And now, looking at herself naked, it became even more evident that she was losing weight. She got dressed and brushed her hair. When she finished, she went downstairs and saw Mike preparing breakfast. The smell of pancakes and brewed coffee filled the room. Good morning, he said. You slept like a baby. Yes, I like your place. I feel at home after just two days. You should be, what, with my hospitality and all. And such a charming bellboy to boot. Who wouldn't feel at home? Rachel laughed. Mike seemed to be in high spirits this morning. Need a hand? She asked. Sure, the plates are over there. He pointed at the dish rack beside the sink. She took two plates and forks and set them on the table. Then she sat on the chair facing him. Mike was humming a tune that didn't sound familiar to her. Something good came up? She asked. He stopped humming. I thought about it last night, he began. I'm going to propose to Lee. That's great, Rachel gushed. In a short time, he had found his way into her heart and she was genuinely happy for him. Here are your pancakes. Mike put two on her plate and four on his. When he saw Rachel's raised eyebrows over the number of pancakes he had put on his plate, he cocked an eyebrow. What? I'm still a growing boy. Laughing, Rachel reached out for the maple syrup and whipped cream and started eating. Awesome, she said and smiled at him. Mike beamed at her like a child. After breakfast, Rachel gathered her things from the guest room and put them in the trunk of Mike's car. He had insisted on driving her home, but she politely declined. As a concession, they agreed that he would just drop her off at the mall. I hope that your ankle is better now, Mike said. It's almost entirely gone, she said. Rachel's mood dampened as she watched Mike start the engine of his car. She didn't know if it was because they would be separating today, or if it was because she was dreading having to go home and tell David about the bad news. Mike drove slowly out of the garage and onto the main street. They were still moving at a slow pace when he noticed that a cab about a hundred yards away from them was driving towards his house. He squinted to see who the passenger was. Rachel's stomach heaved, realizing that she had not checked her phone. And worse, she couldn't remember where she put it. She began looking for it inside her purse. Where was it? Oh please, I hope I didn't leave it behind at Mike's place. She didn't want to have to ask Mike to take a U-turn to pick up her stuff. She continued checking her purse. Just as I thought, Mike said to himself. He honked and stopped the car. Then he rolled down his window. The cab stopped alongside Mike's car, and the rear window rolled down to reveal its passenger. It was a man in his mid-sixties with hair that was all white. Regardless, traces of his handsome face were still evident. Dad, welcome home, Mike greeted him. I thought you wouldn't be coming back until tomorrow. Well, you know me. I can't sleep well if I'm not in this house. Rachel flinched. The voice sounded familiar, but she didn't bother to look up. She still couldn't find her phone. Darn thing. I'll drive my friend to the mall, and then I'll go back home. I'll catch up with you after, Mike said. Sure, I'll see you later, the old man said. He gestured for the taxi driver to move forward. There it is, under my dirty shirts. Rachel thought. She took the mobile phone and turned to look at the man Mike talked with. It was only for a few seconds. Her eyes met that of Mike's father, and she found herself staring at a man with a receding hairline that gave his hardened features a dignified look. Even in old age, Rachel could see that he was once handsome. Mike's father was smiling when their eyes met. Upon seeing her, 
The smile froze on his lips. The cab started driving away towards Mike's house, but the old man's gaze held hers. Rachel raised her right hand in greeting and smiled. She thought that she must have seen him somewhere before, but couldn't quite place where. She gave him one last glance as Mike rolled the window up. Mike's father was still looking at Rachel, seemingly not wanting to break the connection. Your father seemed to be very dash Rachel thought of the appropriate word to describe him, charming, she finally said. Yes, he is, Mike said, and he's the best dad there is. The drive to the mall was quick, and Rachel's heart twisted, realizing that she would miss Mike as she had already developed a liking towards his good nature. When Mike stopped the car, he switched the hazard lights on. He climbed out of the vehicle and opened the trunk to reach for Rachel's shopping bags. The way they met was eccentric, but the way in which they had spent the two days together felt like any other ordinary afternoon spent between the best of friends. Standing there, looking at each other, they were uncertain of what to do next. They exchanged smiles, and the weird thing was that neither needed to do anything more to make the other feel the affection passing through between their glances. I feel like I've known you all my life. I don't regret the accident, as it brought me to you, he said. He quickly jokes, I hope that I didn't sound like some kind of a maniac saying that. His smile was like a budding flower, light, beautiful, and refreshing. It touched Rachel's heart directly, leaving warmth there, and sending the soft glow up her caramel eyes. Rachel hugged him tightly. Her cheeks pressed against his chest, and the cold metal brushed her cheek. Now I understand why your girlfriend didn't want you to sleep with this necklace on, she said, grinning. Mike laughed and kissed her cheeks. He bit his tongue to refrain from telling her that she reminded him of someone he loved, someone very close to his heart. He dismissed the thought altogether as he pulled her close again. I'll hail you a cab, he said. Before moving away from Mike, Rachel got the urge to touch his shirt's collar, where it lay folded on the wrong side and arranged it for him. Her hand moved upwards before stopping in midair halfway towards Mike. There was an awkward pause and Rachel smiled at Mike. Then her hand touched the fabric of his collar, flattening it. A cab stopped in front of them. Mike opened the car door, then stepped back to let Rachel pass through. So, I guess this is it, Karen. Goodbye, Mike. She hugged him one last time. Her hands tightened around his shoulders as though never wanting to let go. She smelled him and tried to take with her their memories, already nostalgic that she might never see him again. Then she pulled back and looked at him one last time. It was the best accident I've ever been in, she said before closing the door. Mike roared with laughter. It trailed after Rachel even as the cab started rolling away. Mike watched as the cab drove off, staring at it long after it was gone. He felt that he was looking at a significant part of his life, walking away from him. Opening the door on the driver's side, he climbed inside his black sedan. He flipped the sun visor and reached out to take the picture inserted behind it. Frowning, he studied the picture of his father, his mother, and himself. He shook his head, thinking about how the likeness was uncanny. Chapter 12. Rachel immediately recited her address to the driver upon getting inside the cab. She didn't want to waste any more time. They were on the road when she noticed that the man was the same as the one she had talked with two days ago. From the rearview mirror, he looked at her quickly. Hello, Rachel. The cab driver smiled at her. It's about time, he said. She smiled back, brushing off what he just said. Her mind was already lost to the memories of the young doctor and his bikes. She forgot to call David last night, but he wouldn't mind as long as she appeared in their front steps. Besides, she couldn't think about that now. She needed to compose herself, prepare for what will happen when she sees her husband. She checked her phone and saw that she had two missed calls from Dr. Jones. She opened her purse and searched for her journal. It was nowhere to be found. Oh, shit. She wanted to turn around and head back to the mall, catch Mike, drive back to his place and get her journal. It was a bad idea to put it inside the bedside table drawer. She pushed the thought out of her mind. It only held her random musings, she could live with losing the journal. Then she remembered some of the things she listed and felt her cheeks flush, thinking about Mike with his hands on her journal and his curious eyes reading through her entries. 
There was no getting her journal back now. She let out a curse. Oddly, she began to feel as though she was dreaming. She didn't feel tired, but her eyelids grew heavy. She didn't want to sleep, but she lost control over her eyes, her mind, and her body. She swayed a little to the right as the cab turned. Then there was nothing. The cab pulled over, and the sudden loss of motion woke Rachel. She found herself in the back seat of the old man's cab. I must have dozed off, she said. The old man chuckled just as he had two days ago. You snored. I did not. She said defensively, but when she saw the grin splitting the man's face, it dawned on her that he was teasing her. I can hardly believe that it's my stop already. Rachel looked at the apartment and an urge to run down the pathway and pulled David into a tight embrace beckoned at her. Go on, the old man said. It's time to face the music. The old man's smile told her that somehow he understood. Rachel picked up her purse and shopping bags and bade the old man goodbye. She handed him her fare and was out of the car in a few seconds. As she was walking the path, she wondered if she should have asked for the old man's name. At the last minute, she turned and saw that the cab was still parked. The old man was looking at her. Something tugged at her mind. What's your name? She shouted. This man helped her after she first found out her diagnosis, it would be nice to know his name at least. It doesn't matter, the old man answered. We'll meet some other time again. With that, he gave her a smile and drove away. As Rachel watched the cab grow smaller, it dawned on her, the old man addressed her by her first name. She didn't remember ever giving it to him. The apartment she shared with David wasn't too big, and they often felt cramped inside. They liked the place, though. Rachel felt warm all over just knowing that her family was inside waiting for her. But the warmth was instantly replaced by anxiousness. She inhaled deeply. Her hands and feet became cold, and with each step she took, she could almost feel her knees weakening. Uncertain of how the day would end, she turned the doorknob. David stood with his back to her. When he heard the knob turn, he glanced her way. His face broke into a huge smile. On impulse, he started towards her, and upon reaching her, gave her a soft kiss on the lips. Happy anniversary, darling. Miss me? Part 2 Chapter 13 Rachel stood under the doorway, and David couldn't help it, he immediately smiled upon seeing his wife. He had been waiting for their anniversary for the past two days and seeing Rachel just a few paces away from him, he realized how much he missed her. He was holding her in a tight embrace for a few seconds and nuzzling her neck when his mouth fell open at the sight of his wife's tea, her torn jeans, and canvas shoes. Darling, what's with the outfit? Rachel tensed, and then her body softly curved against his again. I wanted to be comfortable on the flight home. She gave him a brief kiss and disengaged herself from his embrace. I'll take a shower and be right back. David nodded and followed her with his gaze. It was weird that she didn't ask where their son was. He asked Susie to take Jeremy out for the day because he's going to be busy giving Ray some last-minute instructions regarding the preparations for the evening. He didn't want to be bothered by fatherly duties as he made certain everything was ready. The good thing was David called Alice, Rachel's mother, to help him with Jeremy, and she said she'd be delighted to go over and spend some time with her grandson. David grinned as he became more certain that tonight would be special. It's probably going to be even better than the other celebrations they had. He smiled to himself as he dialed Ray's number to give instructions on the meal. That remained the only loose preparation on David's list. Whistling, he waited for Ray to answer his call. David was waiting at the bottom of the stairs, calling up to Rachel. Come on, darling. It's time to go. David extended his hand as he gazed at his wife. She looked beautiful in a flowing beige dress, the bodice softly curved against her body, and the cut bared her lean shoulders. Rachel gave him her hand. After a gazillion dates, are you now having cold hands? David raised his eyebrows and grinned. Are you having second thoughts, gorgeous? Now that your face isn't smudged with paint, I like to see how well you'll do on a date, Rachel said. She leaned against his shoulder. Really now? I thought the paints were what you liked. David said. 
In a more serious tone, he added, Ready, Mrs. Smith? Rachel's eyes softened as she took in her husband's words, daring her for what she believed she prepared for. She pressed her lips and nodded slightly. You don't have to look so solemn about it, darling, David teased, and Rachel couldn't help it, she laughed. By the way, did I compliment your dress? David started. Huh? Lovely dress that covers even your toes. We're not attending a gala, darling, he said in a humorous tone. Rachel laughed again and kept on punching David's arm. If not for her sprain, she would have worn her high heels. But tonight, she preferred to conceal her bandage with a pair of chucks. It was better for David not to see her shoes, or she wouldn't hear the end of it. David drove with his left hand on the steering wheel and his right hand, holding Rachel's. He turned sideways to look at Rachel, who was staring straight ahead. She looked tired, and he couldn't blame her, after all, she had been on a business trip, and she only came home today, straight from work. After she took a shower, David joined his wife to pick up Susie and Jeremy at the park. And after that, his wife spent almost the entire afternoon playing with Jeremy, feeding him, and getting him to sleep. Looking at his wife now, he couldn't help but fall in love again. To him, she was still the same woman from 18 years ago. Rachel looked at him with serious eyes, but they crinkled on the edges when she smiled at him. I know I'm breathtaking, baby, but please get your eyes back on the road. David laughed, amused by his wife's cocky attitude. Rachel fell silent after that, but David hardly noticed it because he was preoccupied with the preparations for the evening. He turned the MP3 player, and a song from an old album of a local artist filled the car. A few yards away from the house, David saw someone waiting at them. That someone was Ray. He had insisted on adding some drama to the surprise. David wanted to skip that part, and he had been firm that there was no need for it. As David rolled down the window, Ray said in a rushed, nervous voice, Sir, I'm sorry to bother you, but my wife's in labor. Please help me bring her to the hospital. David pulled at the handbrake and let out a sigh. He wanted to punch Ray for ruining his surprise like this. It's a good thing that Rachel hadn't met him yet. Darling, this will just be a moment, David said to her. David was out of the car immediately, sprinting alongside Ray. Does it really have to be tonight? Rachel yelled after her husband. When he didn't turn back, Rachel groaned in frustration and kicked her right foot. Her yell became louder as pain shot her leg upward. Ouch! Damn this sprain! She kept on muttering. Rachel rolled down the window and looked at the house, which was situated a few yards from where the car was parked. The house's walls were white, and the night sky gave a dark tint to the roof, which made it hard for her to see its true color. It looked maroon to her or another shade of red. A few trees were planted in the front yard, and a white picket fence surrounded the lawn. The first floor of the house had its lights turned on, and light seeped through the windows. Somehow, the place looked familiar. Rachel's mobile phone started to ring. Hello? Darling, we need your help. Please come inside, David said, and before she could respond, he hung up on her. Irritated, she turned the car's engine off and pocketed the keys. David told her that they would be having dinner at a new restaurant in the city and the reservation was for 8 o'clock. She checked her watch, it was almost 8. Regardless, she couldn't be mad at David for lending a hand to a stranger it's just that the timing was off. She picked up her purse and alighted the car in a hurry. She winced as pain shot through her right leg, but she ignored it. When she was in the middle of the pathway, lights flooded the lawn. The trees, picket fences, and practically everywhere she laid her eyes on were strung with dancing lights. Even the roof was lit and seeing it illuminated revealed its true color, red. She surveyed the lawn and turned full circle to take everything in, and when she completed the turn, she saw David walking towards her with a bouquet of lilies in his hands. He was smiling broadly at her. Confused, she raised her eyebrows at David, who reached her in a matter of seconds. Happy anniversary, darling. She froze. What? This is the part where you're supposed to greet me too. It took only a few moments before it sank in. She laughed and leapt into David's arms. He caught her and squeezed her against him. Surprised? he whispered. Ecstatic, she told him breathlessly. She kissed him on the lips. 
You're getting heavy, darling, he teased. You're such a sweet asshole, you know that, right? And yet you love me just the same, he said. Rachel answered by wrapping her legs around him. Her gown slid upwards, revealing her thighs, and to Rachel's horror, her bright red chucks. Her eyes rounded, and David turned to see what it was that Rachel was looking at. What are you wearing? David asked. Rachel pulled David's face with her hands and giggled. I'm sorry. You weren't supposed to see, she said. This explains the gala? He asked. Rachel didn't have to answer. Her smile widened. Then, she stared into his eyes and drowned in the love that reverberated from them. How could she tell him now? She kissed him once more before David put her back to her feet, grabbing her waist as they went inside the house, laughing. White covered all the walls except for the cornices, which were a deep mahogany brown that accented the interior. Rachel looked around, and her gaze fell on the painting. It was David's gift to her on their anniversary three years ago. Rachel was confused when David pulled her closer and affectionately whispered against her ear, Welcome home, darling. Home? She managed to ask. This is our home now. Before he could say anything more, Rachel kissed him passionately. David pulled back, grinning. So, I take it you like the present? Love it, was all Rachel could say in a soft tone. Tears wanted to escape her eyelids, but she controlled them. She couldn't believe that David would do this all for her, and the worst part was that she prepared nothing for him. She felt terribly inadequate. Since the lady is happy with her present, let's have dinner, David said, trying to imitate an English butler, and led her to the dining area. There, she saw the stranger from earlier. He smiled at her and gave David a thumbs up. David grinned and casually waved the man away to leave them alone in the room. This is all like a grand play, Rachel said. How did you manage to? I'll never share my trade secrets. David winked at her. He pulled out a chair and offered her the seat. Tonight, I'll serve you dinner. Rachel giggled when David removed the covers from the dishes on the table. Everything was still in paper bags. Take away food. I was about to ask if you had someone cater for us, knowing what lousy cooks we are, she said. Nah, that's too much. Too little time to prepare. He began unpacking the food. Don't worry about the mess, I asked Susie to join us later so we could sleep until noon tomorrow, he winked. Do you like fast food? He teasingly raised his eyebrows at her. She couldn't help it. This man was just unbelievable. She stood up and helped him set the dining table. In a few minutes, they were already listening to soft music as they ate. They conversed as they always had, exchanged glances as they always did, and held hands in between each spoonful. David was in such a good mood and Rachel couldn't think of a way to break her news. They were enjoying the dinner, talking about Jeremy. Rachel realized that her mind would occasionally drift, knowing that she had to tell David soon, and still dreaded that moment. How would she begin? I think this house is going to be huge for the three of us. Hmm, Rachel said fearful of what her husband may be insinuating. I remember an anniversary from a few years back, he said, and then we had Jeremy. No, Jeremy is still too young to have a sibling, Rachel replied. I'm afraid you'd say that, David said. He moved towards her, and before she could run away from him, he had already gathered her in his arms. They burst out laughing when he caught her, and then there were no more sounds as David kissed her. David broke the kiss and studied her face. Will you dance with me? Really? She asked giggling. Will your surprises never cease? The soft gleam in her eyes told her husband how much she was enjoying the evening. Finally, she added, of course. Always. Before she could wrap her arms around him, David loosened himself from the embrace and took her hand instead, leading her upstairs, which she hadn't seen yet. The first thing that caught her eye was the open area on the second floor. It was a good 30 square yards or so. There were no tables or couches anywhere. Glass fully covered the left side of the wall, and their reflection stared back at them. She turned and met David's gaze. I want this night to be special, David whispered in her ear. The lights went dim as he switched something. Blinking lights started to dance from overhead. Rachel looked up and laughed loudly. Disco light? She said incredulously noticing the glittering ball floating above them for the first time. 
You're the only one I'll ever dance with, David said, and Rachel touched his face tenderly. Of course, it has nothing to do with whether or not I can dance because we both know I can. It's just that I don't want women queuing up and giving you a hard time as you wait for your turn, he teased. This must be why there's such a spacious room up here, so your big head could fit. David smiled widely as he pulled Rachel closer. She rested her head against his shoulder and felt his warm breath against her skin. You're so cheesy. I can't believe I'd end up with someone like you, she whispered. But I'm all you'd rather have, he teased back. And Rachel just stared at him because it was true. He was all she'd rather have. He was all she wanted. Then she let herself drift into the music. It was an old tune, a ballad. She closed her eyes and let herself go back to the memory of the first time she coerced him to dance with her. A Memory from 15 Years Ago David and Rachel had been seeing each other for three years. Their friends started teasing them that they should give each other some space, otherwise, they might end up like some of the couples they knew who broke up immediately after graduation. If not for falling out of love, then for becoming too familiar with each other. David and Rachel ignored what their friends said for the most part, but they did discuss the issue. They agreed that they were too into each other to even think that a time would come that they would fall out of love. The thought was highly improbable. David knew that it was all part of a big joke, his friends teasing him to propose to Rachel on the night of their graduation. It would be the perfect moment, they said. There was a party right after graduation, and David, together with their closest friends, decided to hang out at John's place. John was a star basketball player at their university. His blue eyes, thick brows, and sandy blonde hair defined him as handsome. His three-story house with six garages and a lawn that stretched for hundreds of yards made his place the group's venue for parties. David was with John when Rachel and the other girls arrived carrying with them paper bags containing gifts, dressed ready to party. Carla, Bernadette, Anne, Kelly, Julie, and Rachel brought with them gifts. Upon seeing that the two men had nothing to give them, they complained. But, ladies, John said, the drinks are on the house. David and I will be your servants for tonight. This was received by wild giggles from the girls. That's so unfair, Rachel will have David all to herself while the five of us will have to share you with each other. Julie shouted. This, baby, can handle all of you, John said, earning another set of wild giggles. Beer started pouring, and John's living room immediately became alive with the dancing. David, while drinking his beer, watched them from the sideline. Rachel was dancing with John, moving gracefully, and since she's a fan of modern jazz, her motions came out naturally, making each step easy on the eyes. Her laughter kept David company, and he relished in each swag of her shoulder and in the easy sway of her hips. Kelly and Julie joined them, laughing hysterically at John's stiff yet exaggerated movements. Although John liked playing the field, David knew him to be a loyal chap. He was there when John dated a childhood sweetheart, Marie, exclusively for five years. They had a long-distance relationship, which John thought was going well. One summer, Marie spent every day with John, but when she left, she forgot to call him as though the summer was all they could ever share together. No more letters, phone calls, and text messages came. Later on, John learned that she married some random guy she met in college. John blamed it on the pregnancy. Marie blamed it on destiny. Studying John now, David knew that John had healed, and his friend told him that he was interested in Kelly. Rachel turned and glanced around, searching for David. She spotted him standing beside the bar and gestured for him to come over. David shook his head and took a sip of his beer. Come on! Rachel shouted. All the girls stopped dancing. Even John looked at David. Come on, man. Join us. Everybody's already too drunk to notice that you dance with two left feet. Everyone laughed, including David. Wuss. Julie piped in. Rachel laughed and then sauntered towards him. The others started dancing again. Will you dance with me, kind sir? Rachel asked. Nah, David said as he kept on finishing his beer ignoring Rachel's teasing. Come on, I'll show you how, Rachel insisted. Not me. I can't. My feet will just trip over yours. Not if someone as good as I guide you, Rachel said. Clearly drunk, she still managed to dance around him and make him look silly as he stood there watching her. 
Rachel teased him, swaying her hips, digging into his shoulders and pushing him lightly as she turned to dance around him. The heel of her right shoe slipped and she pulled David down with her to the floor. They were laughing, and no one from the group seemed to have noticed. Instead of standing up and guiding Rachel to her feet, David pulled Rachel against him and spooned her. Rachel laughed louder, but she let him draw her closer. Look at the blinking lights above. They seem like disco lights. I like how they glimmer. David was laughing behind her ear. He adored Rachel even when she was tipsy. Rachel giggled and kept on mumbling, they're like stars. I love the stars. David put his hand inside his right pocket and took out an inexpensive silver ring that he bought in one of the stalls he passed by the other day. Lying down on John's carpet and looking up at the disco lights, Rachel kept talking incoherently. David whispered from behind, Shh, darling. Rachel giggled. There'll never be just one perfect moment to do this as long as this involves you. I love you. I love you when you're your usual self, intelligent, confident, and witty. I love you when I feel the kindness of your heart. When you're like a child, and you tease me, frown at me, and make me chase after you, I love you. And seeing you now, lying here with me, half crazy with alcohol, I still love you. I know this may not count, but under these blinking disco lights, I want to ask you, he paused, and Rachel finally stopped giggling. Will you marry me? Rachel didn't move, and David became worried. Darling? Are you awake? He asked. Rachel struggled to her feet, shaky on her knees that David had to get up fast to support her. Hey, he said concernedly. Rachel looked at him. How dare you not propose to me on one knee? And you weren't even looking me in the eye. She said. Then quickly, she hugged him. Surprised by her outburst, David embraced her hard, dreading what he knew she would insist on. Baby, you have to dance with me, she said. David froze and felt cold wondering if she would ever answer his proposal. I asked you a question, he said. Shut up. Just dance with me, she said. If David could roll his eyes the way Rachel so expertly did, he would have. The best he could give though was a sigh, and so he did. Right now, he knew he had to dance. He grabbed another bottle of beer and downed it almost immediately. Rachel showed him how to make a few steps with his feet. When David still couldn't figure it out, he grabbed another bottle of beer and within seconds, finished it, leaving both of them drunk. David lifted his feet alternately, swaying his hips a little to the right, and then to the left. Babe, it's all right to move your hands too, she teased. He grinned at her and put his hands up in the air. Like this, he asked. She nodded, her eyes barely showing because of the wide grin on her face. You're hopeless, she said. At that moment, he forgot that he couldn't dance and instead teased Rachel with his robot dancing. He grabbed her waist and pulled at her. I'm a lot better in bed, he whispered. She laughed. Ah, she said, patronizing him. What? His eyebrows shot up. You don't believe me? He asked, feigning hurt. It's just that dancing is a good reflection of how one performs in bed. Come on, I can prove it any time, how great I am in bed. At that moment, the music switched into a soft tune, and everybody turned to look at him. Wow, you really had to announce it to the world, John shouted. I think we should take a vote, Kelly teased. Everybody laughed, and David grinned at them like an idiot. He kept on defending himself. Rachel pinched him, and when he wouldn't shut up, she kissed him. Baby, I'm just kidding, she whispered. David danced that night until all their friends had retired to either the sofa or the carpet. They ended with promises. He was looking at her, as though trying to measure if she was still drunk. You're the only one I'll ever dance with, he said. Under the disco lights. Rachel tossed her head back and laughed. And yes, baby, I will marry you, she said. Back to the present. Rachel was looking at the disco lights remembering how David first proposed to her. It still left a smile on her face even though she knew the proposal had been in jest. He proposed to her another time after that when he believed they were both lucid. Looking at him now, she felt that same emotion surging like waves drowning her. Baby, she started, her heart drumming. She had to tell him now, but before she could finish her sentence, David took her mouth in a kiss. It left her breathless, 
and she pushed away whatever she had to tell him into the deepest recesses of her mind. Rachel knew the timing was off. Her thoughts were running wildly through her head, and she wanted to stop kissing David, grab his hand, and tell him her secret and her fears after learning about her cancer. More than anything else, she wanted to be held in his strong arms, to feel the security and love that he had for her as she told him everything. But she wondered if she had the heart to speak about cancer tonight. She pushed him lightly and pulled back away from him, but her husband only thought that she was teasing him. He held her more firmly than before, engaging her in deeper kisses. She didn't have much time to be bothered by her thoughts any longer because as soon as she felt David's lips against the back of her ear, she forgot all about cancer and told herself that for this moment, she would only think about her husband and how intoxicating he was making her feel. She touched his firm chest and kissed it. David's gaze was penetrating, and when she finished undressing him, he took over. He unzipped her dress and pulled it down, sending it pulling around her feet. When she was naked, he gently cupped her breasts and playfully bit them. Then he pulled her closer and kissed her once more, this time just a little below her chin. The surrounding was bleak as though it was covered with fog and Rachel sensed that she must be dreaming. David was standing on a hill with two bikes beside him. He was smiling at her, calling her name and asking her to go biking with him. She smiled back and ran towards him, excited to get to where he was. As she ran, her right ankle twisted under the uneven road and she fell. David shouted her name and ran towards her, but she couldn't look up at him because her right ankle was throbbing, and she couldn't take her mind off it. She tried standing up but failed. When finally she gazed up, David was gone and instead, she found herself looking at Mike. I'm a doctor, he said. Then he carried her. She hugged Mike close and cried. From afar, she heard David's voice. She opened her eyes and saw him blurred in the distance, fogged by her tears, running after her. She reached out to him until finally, her hand was touching David's. Mike disappeared and she and David were back together on that first day that they went out on a date when she first told him she loved him. She was wearing a sundress and he was smiling at her. Then the smile turned into laughter as she told him about her silly theory. She felt offended, and she asked him to stop laughing, but he wouldn't. She asked him to stop a second time, but the sound of his laughter only grew louder until the laughter had turned into sobbing. She didn't know why, but when she reached out to wipe his tears away, her chest hurt. It burned like fire, and Rachel was no longer sure if it was because she rode the bike for 20 miles, or if it was because it was the first time she saw David cry. David was clutching her, it became tighter that Rachel couldn't breathe. She twisted, trying to pry his arms loosely around her. But she couldn't escape him because his arms were latched onto her like metal chains. Upon thinking of metal, she remembered the rusty taste that came with the food she ate. She gagged repeatedly, remembering how badly the meal tasted like metal. Then she gulped air, trying to breathe in. She felt herself falling headfirst into oblivion as though she was in a vacuum. She screamed a voiceless cry where words didn't escape her mouth, but she knew she had been heard. She kept on falling until she could no longer breathe. And then. Rachel woke up, finding it difficult to breathe. It was only a dream, but her chest hurt. She was experiencing shortness of breath, and she couldn't tell if it was because of David's arms that were pinning her. She tried to sit up in bed, all the while carefully untangling David's arms from around her. She slipped away so silently like the fading of the night in a starless sky. When she was already sitting, the blanket slipped off her body and she found herself naked under the sheets. She coughed, and her lungs burned. She kept the sound of her coughing low, but it persisted. She put on her robes and stood up quickly, moving away from David. Coughing with each step she took, she drew in more air making her lightheaded. She ignored the woozy feeling and kept walking away from her husband. Before she could get out of the bedroom door, though, David was awake. Rachel was coughing doubly hard now, uncontrollably. Her vision was spinning, her chest tightening and burning. Darling, what's wrong? David asked, his voice hoarse from sleep. Rachel turned the doorknob and didn't answer him, she was gasping for breath and could feel the weight on her chest. She managed to turn the doorknob weakly before the room became dark as she fell, blonde curls scattered like golden yarn on the floor. Jesus Christ! David yelled. He scrambled out of bed in a rush but still reached Rachel too late. She lay unconscious. He woke her, but his attempts were in vain. Rachel. 
darling? When she didn't respond, he quickly checked her pulse and breathing, then, he put on his shirt and slacks, picked her up from the floor, and dashed to the car. He shouted Susie's name on the way down, thankful that he had asked her to stay over last night. He called out, asking Susie to pack some clothes for Rachel. After a few minutes, David and Rachel were on the road, leaving a baffled Susie staring worriedly after them. Chapter 14 David found himself driving without his seatbelt on and careening left and right to overtake cars to get to the hospital as fast as he could. The loud screeching of the wheels against the road broke the silence of the dawn. They left black streaks on the pavement. From inside the car, he muttered curses and kept on looking at the passenger seat where Rachel was safely buckled. He sped through a red light and was thankful that there were no officers around. He knew he'd still get a ticket, though. It didn't matter. He almost bumped his head when he took the curb onto the driveway of the emergency room and hit the brakes hard. Nurses came rushing towards him, and he watched helplessly as Rachel was wheeled away, leaving him alone in the emergency room. When his senses returned, David ran after the nurses and was brushed off and told to wait outside. In just a few minutes, his ordeal was over. The doctor came and told him that Rachel's awake and that there was no reason to panic. David breathed out in relief still shocked about what happened in the last 30 minutes, but thankful just the same. Rachel was lying in bed with her eyes closed while David talked to the doctor with a goatee. Her vitals are okay. I don't see any reason for you to lose sleep over this. She'll be okay. She just needs to rest, Dr. Walker said. David waited for the doctor to finish telling him his observations. Will she be monitored? Of course, the nurse will be doing the rounds, and I'll check on her again tomorrow. David nodded. We're going to run some tests, and we'll let you know the results immediately. Thank you. David shook the doctor's hand and watched as he left the room. As soon as the door closed, David went beside Rachel's bed, pulled a chair close to her, sat down, and dropped a soft kiss on his wife's forehead. He was brushing blonde locks away from her face when a tear slid down the left eye. Nothing to worry about, darling. You'll be out and about tomorrow morning, David said. Rachel bolted up from the bed, almost bumping her forehead against David's head. Who's with Jeremy? Susie's with us. Who's with our baby? She asked frantically. Why don't you lie back down? David asked softly. I called your mom. She's been at the apartment since yesterday. Rachel breathed a sigh of relief and lay back down. She shut her eyes only to open them again. Her forehead creased in worry. She looked at him with tear-streaked eyes. David frowned but tried to soothe her. Hey, don't worry. The doctor said your vital signs are okay. It's just a procedure to run some other tests. You're going to get wrinkles early if you don't stop crying, David teased, but despite that, his wife still cried. David, I'm scared. Don't be silly. There's nothing to it. Although I have to admit that you gave me quite a scare back there. He kept on running his fingers over the blonde blocks. Rachel's tears wouldn't stop falling. David felt her body quiver as though afraid, and he instinctively moved out of the chair and squeezed himself in the bed next to her. He nudged closer and pressed his body against hers. He scooped up her head and placed it on his shoulder, then pulled her head against his cheek. Every movement of his was a response to protect her, it had become second nature to him. She cried louder, breaking into sobs. He stopped brushing her hair and looked at her. Hey, it's going to be all right, David said. His wife was acting weirdly, and there was something she said earlier that didn't feel right. He thought about it and finally realized that she had called him David. She never did. It was always baby or moron. Or baby moron, depending on her mood. Rachel choked on her tears. No, I have cancer. Come on, you've got to stop this nonsense, he said patiently. No, it's true, she said. David froze. He chuckled to try to make the situation lighter, though, given the circumstances, a harrowing emotion grew inside his chest, an emptiness that grew bigger as his wife continued to cry. Uneasiness crept inside his heart. If you want, I'll call Dr. Walker and let him speak to you directly. That way, you'll know that there's no reason for all this fuss. Rachel's tears kept rolling down. 
Dr. Jones, she said. What? Look for Dr. Alex Jones, Rachel repeated. He's my oncologist. She swallowed hard. It was painful for her to have to watch his face, watch him digest everything. What are you saying? Baby, I'm so sorry. I should have told you sooner. I should have told you about. What are you saying? David's voice grew louder, and it echoed in Rachel's ears. She reached out to touch David's face and cupped it in both her hands. David, I'm so sorry. I'm so very sorry. What's his name? He asked. What is the goddamn doctor's name? Dr. Alex Jones. With that, David inched his body away, removing his arm from under her head. He sat on the edge of the bed for a brief moment, his hands pressed against the gap between his brows. Then he stood up and stormed out. David's silhouette faded through the glass door panels of the hospital room, leaving Rachel to the coldness of the reality that she would be about to face. All she wanted was for her husband to stay beside her and hold her. And now he's gone to chase the monster she brought upon the table. David wandered the hospital halls, uncertain of what he should do. He kept on walking because he needed to get away from Rachel. Dr. Alex Jones. Who the hell was he? Where could he be? Why in the world would Rachel give him this shocking news today? How long had she known? The questions were driving him crazy. He needed to find the damn doctor. Fast. His strides were long and swift, as though he was running after someone. When he reached the nurse's station, he inquired if Dr. Alex Jones was on duty that day. To his dismay, he was not. Where can I contact him? I'm sorry, but we don't give personal information about our attending physicians. If you have a message, we can page him. The nurse dismissed him, but David wouldn't leave. Either you will give me his address, or I will climb over your station and take the information from you. David didn't notice that Dr. Walker had seen the commotion he started. The doctor approached him. What's the trouble here, Mr. Smith? David turned and saw Dr. Walker. I, I need to contact Dr. Alex Jones. Dr. Walker studied him, frowning. After a while, he said, walk with me. I thought Rachel looked familiar. Perhaps when she came in for one of her appointments with Alex, I saw her. I'm not going to ask you what your business is with him. Dr. Walker stopped and, using his phone, dialed. I really shouldn't be doing this. Dr. Walker waited a few seconds before speaking on the phone. He had his back to David. The doctor nodded slightly. Then he ended the call and turned to David. He took out a card, wrote something on the back, and gave it to David. This is Alex's address. David read the legible handwriting on the back of the business card. A one-hour drive tops if there was traffic, but he was not expecting any at this hour so he could be talking to the oncologist in as little as 30 minutes. There was a part of him that secretly wished the doctor's place was farther. I don't know what to say. Thank you is traditional. Thanks. Dr. Walker looked at him concernedly. Go. And get some rest after. We'll take care of your wife, he said before walking away. David looked at the back of the card again, and his shaking fingers ran over the script as though searching for truth in those written words. What if it's true? Can I handle it? There was only one way to find out. He had to talk to this Dr. Alex Jones. It's almost five in the morning. Will the doctor even see him at this time of day? He didn't want to lose control over his emotions again. His thoughts were scattered and he couldn't compose what he would say for an introduction. Suddenly, he felt the weariness that lack of sleep over the preparations in the past weeks caught up with him. He stopped in the lobby, trying to drive the panic and fear that's starting to consume him. The green leather couch in the hospital lobby looked comfortable, inviting him to seek solace on it. He collapsed on it, and he worked on his fingers, which had begun to feel numb with tension. After that, he lightly massaged his shoulders as they had gone tense too. He leaned back against the couch and stretched his legs, closing his eyes and rubbing his knuckles against his temples in an effort to clear his head. When the fear wouldn't go away, he balled his fists and started thumping them against his eyes, hoping that the pain would clear his head. There was no peace during that moment. David wanted to run straight to Dr. Jones, but he dreaded what he might hear. He also wanted to go back to Rachel, take her in his arms, and tell her everything would be all right. 
He opened his eyes, worrying about how he was reacting and how his reaction was affecting his wife. Shaking his head, he found it ironic that even though he was angry and frustrated, he was more concerned about how Rachel would feel. Tears started to form in the corners of his eyes, but he blinked them back. There was no sense crying over something that he wasn't sure of. He prayed that this was all a big joke. That Rachel, with her claims of not being able to crack a joke, finally decided to play a practical joke on him at such an inopportune time. But Rachel's tears had been so real. The oncologist was real. The address was real. He had no details except that his wife had cancer. The way Rachel brought it up left him with no room for more questions. What stage? What type of cancer? He should have asked her instead of storming out, but he knew why he hadn't. Had he done so, it would be more difficult to pretend that none of this was true. But what if it wasn't really true? Call Dr. Jones. David realized he didn't have the doctor's mobile number. It was just the address. Go visit him now. Now. It's too early. He could still be asleep. He would understand. I have to know. This is my wife. Rachel is my life. I can't. I have to know all about it. I have to see Dr. Jones now. I need to talk to him. David gave a loud sound that was very akin to choking, then he broke into sobs. The hospital lobby was quiet at the time, and the faint scent of alcohol and sterilized air lingered in the lobby. There were a few nurses wandering about, and sometimes they passed in front of him, holding their charts, doing the usual rounds. Nobody bothered him as though a grown man hunched over and crying in the hospital lobby was a regular thing, something that was not unusual in a place where people lay suffering. And then it was just David alone in the hospital lobby, slouched against the couch. He continued to sob, fearing for the words that he would hear as the day promised to unfold into a thousand omitted truths. A headache that was starting to build up woke Rachel. She didn't sleep well last night, and her head was making her pay. She stood up to walk to the bathroom. She waited a moment to be certain that her feet weren't numb and made sure she wouldn't have difficulty walking. When everything seemed fine, she proceeded to the bathroom unaided. After that, she climbed back into bed. She glanced around for any sign that David returned to visit her after he left earlier, wondering where he could be at this moment. Rachel buzzed the nurse and requested that breakfast be served to her already. She wanted to eat and be as healthy as she can possibly be. Ironic as it might seem, but Rachel knew that the first weeks after everything sank in, David would need her more than she would have a need for him. After the test results came back, she would prepare to go home, wait for David, and together, they would figure out how to make things right between them. Rachel dialed her mother's mobile number. The phone rang, but no one picked up. Just when Rachel was about to hang up, her mother answered. Hello, dear, Alice said. Mom, Rachel said. She wanted to tell her mother about cancer. We have to talk. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Mom, are you there? Yes. I said we have to talk. There was another pause. Oh, no. Don't tell me you didn't like the house. Rachel smiled in spite of everything that happened and shook her head although she knew her mother couldn't see it. It's not that. Let's just talk when I get home. Dr. Alex Jones woke up early. He toasted bread and fried two eggs. At the same time, he switched on the coffee maker and brewed his coffee. When he was finished, he set the food on a tray and took it outside to have breakfast by the pool. He wanted to relax. He was still upset about losing a patient last week, even though he knew it wasn't his fault. As a matter of fact, he was able to help extend his patient's life by another three months. Still, he could not cure him. He hated cancer after losing both parents to it, and his hatred was the driving reason he became an oncologist. He wanted to be the thorn in cancer's neck if ever that was possible. It was odd that Dr. Walker called him earlier. When there's an emergency, it's usually a nurse or one of the administrative staff who calls. It was even weirder that all Dr. Walker wanted to know was if Alex had a patient named Rachel Smith. In fact, Alex did, and Rachel's been on his mind for the past week. Alex wasn't able to prod Dr. Walker's reason as Alex was still groggy from sleep, and Dr. Walker ended the call too swiftly. The day seemed quiet, and he was enjoying his freshly brewed coffee when the doorbell rang. Curious, Alex checked his pockets and realized he forgot his mobile phone inside his room. 
As a doctor, it was almost a sin not to carry his cell phone anywhere he went. Instead of answering the door, he went to his room and checked his mobile to see if there had been an emergency call placed for him. There were no missed calls, no messages. He checked his pager. There were no messages there either. The doorbell rang again, and he reached the gate on the fourth ring. Standing in front of him was an unfamiliar tall man with dark hair and blue-gray eyes. His clothes looked slept in. Alex couldn't place the man facing him. Yes? The man moved closer to the gate. Dr. Jones? Yes? I'm David. David Smith. Rachel's husband. David was watching the doctor's expression. It's as though he was praying that the doctor wouldn't recognize the name. It took a moment for the name to sink in Alex's head, and he was able to put two and two together. Oh. Come in. David felt lightheaded. He could hardly believe he was being invited inside. Either this man was very accommodating, or, he didn't like to think about the alternative. His hopes of Dr. Jones not being real and of the cancer being a bad joke vanished. The soles of his leather shoes dragged as he followed the doctor inside. Come join me in the kitchen. Let me get you some coffee, and then we'll talk. He tailed the doctor to his kitchen, where Dr. Jones handed him a coffee mug and then invited David outside. Call me Alex, there's no reason to be so formal in my house, Alex said when they reached the poolside. David took a seat. His eyes kept on leaping from the doctor to the pool, to the still dark sky, and then back again to the doctor. Alex watched as David's throat moved, the bump moving as though there was a lump. His eyes were liquid. Is there anything you want to ask me? Alex broke the silence. David looked at Alex, his blue-gray eyes penetrating and alert as though measuring what the doctor would say. The fact that you invited me in without question has confirmed what I was going to ask, David said. It's difficult. David met his gaze. Is it true, then? Alex nodded curtly. The scenario was familiar and yet bizarre. David held his head in his hands as though in prayer. His shoulders tensed. Only the sound of the water falling from a wall decorating the end of the pool could be heard. Is there anything I can do? Alex offered. David looked up at him, his eyes in two angry slits. You're a doctor, right? You're her oncologist. Why don't you tell me what you can do for her? He snapped. This may be a bit of a surprise to you. Surprise? Bullshit. You're calling it a surprise as if it's a good thing, he yelled and stood up. Alex drew in his breath and stood up too, watching David carefully. I'm really sorry. Alex started. I don't know what your wife has told you already. David shook his head in grief. My wife never told me anything. Then he gazed at the doctor. Why didn't you? You know it's not for me to discuss. To hell with that, David said, moving towards the doctor. It's very convenient for you to say, right? It's not for you to discuss. What are you, some professor in college who can't discuss the exam results? Or are you just looking for an excuse because I can sue you, you know? Alex moved, backing away from David, who looked to be beyond consoling. My wife is there in the hospital, alone, at this very moment, and she could be dying. And here I am. Shit. Just calm down, okay? Alex said. Easy for you to say, huh? David spat, stepping a few paces towards Alex. Before Alex could control himself, he did what he knew he had to do to calm his visitor. In one quick movement, he shoved David. Alex watched as his visitor lost his balance, flailed his arms up in the air, and ended in the pool with a splash. Alex crouched at the edge of the pool and watched as the water's ripple grew softer. After a few seconds, David's head bobbed up. Ringlets of curly black hair covered his forehead as he gulped air. Alex looked into his eyes and asked, Better? David shot one annoyed look at him and then waded through the water, hoisted himself up from the pool and collapsed on one of the chairs. The steam from his coffee mug seemed to be inviting him for some warmth. You may drink the coffee, you know, Alex said after a few seconds. David jerked as though he wasn't expecting anyone to speak. He looked up at the doctor before taking the mug, wrapping his hands on the warm mug. Alex put a towel on his back. Wouldn't want to catch pneumonia now, would you? He said. David stared at his trembling hands. Then finally, he drank. As if the hot coffee had brought him back to his senses, 
He quickly darted a look at the man who was sitting in front of him. Oh, shit, David said. Dr. Alex? I'm really sorry about all this. It's just so, he paused, not really knowing what to say next, surreal. I pushed you down the pool, we're even. David's cheeks grew redder. I'm such an asshole. This is so humiliating, David stood up in such a rush that the table shook. Please sit back down, Alex said. Now that you've calmed down, we can talk. David looked at the doctor, trying to read through his kindly eyes. After a few seconds, he flopped on the chair. I want to know the details, David murmured before adding, please. Alex sipped his coffee. This was another one of those moments that he dreaded. As a doctor, he knew that breaking bad news was part of his profession, but he had not gotten used to it. He didn't think he ever would. He took a deep breath before he started speaking. About a month ago, I met your wife. She came to me because she was referred by her primary physician to have some specialized tests taken, tests to detect cancer. I read the results of her prior tests and consultations. From there, I learned that she had complaints about shortness of breath and a cough that had lasted more than five months. Later on, she told me that she shrugged it off because she's a smoker and thought it was because of that. A month? One whole month and he only knew now, David thought. What kind of husband was he to not realize that his wife was sick? Of course, he noticed that she had been coughing, but just as Rachel dismissed the thought, so did he. They were smokers, but he quit several years ago. His wife, on the other hand, wasn't successful in quitting, particularly since she used smoking to relieve stress. There was a series of tests, and when I read the results, it was confirmed that she has cancer. I told her she should consult with other physicians and other specialists. She should get a second opinion, Alex continued. In my mind, I knew I was right with my findings, but I prayed that I was wrong. She came in again after a few days and showed me the results of her consultations with other oncologists. We had the same findings? I didn't see her again until four days ago. At that time, I told her that we should start with treatments, but I haven't heard from her since. For the past two days, I've been trying to reach her, but I haven't talked to her yet. How bad is it? Alex blinked at David, astonished. His wife still hadn't told him everything. Stage 4 Oh God, he said. And? Chance of survival is low, but Rachel could be the one out of ten. As far as life expectancy, the average is eight months. But that information is based on a study conducted a few years ago, and it could be better now. It all depends on how her body reacts to the treatment. I can't really say at this point. All I have for reference are the results of her exams. I need to compare that with how her body will respond to the treatment, but she hasn't started it yet. David put down his coffee mug shakily. Oh God! Is there anything I can do? His shoulders slumped, and his hands trembled on top of the table. Alex's words came out as though they were being delivered from a previously prepared speech, and he said them so much that it wasn't any surprise that everything sounded mechanical to his ears. Be there for her. Help her during the treatment because it's going to be painful. Don't let her pity herself. If you can avoid stressing her out, that will be good. Cancer often seems to progress faster when the patients start feeling as though they've lost the battle, and they stop fighting. Don't ever let that happen. David stared at Alex with wide eyes, his lips had gone pale. Stubbles covered David's chin, and he looked as if he aged in the minutes they were together. I don't know what to do. She's my wife. You have to accept this, the sooner you do, the sooner you can decide about the treatment plan. We have to start with her medication as soon as possible. Time is our enemy. David nodded nervously. Please help me. Alex patted David on the shoulder and forced a weak smile. That's what years in medical school readied me for. David listened to Alex, but he wasn't sure if he understood the words at all, they didn't make sense, and his brain didn't register anything. One thing's for sure, though, he would help Rachel fight cancer. They would be in this together. He shivered and almost vomited from fear, already afraid of losing her. Chapter 15 Staying in the hospital and waiting for David to come back was an option Rachel considered, but in the end, she decided to go home. So after she confirmed her insurance information and settled the bill, she checked out of the hospital and hailed a cab to go home. 
She called David to let him know that she had left and was on her way back to the apartment. When he didn't answer, she left him a voicemail. She wasn't surprised when she got home and found her mother, Alice, babysitting Jeremy. At the sight of both of them, her heart ached. Despite her age, Alice carried herself with grace and class, making younger women around her feel self-conscious. She boasted a tall, slender frame. Her eyes were a deep-set caramel brown like Rachel's. As Rachel studied her mother's face, she felt a lift in her heart, a gentle tugging, and a surge of something warm. She would be very lucky to age as gracefully as her mother, if that was still possible. Alice was wearing a plain, light green, tailored blouse over black slacks. Some signs of aging were the few fine lines around her jawline. Rachel wondered how many more lines would be added when she told her mother the news. Mom, she said. Oh, hi dear. Jeremy's already a handful. I'll remember that next time David calls me and asks me to babysit my grandson, Alice said as she made herself comfortable on the couch. Rachel sat beside her. Mom. Oh, yes, I remember. What was it you wanted to talk to me about? You didn't like the house? I saw it in a picture David sent me, and I thought it's quite lovely. Rachel swallowed, uncertain about how much to tell her mother. No, it's not the house. I love the house, Rachel said. But? Alice looked at her. What? There are always buts. Rachel paused, considering. She blinked and looked away. Nothing. I like the house. Alice didn't notice her hesitation, and instead nodded and continued talking in her usual buoyant attitude. It'll be such a nice place for Jeremy to grow up in. Definitely far better than being cooped up here in this apartment. I never liked places without lawns, sorry, dear, it's just that not having a lawn takes away the warm appeal of a home. Her voice droned on. Rachel's eyes were fixed on Jeremy, who was busily playing with a toy truck. Mom. Alice gaped at Rachel. What? I'm sick, Mom. I've been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and I don't know how long I still have. Rachel listened to the sound of her voice. It didn't falter. It was also devoid of emotion. Thinking about it so much had perhaps prepared her for this. What? Alice's mouth opened. I'm sorry, dear, but your mother's already old. My ears may be failing me. I've known for almost a month now, but I didn't want to tell anyone yet. I didn't think I was ready. Oh my God, she said and covered her mouth. Please say you're kidding. Rachel's eyes moistened. Please, I don't want to talk about it in more detail. But dear. Please, Mom, Rachel cut in, her hand squeezing the couch's armrest tightly. She shook her head in despair. I can't talk about it yet. Are you sure? Did you get a second opinion? Mom, please. But we have to talk about it now. I'll call your father, he'll know what to do. He has a friend that was a cancer survivor, and I'm sure he can. Survivors get through cancer because what they had was probably just stage 2. I'm at stage 4. No, his friend was stage 4 and yet. Oh, just shut up, Mom. Rachel snapped and stood up. She started pacing around the living room and covered her ears even though Alice had already stopped talking. Jeremy cried as though sensing the tension in the room. Susie, please take Jeremy, Alice shouted. The old woman hustled in and looked at them, scooped Jeremy up, and withdrew from the room quickly. Her cooing voice softened as she left, and Jeremy's crying stopped. Dear, we have to talk about this. Please sit down beside me, Alice said, regretting the panicky tone that she used earlier. When Rachel still didn't move, Alice walked over to her and took her hand. She pushed her daughter to sit down. I don't know what to do, Rachel said, averting her gaze away from her mother's eyes. We'll take you to a specialist, we'll have you tested some more. More than one doctor has looked into my case, and they told me the same thing. Well, they could all be wrong. It's not unheard of that a doctor committed a mistake in the diagnosis, she paused, not knowing what to say. It's not, it's never, it's not true. The last word stung. Rachel saw her mother's tears. Oh mom, the words escaped her mouth in a rush, and she threw herself at the woman that had always nursed her through each sickness that she had. She wanted to seek comfort from her mother, only this time, she knew that the only comfort she could get was the assurance that her mother would care for her husband and son when she was gone. I'm sorry mom. 
I'm really sorry I have to hurt you this way. Tell daddy I'm sorry too. Alice gave no response to that because she knew that it would break her husband's heart. Rachel was their only child. The tight embrace and the slight shaking of both their shoulders said it all. David wasn't looking forward to the drive home because he dreaded the discussion he was about to have with his wife. When he reached the hospital at around 10 in the morning, he learned that Rachel had checked out. He wanted to yell at the attending nurses and administrative staff for letting her go alone, but he knew it wasn't their fault. When Rachel wanted to wiggle her way out of a situation, she could do so easily. It's her eyes that make her difficult to say no to. He should have thought of that before leaving her alone in the hospital. David tightened his hold on the steering wheel, tensing each time he turned, releasing the gas pedal more than once unknowingly until a car from his rear would honk and overtake him. Another horn sounded, and David jerked as he quickly glanced at the rearview mirror. He stepped harder on the gas pedal and released it again, afraid to reach home so soon. Dr. Alex Jones told him that he should act as normally as possible. Rachel shouldn't feel that she's being treated in a special manner, otherwise, she might be prone to depression and self-pity. Everything should be as it was. David didn't know if he could live up to that. He parked the car in the garage and dallied as he turned the stereo and the air conditioner off. He twisted the car key a bit further until the revving of the engine died down. To buy more time, he adjusted the driver's seat and reclined it. Then, he leaned back and counted to 20 before he took the car keys, opened the door, and stepped out. Perhaps it's better if he didn't overthink things. Everything became more difficult and complex when he thought too much. David closed the car door and breathed deeply before walking towards the apartment. His heart started drumming, and his right arm twitched in nervousness. He put his hand on the doorknob, and its coldness seeped through his palms, traveling through his body. It stopped when it reached his heart. It lingered there. He waited for the coldness to pass, but when it didn't, he twisted the knob, pushed the door, and walked inside. Six hours. Has it really been that long since David walked out of the hospital? Rachel was beginning to worry. Where could he be? The most logical thing for him to do was to talk to her doctor. She gave him the name, but was he able to find Dr. Jones? She wanted to call him but decided that it would be better for both their sakes to discuss everything in person. She should see his reaction, each agonizing twitch in his eyelids, the disappointed eyes, the low voice, the evidence of turmoil that she caused that's her punishment for keeping the secret. And this time, she had a man up to face her husband. Alice went upstairs to put Jeremy to bed, and after that told her that she would help start packing to prepare for the move from the apartment to their new house. She was supposed to stay with them for a week, but after their talk, Alice said that she would remain indefinitely until the details of Rachel's treatment had been laid down, and she saw that everything was going as scheduled. Rachel listened to her mother without argument. She knew better than to dispute her on this. Had she done so, they'd be arguing until now. She broke the news to her mom and was thankful that it was over. As much as possible, she didn't want any day to pass by wasted on being sad and with everyone around her getting depressed. Instead, she wanted to ensure that each day would go by as though there was no news of this sickness, and the visits to the doctor were part of her daily routine, and there was nothing extraordinary about it at all. She had not dwelled on anything so negative in the past, and she vowed to herself that she definitely would not start now. Coming out about her cancer was, if anything, uplifting. She remembered the cab driver. He was right. It was time to face it. Now that her mother and David knew, her heart felt much lighter, and she was somehow comforted. Rachel wrapped her arms around herself as she looked out the window of their apartment, finding it odd that out there, nobody else was affected by her getting sick. Being so insignificant, her loss would probably not matter to anyone at all, and if that's the case, why should she be so sad with the idea of dying? She bit her lower lip as she tried to control having to cry again. A long vexing sound followed as she breathed heavily. There is still some time. And perhaps God will be so good as to give me a miracle. One day, I might wake up healthy again, and the people around me would smile and tell me I'd been sleeping and was only having a nightmare. Rachel didn't want to admit it to herself, but she knew that delaying the medication left her feeling that this wasn't real. Not facing the truth about her condition allowed her to enjoy her days and almost forget about the future. If she didn't go for treatment, she really couldn't be sick, could she? 
David's car pulled into the driveway. Rachel didn't realize that she'd been biting her lower lip much too hard until she tasted the tanginess of blood. The car's engine stopped, and her heart drummed faster. In the seconds that followed, nothing registered to her except for the sound of the car door opening and shutting, the slow footsteps against the pathway, and the silence that followed that was disturbed only by her heartbeat. It would only be a few seconds now before she knew how all this would turn out. Act naturally, act normally, no more hiding. The chanting continued in her head in a desperate plea for retribution over her omission. Rachel locked eyes with her husband, searching for the emotions that she knew were hiding behind his tired eyes. David was still holding the doorknob in his right hand as though pushing the door shut would require a significant effort. His shoulders were stiff, and his eyes were haunted that he felt like a soldier who came home straight from a battlefield, saw a death unveil in front of him, but still tried hard to ostentatiously cast courage about to hide whatever hurt was inside. Hi, darling, miss me? He asked when he was a few feet away from her. Rachel noted that while the words were the same, the manner in which they were delivered was different. She clutched herself tighter, her lower lip and chin quivering. She opened her mouth slightly to say she did but clamped it closed again for fear that her voice would betray her. In slow movements, she walked over to him, met his gaze, and when he still didn't do anything, she tiptoed to kiss him lightly on the lips. From upstairs, the sound of wood against wood was heard from movements to gather things into boxes, a preparation before moving out to bottle up everything in the household into memories. It was David who broke the silence. Are you okay? The words seemed to be forced out of his mouth. They were said so softly and so devoid of emotion that Rachel couldn't be certain of what David was feeling. Yes. She immediately regretted having spoken because her voice gave away her emotions. She didn't know she was so shaken inside. You should be resting, he said. You shouldn't be moving around like this. Get in bed. No, I'm feeling better. I don't know what to say, David said. Rachel gazed at her husband's face and wondered how he aged so much so soon. I'm going to call Dr. Jones and set up an appointment with him. It was an effort to continue speaking, but this was the moment for her to lay down everything that she had been keeping from him. I? When will you include me in this? It was said softly, but there was a stress to David's every word. Rachel jerked when she heard the snap in the tone of his voice as though a whip hit her. She sensed her mistake, so she whispered, I'm sorry. David collapsed on the couch. I'm sorry too. What else do we need to do? He asked. I don't know what the next steps are. I'll see if I can get an appointment tomorrow. Then, I'll know from there. God damn it, Rachel. Will you include me in this? Rachel flinched. She remembered when she was still a child and she lost her father's phone. She didn't intend to, but it was the first time she ever held a mobile phone, and she was amazed by it so much that she carried it with her during weekends, begging her father to allow her to. Then while counting her money to buy the latest copy of Seventeen, she put the phone down on the shop's counter. When she reached home, she realized that she had left the phone. That was the only time her father had heard her using his leather belt to whip her bottom. Not even the soothing words of her mother relieved her of the tenderness she felt on her behind. Later on, her father held her and told her it wouldn't happen again, and that the only reason he lifted a hand was that the news came at such bad timing. It was the only physical pain she ever felt. And right now, hearing David's words, the memories came back because she had no recollection of anything so painful to compare his words against. I'm sorry. Yes, we'll go together to Dr. Jones. She didn't understand why she was having so much difficulty talking about this with David. Are you hungry? Would you like to eat? Mom prepared breakfast earlier, and there's still some left. When David didn't answer, Rachel turned to get food from the kitchen for her husband. David quickly stood up and grabbed her arm. You had no right, he scolded her. His grip tightened on her arm, and she stiffened. She couldn't speak. All she could do was look into his burning eyes. She had been in the wrong, keeping this from him. You had no right to do this to me. How dare you take away one month's worth of working through this? I'm your husband, for God's sake. David's face turned red. And now I feel guilty shouting at you. I'm sorry, babe, she said through a ragged breath. She wasn't accustomed to seeing her husband so angry. You're sorry? 
Over what? You kept this from me, and now you're sorry? I'm sorry you had to find out this way. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you immediately. I thought that if I didn't believe in it, that if I didn't tell anyone else, one day I'd wake up and learn that none of this is real, Rachel blurted out. She shook herself against David's grip and succeeded. I thought that by keeping this to myself, I was sparing you pain. That the less I believed it, the less it became true. I knew it was stupid, but I didn't want to face it because I didn't want to stop living for you. For Jeremy. I didn't want to have this conversation with you even now, because I knew how this would end. We would only realize that we were utterly helpless in this situation. And from there, how would we move on? What would be our next step? Rachel thought that talking to her mother had prepared her for what was coming when her husband came home, but she was wrong. I know it's wrong to say I feel cheated, but that's exactly how I feel right now. You took from me time that I could have spent supporting you and telling you that it will all be okay. And if it doesn't get better, I'll be here for you. If that's not my role in your life, then what good is it that I'm your husband? It's not taking away time from you. Don't you see it? I gave you more time to be happy. Without worries. That's bullshit and you know it. You wouldn't understand any of it. What? How could you say that? David was looking at her intensely, and Rachel could see that he was past being calm. He pointed a finger to her, thrusting, admonishing her. Each thrust felt like a hammer against her chest. You think it's easier having to hear it from your oncologist? He was looking at me with pity in his eyes because I didn't know. I wanted to claw his eyes out. I don't want you to hurt. You're out of your mind. No, please, just hear me out. David looked coldly at her. And that, my dear, was what you should have said a month ago. In one quick motion, he flung the coffee table and sent it tumbling. The vase on top of the table crashed and fell, scattering pieces of broken glass across the floor. I thought it would be better for both of us, you know. I'm sorry, I don't know how to explain it to you. You couldn't know how I was feeling, what I was thinking. But the moment I learned about everything, all I wanted to do was forget. Can you blame me for that? I don't want to miss out on the important things that are yet to happen in your life. In Jeremy's. For God's sake, even the simplest things make me miserable now and nostalgic. What about the things I'll miss out on? The beef stew that you'll learn to make someday. The coffee that you'll brew. And Jeremy, him sharing the things that I like doing. Trips to beaches. Watching him go to school. Talking to him as an adult. Coaching him about how to be responsible. About how to pick the right girl. It tortures me that I wouldn't be here to tell him that I like the girl he's dating. Or maybe pick on the girl he's dating. That I won't be here to see him graduate from college. That I will never know if the years will be kind to him. That even a simple thing, an activity, I'll never get to share with him anymore. I know it's silly but I'd like to go biking with him one day. And how will that happen now? He's too. The only things he knows are crying when he's hungry, laughing when he's happy, and sleeping when he's tired. I don't have much time left, so I don't want to lose another few seconds of happiness with you and Jeremy. Not even if it means that I will have to carry the burden alone for a little while. And you, she continued, and you, I don't know what I will do, what I can do for you, to make it easier. I just don't know. David couldn't look at her, so he turned away. His fists were clenched tightly. Rachel knew that he must be fuming at her. She entwined her arms around him, pulling him from behind, sobbing against his back. Baby, please. You are so unfair. I don't know how many times I have to keep on telling you that I'm your husband. I deserve the right to be with you through all of these. You can't decide when it is that I have to be a part of your life because it should be every, bucking, day. David removed her arms from around him, but she wouldn't let go. Oh, please, baby, don't make this harder, she whispered, begging him to listen. It wasn't easy for me, either. David managed to pry her arms away from his body. He moved to face her. Looking into her eyes, seeing them wet with tears, he couldn't push her away anymore. Before he knew it, he was pulling her closer, and her sobbing increased. He took a deep breath of the smell of her hair the clean shampoo. The fresh scent of her body. He kept breathing her in as though he was afraid that not doing so could make her disappear sooner. Rachel clutched him and squeezed herself tightly against his chest. When there was no response from him, she looked up and saw the tears in his eyes again. 
There's no more hint of anger in them, only the hurt that she inflicted on her husband. And right then, she wanted to just make him angry again. She touched her husband's face, softly pressing each finger against the tears, but they won't stop rolling down, so she did the only thing she knew to make amends. She kissed him hard, feeling his tongue, teasing him so he would give in. She pulled on his head to bring his lips closer. When his mouth softened, she lightly bit his lower lip. David couldn't resist any longer, he grabbed her waist and kissed her hungrily on the lips, keeping to memory the contour of her lips and savoring how she tasted. In the back of his mind, David knew that he had to be the stronger one. It didn't matter that he felt the way he had. Nothing matters, but how she feels, he kept on telling himself. Fuck what I feel. But he was lost already in his own battle. The talk earlier with the doctor. Him saying that it could be eight months. Or it could be longer. Or that Rachel could be one of the cancer survivors, but another image would flit inside David's head where he was living alone in the new house he bought, and everything would come sinking back in. He grabbed Rachel's shoulders, and no matter how tightly he squeezed his eyes, the tears kept falling. And then he wasn't able to control it anymore. He shook as he sobbed. Rachel moved and pulled him closer, trying to soothe him. But it was his moment. It had to be. And so she let him lose it. After a while, David stopped shaking. He bent towards her, drawing her in as though there were still spaces between them. I'm sorry, darling. I'm sorry, he repeated as he bent and kissed her forehead. It's just so hard. But we'll fight this together. We'll get through this together. It wasn't easy for me. All the more because I knew how I'd hurt you. I'm so very sorry, Rachel said. David squeezed her tightly and cradled her like a baby. This time, it was she who cried against his chest. Letting it all out wasn't easy, but his being here, and her knowing that he will never leave her side made everything bearable. I'll fight it, babe. Don't worry, I'll fight it, she kept on saying gutturally. And if God will listen to my prayers, then I'll get to stay with you for a long time. David nodded slowly, repeatedly, not knowing that he was doing it involuntarily. He shut his eyes tightly and fought back another batch of tears. He had to be the stronger one, he told himself one last time. Chapter 16 A Memory from 14 Years Ago Just like the other days in 1997, David had waited for Rachel outside her office building. He couldn't wait because, after four years, both of them would now be graduating from college. Rachel would soon look for a job just like she promised, as she was thrilled at the idea of making her own money. Similarly, David talked to his professors and local art gallery owners and started showing off his portfolio. It was more difficult for him since he was a new artist, and there were already tons in the field. Sometimes, the gallery owners wouldn't even agree to meet with him. Rachel knew David had talent. Regardless, the field he chose was bound to make success extremely challenging. After two months of rejection letters, countless bottles of beer, and finished paintings that were littered to rot in the garage, David decided to take a job in advertising. His passion for the arts could wait. He said that advertising would only be his day job while he was struggling to make a name for himself in artistic circles. One day, when I feel like I'm more than good enough, I'll paint you. And that'll be the first painting I'm going to exhibit in a gallery, David told Rachel. She would punch him lightly on his arm to let him know that she didn't approve. When they started working, time became a problem. Rachel wasn't aware that sales could be so demanding. It was her rotten luck that when she got hired, her company was entering its peak sales months, and she had to extend her working hours to meet with clients and sell condiments to supermarkets. Most of the time, when she was not in the field doing rounds, she would be in a coffee shop crunching numbers and figuring out how to meet the demand forecast for her group. It was an additional challenge that her boss Liza was sternly firm about her numbers. She kept on telling Rachel that she had to focus on delivering above the target, that she had to raise the bar. Rachel's first month bombed, which she found unsettling. She's a born achiever, and because of that, the feeling of inadequacy was something she abhorred. She was off target by a few thousand cases, and when this was compared to the prior year of the same month, the numbers looked doubly bad. She kept running through her spreadsheets again and again, but couldn't figure out what went wrong. Liza was fuming when Rachel turned in her report. 
this number is what we'd hit if we didn't have an agent in the field, which just speaks about how horrible these figures actually are. Rachel had to examine and probe deeper into her numbers for two straight days before she was able to come up with a more in-depth report on how her horrendous sales came about. She called Liza and asked if she could take an hour of her time to show the analysis she'd prepared. Liza agreed, intrigued with what Rachel had to say. 1. We have no running promotions this time, which prevented the customers from ordering more cases. 2. We can't make a side-by-side -side comparison of this month's sales against last year's. They're incomparable because we had an impending increase in the prices of oil and tomato sauce in the past, and customers ordered more to take advantage of the lower prices. This year, there were no projected price changes leaving customers to order only what was needed in the market. 3. We implemented a new warehouse management system. We delivered products that didn't pass the shelf life requirements as set forth in our contracts, and when these reached the customers, they rejected the products outright. This could also have contributed, making our customers a little gun-shy when it came to ordering higher volume from us again. When Rachel started her presentation, Liza was going through some documents in front of her, but she found herself listening intently to Rachel's explanations. Liza was leaning forward on her desk, the leather chair creaking under her weight when Rachel ended her presentation. It is an explanation why our sales this month are low, Liza began. Thoughtfully, she added, it wasn't just your accounts, Rachel. I admit that I was hard on you, but to tell you the truth, there were others that did poorly this quarter. Rachel was saddened upon hearing that across the company, sales were bad, yet she was relieved that she had been able to show a good analysis of why the sudden drop occurred. Although it was at a micro level, she still knew that she was able to put together a solid explanation regarding the general trend of their sales. I'll make a few quick calls. Please expect our agents to get in touch with you. I need you to share with them what you presented to me, and together, look at the issue holistically. Rachel rubbed her cold hands against the sides of her skirt. She didn't realize that she was holding her breath, waiting for Liza's comments. There were no praises, but her boss's reaction somewhat conveyed that she'd been happy with the analysis. The days that followed were met with another series of sleepless nights working with the other agents to review their numbers. Since Rachel was new in the company, they didn't give her much chance to speak during meetings, but she was adept at charming her way with people. In the end, she got the chance to finally show her analysis. When the group separated, they were all ready to present to their managers, and by then, Rachel had been warmly accepted into the group. Through it all, David was there for her. Since he knew her work demands, when they were not together, he spent late hours working on his projects so that he could deliver them on time. The hours that he was able to cut during normal office hours, he spent with Rachel. If these hours weren't enough, he would skip work and offer to drive for her during client calls. Those were just a few of the ways he found to make certain that he could still be a part of Rachel's daily routine. Back in college, although they had different majors, they would compare the available slots of their subjects and align their schedules as closely as possible before picking out which classes to take. That way, they'd get to spend as much free time as they wanted with each other. How was it? Have you slept yet? David asked when he met Rachel for dinner. They entered the steakhouse. They agreed that on Fridays, they would go for a steak dinner. It was something that Rachel wasn't too happy about even though she also loved steaks as it would require her to put more time on the treadmill. But David begged her to say yes. He loved steaks. She loved steaks, he reasoned. And she couldn't say no to him. So she figured she'd run the extra miles on the treadmill. They passed through a wooden sliding door and chose a table in the corner of the dimly lit restaurant. The tables were wooden with matching chairs. Cowboy hats and pictures of cowboys riding horses were hung on the walls. Part of the reason Rachel and David frequented the restaurant was its ambience. The numbers still suck, but I was able to wow my boss with my brilliant presentation. Data chuckled. That's the spirit, darling. No, no, it's true, Rachel argued frowning over her boyfriend's less enthused reaction. Then, she rolled her eyes at him when she realized that he was teasing as usual. The waitress came over and smiled at them. She handed out menus, but David already had his order in mind. I'm having the usual, David told the waitress. And then, Caesar salad for her and a glass of Merlot for me. Would that be all? How about some appetizers? Could you please put that in first? We'll call you over later for the rest of the order. 
The waitress nodded and repeated the list before she turned and walked away. David looked at Rachel. Your job sounds really boring, he said. It's not. I actually find it very challenging. Plus, I'll get a good bonus if I sell beyond the target. So how much bonus did you get this quarter? David was teasing. I hate you. They laughed. No worries, darling. I'm sure you'll figure it out, and once you've done so, they'll have a hard time begging you to stop selling. They'll tell you to stop, otherwise, there will be no more production lines with a big enough capacity to support your sales. David took Rachel's hand and gave it a light squeeze. He looked at her dainty fingers, and he grew fonder of the woman in front of him. She was wearing the cheap ring he gave her after graduation even though she had kept on teasing him that he was only able to get her to say yes to his proposal because she was drunk. The waitress came back and set the glass of wine on David's side while she poured water into Rachel's empty glass. You're too kind, Rachel said. That, my dear, is what you call a pep talk, David said, winking. Oh, you're so bad, Rachel said before laughing. Enough about me. How's work? she asked. The salad was served and Rachel started eating. David watched her. Here, have some, she offered. No. As I always say, it will take up valuable space that I'm reserving for my steak. He sipped his wine. Today, I had to work on a print ad for a t-shirt company. I'm not sure if it'll be a hit, but the tagline is feel the comfort. Shirts on. Oh my god, that's terrible, Rachel said. I know, right? I'm working on something, but I'll have to mention to my boss that the tagline sucks. Or. Or it could appeal to the public. After all, it sounds familiar. Familiar, common. Yes. He frowned. It might work. I don't know about that. I hope, so that at least one of us will get a bonus. He winked at her again. She kicked him under the table and laughing, David yelped. What about your paintings? Anything new? She asked. David shrugged. He was working on several paintings, a series composed of five frames. He was almost done with them, and he was rushing since he was able to contact a gallery owner who would hold an event before the end of the month. The owner allowed David to join the exhibition. I'm still working on something, but nothing out of the ordinary. When the steak was served, David immediately started. I'm starved. You look like you haven't slept in ages, Rachel commented. She was looking closely at David now. He raised his eyebrows to keep from looking as though he was hiding something. What? I slept like a lion after eating an elephant. No, you're hiding something. This happens only when you're working on a major project. Out with it, she paused, can a lion ever eat an elephant? If a boa constrictor can swallow an elephant, my guess is that a lion can shred an elephant to pieces, David said, laughing. Remember, the little prince? Of course. That's a classic piece, Rachel said. Her eyes widened all of a sudden, don't change the topic. Oh, you're so good at this, making me feel stupid and like a child the way you avoid my questions. David laughed. Okay. You got me. Remember the gallery classics? I was able to talk to Julio, the owner, and he'll give me a spot in his month-end exhibition. I am allowed to hang five of my paintings there. Julio? Yes, Julio. He's a talented artist and has very deep pockets, family money he told me. Lucky him. It's a good thing that he's just a few years older than I am, and we got along well during our first meeting. It happened so fast. I can't wait for the end of this month. Wow, that's great. Five? Have you picked out which ones you're going to put on display? Nope. I'm not showing any of the ones that I previously painted. I'm working on a concept. I'm done with four paintings, and I'm finalizing the last one. Wow. That many? She said. Show me. David knew she would beg him to show her his paintings, which was exactly the reason he didn't tell her sooner. No, this time you have to wait. They continued eating, and every now and then, Rachel would ask again about the paintings. What concept he was working on, and what medium he used. But David was able to segue into other topics. The night ended with David dropping Rachel off at her condo and bidding her goodbye with a kiss. The day that David had been waiting for came, and whistling, 
He put on a dark blue dress shirt that he picked only the other day. He put on a striped, blue, silk necktie. He grinned at his reflection because he acquired the look he was working to have, rugged and formal at the same time. He ran his fingers over his dark hair and messed it up, annoyed that he had put on mousse when he never did before. And now, it seemed like his hair's all flat and lifeless because he combed his hair the wrong way. He checked his reflection again, and this time, he smiled as his hair was back to its usual fashionable mess. Months of preparation and still, he had some reservations about his works. It felt like the strokes were done in such a rush, and although the overall effect was good, he knew that the audience might not like them. Honestly, though, he didn't care. He had no intention of selling the series. David called Rachel to make sure that she would come to the gallery. She said that she'd drop by in between her rounds to the clients. She'd be quick, she had said because her schedule for the day included meetings with four different clients. David said he understood, but not even the promise of a brief visit dampened his attitude. He entered the gallery and shook hands with Julio. Similar to him, he was wearing a blue dress shirt. He had a coat on. Julio displayed ten of his favorite works. He was still trying to make a name in the field, but he kept on saying that he wasn't that much interested in the money that his paintings might someday bring in. He just wanted to express himself through his works of art, to which David, in one of their meetings once replied, Lucky bastard. This led them both to laugh. You seem happy, Julio said upon seeing him. Delighted is more like it, David replied. Well, if I were in your shoes, I'd be too. Julio grinned and patted him on the shoulder. See you around, pal. David went to where his paintings were displayed and wondered as he studied each piece in the series, will she notice? Rachel parked the blue company car outside Classics. There were other sedans in the parking lot, but she was disheartened that there were only a few patrons that dropped by for the opening. She threw the keys in her purse and got out of the car in a rush as she had to leave again soon. Right now, though, she pushed any thoughts about the meetings away. She's here to look at the paintings and support her boyfriend. As soon as she entered the gallery, the first thing she did was look for David's listing. True enough, there were five paintings under his name. Life at its finest? She read it again and almost choked. Life at its finest? To Rachel, the series title sounded lame. Her lips twitched while she thought of a diplomatic way of telling David that his exhibit title was as bad as her first quarter sales. As she walked around the gallery, she decided not to ruin this day for him, so she'd just keep her opinions to herself and tell him some other time. Maybe some connoisseurs would think differently and take an interest in his paintings. She walked around and saw the typical stills. She checked the artists, and several were under Julio's name. So that's the Julio he was telling me about, she thought. He's talented. But he should paint more than just still life. As she continued checking out the paintings, she found out she was wrong, there were a few more of Julio's, and he had some portraits and a few abstract pieces. There were even a few that she liked and wouldn't mind buying, if only she had the money to spare. Then she came across David's paintings, but before she studied each one, she looked around to see if he was nearby, but she failed in locating him. She read the exhibition title again out loud, testing it on her mouth, life at its finest, and she got goosebumps at the icky way it sounded to her ears. She still couldn't believe that he'd select a title like that, and without any catchphrase, his series would surely hit the red mark. There were a total of five paintings. Looking at them holistically, the only link that she found was their finely sculpted wooden frames. Not one of the frames was the exact copy of the other, but the way that each was carefully carved definitely put a continuity in the series. At least that part was brilliant. Her eyes skimmed the paintings, studying the first one, but before she could criticize it in her mind, her eye caught sight of the next painting, and her jaw almost dropped. It was a portrait of her. She clenched her fists tightly in utter frustration, a curse escaping her lips, wishing that she could punch him. She looked around, but David was still nowhere to be found. How could he display a portrait of her like that? She didn't want to be part of an exhibit and to become the subject of criticisms. Her thoughts were flying when she noticed that the fourth painting was David's portrait. She grew even more frustrated. Does he think that if there's a portrait of him in the series too, I won't be mad at him for displaying my picture in a gallery? She was fuming. The moment she found him, she would hit him hard with her purse. 
hard enough to leave welts on his arms, she thought, fuming. She closed her eyes and wiggled her fingers in front of her, then breathed in and out steadily, which was what she learned from her yoga class. Meditate, meditate, she kept on telling herself. Chasing away her panic, she drew a few more breaths before opening her eyes again, yearning for the painting of her face to vanish, but it still hung in front of her as though taunting her. With a grunt, she moved back to the previous painting. The first one was quite ordinary, really. It was of a car, but the painting was focused on the front wheel, which was zoomed in against a rustic background. She skipped her portrait and moved to the third painting and found herself staring at a lamb. She beamed with pride as she studied the strokes David used in realistically capturing the lamb's fleece. It looked unimaginably soft, and she got the urge to caress it. Behind the lamb was a young lady watching over it, a smile painted on her sunburnt face. She moved to look at David's portrait, and some of the irritation that she felt earlier came rushing back. His blue-gray eyes were looking directly at her, and his face was painted with his usual impish smile, as if he knew that she would be mad over this exhibit and was already begging for her forgiveness. Rachel moved to the last painting, and she let out a sigh of disappointment. Afraid that David had suddenly appeared behind her and heard her, she turned around and was thankful to find that she's still alone. The frame held an abstract painting, a mixture of earth colors that looked to be splattered against the canvas. In the middle, there was some sort of twinkling thing. She suppressed another sigh. She looked at all five paintings again and felt, much to her chagrin, disappointed. If a review were to be made of this exhibition, she feared what would be written about David's corner. If this was what he chose as his first series to present to critics, she seriously doubted if he would ever get anywhere. Frustrated, Rachel searched for the mobile phone inside her purse, and when she found it, she quickly dialed David's number. His phone rang, but it went unanswered. She tried contacting it again, but she still got no answer. She tapped her left foot and checked her wristwatch. David still wasn't around, and she would have to leave soon. She tried to find him, but her eyes fell on a young couple who were staring and grinning at her. She cocked her eyebrows and then realized that the couple was probably trying to figure out if she was the person in the second painting. Flustered, she gave them a meek smile and without another glance, left the hall in long strides. David squirmed when the phone inside his pocket started to vibrate. He took the mobile phone out and watched as the light blinked with Rachel's name flashed on the screen. He grinned and ignored the phone, putting it back inside his pocket. He was having too much fun watching Rachel from behind a post, seeing how she reacted as she went over the paintings. Rachel looked around, undoubtedly searching for him, and he knew her well enough to surmise that had she seen him, he would have received a terrible nagging. He put his hands over the pocket of his pants, waiting for the vibration to stop. The phone went still, but the vibration started again, and he had to immediately put his hand inside his pocket because it started tickling his leg. One thing's for sure, he wasn't going to answer her calls. Rachel looked around one more time at the gallery and left. Her heels barely made a sound against the carpeted halls. David laughed as he watched her prance away, and his sides hurt from trying to keep any sound from escaping his mouth. Then he checked his watch. It was almost four in the afternoon. He squinted as though mentally calculating something, and then he started walking towards the gallery entrance. He checked the left pocket of his pants for something else and exhaled when his fingers closed in on the cold metal. It's still there. He was afraid he would lose it after taking it out of the box. 30 minutes. I'm giving her 30 minutes, he thought. When he reached the gallery entrance, he looked for a good spot to wait. He checked his watch once more, each movement of the watch is thin, stainless second hand teasing him. Rachel rode the blue company car immediately, pressing her foot on the gas pedal heavily, sending her rear wheel over the sidewalk as she turned. She cursed, and her wide mouth was pressed in a thin line as she drove away. There were a lot of reasons for her to be pissed off. First, she couldn't find David. Second, she felt immensely humiliated that her portrait had to be paraded in that manner. Third, when she called David, he didn't answer. And he still hadn't called her back. She dialed his number again and went through to his voicemail. This time, she left him a message. You owe me big time. And over dinner, don't ever tell me that I didn't pass by. I went and gone, and I never once glimpsed your sorry ass. She paused. 
Oh, and wipe that smug smile off your face. She let out a sound that was partly a curse and a sigh of resignation after she put the phone down. She took to her breathing exercises again to compose herself. Meditate, meditate, she kept on muttering. How she missed the sound of the waves to soothe her nerves. She glanced at the car's digital watch, the red blinking numbers told her that in a few more minutes, she'll be late for her next appointment. She had a sinking feeling that she wouldn't be able to make it to the meeting, and that would be fourth on her list, in any case. Then once Liza learns about it, Rachel will get a good dress down, and that will be the fifth. She sighed and breathed in again. She took her phone while driving and dialed her client's number. It rang three times before it was answered. Good afternoon, Amanda speaking, she heard from the other line. Hi, Amanda, this is Rachel. I'm on my way over. I'll be there in around 30 minutes. Hi, Rachel. It's okay, my boss isn't here yet. But he phoned ahead of you and said that he'll be arriving shortly. Damn. Rachel said. Then realizing that Amanda had heard her, she rapidly added, Oops, sorry about that. Okay, I'll be quick. She asked, Can you run over the things that he wanted to ask in regards to our new promotion? That way I'll be prepared and won't need to waste any of his time. Her thoughts drifted back to the gallery. Not seeing David there infuriated her. After all of her efforts to squeeze him in her tight schedule, and seeing her portrait hanging there, the thing that she wanted most was to at least find him so she could nag him about it. Well, for one, he said that the promo schedule is going to conflict with the one that we're running now. What? Can you say that again? Sorry, I lost you for a moment there. Tunnel, Rachel quickly said. She couldn't concentrate. She kept thinking about David's career plummeting. And it hadn't even reached its peak yet. Or at the very least, started soaring. What's wrong with him? Why would he ruin that chance? She kept on searching for the right word to describe the painting series, and the only one she came up with was tasteless. Rachel? Are you listening? Perhaps we should just discuss this when you get here, Amanda said. No. I'm sorry. Static. She winced at her pathetic excuse. I got you all clear now. But she was still thinking about David. The series. The paintings. The wheel. Her picture. His portrait. She was sure she missed something. David wouldn't risk his career like that if there wasn't a reason. I'm hanging up, Amanda said impatiently. Oh, please, don't. Rachel interjected as she quickly tried to remember what Amanda was droning on. You mentioned something about the conflict in promos, right? Rachel hoped that it would appease Amanda enough to not hang up on her. Yeah. Then, he asked if there are other discounts that we could take? He said that. Rachel's thoughts were again back to the gallery. The wheel. David's portrait. Her portrait. The lamb. The abstract painting. What was that about? Something was definitely up. She was positive about it now. What was the riddle? Was this some sort of puzzle that David was trying to make her solve? Was this a surprise of some sort? Why would he? He knows how I hate surprises. But he also knows I like puzzles. She went through the paintings again in her head. The wheel with the rustic background. Her portrait. The lamb. David's portrait. And the twinkling thing? What could she be missing? The first painting was very straightforward. It was a wheel. The second and fourth ones held no other meaning. What about the third painting? Why was there a lamb? She couldn't figure it out. She could still hear Amanda talking from the other line, but Rachel couldn't focus on what Amanda was saying. The third painting held the biggest clue, and that was what she needed to crack. Maybe she was focusing on the wrong object. Maybe it wasn't the lamb. Could it be the young lady? The lamb and the young lady? All of a sudden, Rachel hit the brakes, and she burst out laughing. Oh my god, Rachel said. Rachel? Why? What happened? Amanda asked. Something's come up. I won't be able to make it. Please, 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 make an excuse for me, Rachel begged. What? Amanda sounded irritated. I can't just. You can. Gotta go. I'm really sorry. Bye. Then Rachel hung up, unmindful of whether she'd get a negative in Liza's scorecard of her performance for canceling a meeting on such short notice. Rachel took a U-turn. 
Oh my god, I think he just proposed. Then she drove all the way back to classics, still laughing loudly after realizing that the third painting was depicting the famous nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. The keyword was Mary, only it was spelled differently. David didn't have to look up to know that Rachel had come back. A loud screeching of tires announced her arrival, and when he gazed at the parking lot, Rachel's blue car was already parked. He looked at his watch. 22 minutes. His estimate was accurate. He smiled to himself when he got the confirmation of how well he knew her. Then as quickly as she parked, Rachel looked around, obviously searching for him. Their eyes met, and she came running towards him, leaving the car's engine on and the door to the driver's side open. He stood motionless as he watched her run towards him. He knew she liked puzzles, and every day, he worked hard to please her. He was grinning widely at her, excited to wrap her in his arms. Rachel was still running, grinning at him when one of her shoe's heels snapped, and she went tumbling down the pathway. David's smile was wiped off his face in an instant, and he ran towards her. Rachel was already sitting when he reached her. There were a few strays of curly blonde hair that had gone loose as she fell. He crouched down beside her and seeing that she wasn't hurt, let out a laugh. Rachel picked her shoe and threw it at him, which he caught. She was laughing too. Come on, you've got to admit it was funny, he said, his happiness brimming from the way his smile had been plastered on his face. Cinderella, he added, putting her foot back into her shoe with the broken heel. Rachel looked at him and laughed again. You're the cheesiest man I've ever met, she said, her dimples showing. David laughed louder. That wasn't quite the reaction I was hoping for, he said. He checked his left pocket, and his fingers immediately found the ring. He took it out, and he knelt on one knee. I know cheesy is not something you like. I can come up with what I think in my head are the best lines to convince you to stay with me forever, but then you'll probably laugh about them and ridicule me. So I decided to limit what I'm going to say to a few words I surmise won't make your eyes roll, he paused and looked into her eyes. This time, his smile faded. Rachel couldn't suppress a giggle. It filled her with so much joy to think that David was doing what she thinks he's doing now. She felt as though she was floating. David's eyes grew soft as he said, happiness will always be a choice. I can choose to be happy. You can choose to be happy. But can we choose to be happy together? His lips closed before he opened them again. Marry me, he said. Rachel stopped laughing. Oh, so this time's the real thing? She looked serious. You always tease me that you only got engaged to me because I took advantage and proposed when you were drunk, he replied. Rachel looked away, her lips partly open. David swallowed as he waited for Rachel's answer. He knew in his heart that she would accept. Of course, she will. Why won't she? But when it took longer for Rachel to say yes, he panicked. His hands were clammy. Oh my god, is she going to say no? His mind was exploding. After what seemed like forever to David, Rachel met his gaze with the glowing warmth of her brown eyes. What can a girl who's so in love possibly say to that except yes? David swallowed. Baby, yes, I will marry you, she said. David put the ring on Rachel's finger and held her close. She was gazing up at him with those warm caramel eyes of hers. He kissed her passionately, and when it was broken, there were tears in her eyes. I thought you didn't hurt yourself when you fell, he joked. Rachel pinched him playfully on the side. Then one by one, the few spectators that had gathered around them yelled out congratulations, cheering them on. David scooped Rachel in his arms and brought her to the passenger side of her car. He slid in the driver's seat and with one last wave at their audience, drove away. Chapter 17 David was packing the things that Rachel would need for the third chemotherapy cycle. Every day, he was reminded of his wife's condition. He tried not to think about it, but he could no longer pretend that the sickness wasn't real. The best he could hope for was that her body would respond positively to the treatments. The house had to be kept especially clean, and Susie had to keep on washing the floors and disinfecting areas of the house where bacteria could thrive. Susie also had to make sure that Jeremy had been given a bath before he was allowed to enter his parents' room. That bit felt odd to David, 
but he had to be sure that anything that could add complications to Rachel's condition was minimized. The precautions were easier to handle. What made everything more difficult were Rachel's mood swings. Two weeks ago, Rachel threw a tantrum when nobody was fast enough to bring her new blankets. She complained that the one she used wasn't soft enough and that her entire body was sore. Every part of her ached after a chemo session, and David was now getting used to her moods. Today, he planned on making everything better than the last two cycles. For one, he already had a traveling bag ready, which only needed to be repacked if clothes had to be replaced, or medical supplies needed to be added, etc. He also took his time checking on Rachel's clothes, were they soft enough? Were they ironed? He gave firm instructions to Susie about keeping Rachel's things in order after she threw her first tantrum. Rachel's moods would worsen as days passed by, but David promised himself that he would not quit. That he would be the last ounce of laughter, the parody of a smile to touch her lips when everything else failed. And definitely, he would not let Rachel give up the fight. Her tantrums were her battle cries, that was what he told himself. Regardless of how irrational she sometimes became, he had to understand because he knew that the pain for her was so much more than she was letting on. There was one time that David caught Rachel crying. It was only a few days after the first session. When David approached her, Rachel simply told him that it was painful. That her whole body ached. But looking at her, David knew that pain wasn't what made her cry. It was the realization they had to endure, the knowledge that she had stage 4 cancer, and that science could only do so much at this time. David was not a very religious person and occasionally skipped church, but the turn of events had changed him somehow. When there was nothing else that could help him, his instinct told him to turn to the one being he believed would never fail him. So David started praying. Every day, and at times, he would bring Jeremy to church so David could say his prayers, while on the side, Jeremy could sit on David's lap looking innocent and adorable. He hoped that God would have pity on them both, and God would let them have Rachel for the rest of their lives. Regularly now, or at least when Rachel feels well enough, they attend church services. Rachel shared with David her dream, her prayer, that somehow she would have her miracle. It was a rather simple wish. She wanted to see them both well and happy afterward. That he might find someone else to love and spend the remaining years of his life with, to which he vehemently disagreed, and for Jeremy to grow up to be a good man. Sometimes, perhaps in utter desperation, Rachel would say out loud when she's playing with Jeremy, I wish I could ride the bike with you. You're going to love the fresh air and the feeling of being so free. During those moments, it would take a significant amount of effort for David not to hold her close, ask her to keep quiet, and put her to sleep. Because when she's sleeping, there's no fear and David could go on looking at her for hours, telling himself how lucky he was to be the one that got to spend these moments with her. Similar to the other cancer patients, Rachel had a bucket list. At first, she was very keen on ensuring that all of the items there were being diligently done when time permitted. But then, one day, she stopped writing on the list, saying that she wanted life to be spontaneous. There were ways that the list could be completed, but she decided to stop focusing most of her time worrying about getting the activities in her list done. Right now, she just takes it one day at a time and enjoys her days with the people she loves. David never liked the idea of Rachel having a bucket list, but he had a different reason. It was because it made it even more permanent that the activity on the list was probably the last time they would be doing it. And he didn't like that, so he was glad when his wife stopped writing on her list. The last item there, as he had predicted, was to ride the bike with Jeremy. The list was pinned by a carrot-shaped magnet to their refrigerator. For weeks now, it remained untouched. David picked up the bag and loaded it in the car's trunk. Then he went to the bedroom to escort Rachel. Rachel stood slowly, and David helped her up. Susie went to Rachel's left side to offer assistance. Let's go, darling, we have another date, he said to her. He referred to the chemo sessions as dates because they spend the entire days together. During sessions, he would never leave her side unless Dr. Jones or the attending nurse required him to. During the second cycle, he brought a ukulele with them. He knew how to play the guitar, but he read somewhere that the ukulele sounded brighter and had a happier aura, so he bought one. When he strummed on the Aquila strings, he fell in love with the sound. He believed that the ukulele was a more appropriate instrument now to bring in good vibes, and to top it off, it was a handy piece of artwork. It was so tiny that when Rachel first saw him with it, she laughed. 
In the hospital, when he and Rachel were singing to the tune of a Hawaiian melody, they were politely told by the nurse to stop the racket, as she had termed it, claiming that the other patients shouldn't be bothered by their noise. Like teenagers caught doing a mischievous feat, Rachel giggled, while David gave the nurse his charming, impish smile. So today, he left the ukulele behind and instead brought with him an MP3 player loaded with audiobooks. He also packed a few paperbacks in case Rachel would prefer reading to listening. He had playing cards and metal puzzle pieces too. He realized that he frequented the toy shop more than ever now because he kept on searching for toys and puzzles that they could play around with while passing the time. When Rachel fell asleep, David would take the time to stretch. He would give her a kiss on the forehead and walk around the hospital, order coffee from the cafe, and go back after finishing it. Sometimes, he would introduce himself to strangers who, similar to him, had loved ones being treated for cancer. It helped him to know that there were others that understood the pain of what he and Rachel were going through. When David returned and found his wife still sleeping, he would move his seat closer and try to get some rest. Third time. David wondered how many more they would have to endure before. He couldn't think about it. He took Rachel's arm, and he tried to focus on taking care of his wife, nothing else. As much as possible, he had to keep things normal. He couldn't, wouldn't falter. Dr. Jones had told him to make sure that Rachel wouldn't pity herself. So he smiled just as he always had, even though as they entered the car, he was uncertain if today would be their last trip to the hospital or if today would only lead them to more pain in the future. Rachel found herself dreading another chemo session. She knew what would come next, there would be pain all over her body, the discomfort would make her lose her mind, she would be irritable. It's the medication. It isn't really me, she reasoned. She didn't want to be a burden to David but knew it was impossible. There were times when Rachel would feign a yawn and close her eyes so that David would get some rest. When he had moved his chair near Rachel's, and she could feel him softly snoring, she would open her eyes and watch him sleep. She longed to touch his face as he slept, but she refrained from doing so because she didn't want to wake him up. She realized that her husband had become quite a light sleeper, which was unusual for him. She used to tease him that he could sleep anywhere, any time of the day, to which David jokingly replied, even while driving. Today, the playing cards were tucked back in the side pocket of David's bag after they played a few hands. David had fallen asleep on a chair beside Rachel's bed. Rachel looked at David lovingly, and for the hundredth time, she wondered how hard this cancer issue must be for him. That's why she had to fight it because, in the end, it was the only way she knew she could return David's dedication to her. Rachel reached out to touch David's arm, and he stirred. She held her breath for a while, afraid that she had awakened him. She was relieved when his eyelids became still again, and there were no other significant movements. It was then that the nurse approached and spoke, Is everything all right? Is there anything you need? Just two questions and immediately, David sat upright. He ran his hands over his ruffled dark hair. Rachel couldn't help but laugh. She took David's hand and gave it a squeeze. No, I have all that I need, she said. When the nurse walked away, she turned to David. I can't believe that she woke you up like that when all the while, I kept silent, unmoving not touching your face so as not to wake you. You can touch me all you want, darling, he said, teasing. Rachel only laughed louder. Does it hurt? He asked. No, Rachel said in a flat tone, putting an end to the discussion. I've been thinking, I don't like wearing this shawl over my head, and I'm starting to lose my hair. And? I think I should get a wig. No, you'll be uncomfortable. If comfort is the price for getting rid of this shawl, I'll gladly pay it, Rachel said. Seriously, let's look for a wig. We had fun. I'll look for something different. How would you like blue? She teased. David laughed heartily. Rachel noted that although he still laughed a lot, there were moments that the sounds he made rang with emptiness. But this one, what he just gave her, made her feel warm. We're not getting blue, David said, shaking his head. Brown? No, brown's almost too close to blonde. I said I want to look different, she paused. How would you like it if my hair is black like yours? No color will ever look bad on you, he replied quickly, but with a smile painted on his face to indicate that he was teasing her. She punched him lightly on the arm. Black it is. 
I've always liked dark hair, she said dreamily. Talking about black hair brought back fond memories of Lee. And Mike. Since Rachel and Mike said their goodbyes, this was the first time he crossed her mind. She remembered the pancakes. She wondered how he was. Are they engaged now? Did Mike leave his father to be with Lee in New York? It had been months. A lot could have happened already. You know, after I learned about my condition, Rachel paused, that sales trip that I went to after, that wasn't real. David squeezed her hand, his eyes softening. My thoughts were flying, and all I knew was that I couldn't face you yet and break your heart, she paused, trying to read David's face. I didn't go to California. I wanted to book a hotel room and ended up staying in town. And then, I met Mike. Well, wait a minute, a guy? No, a girl named Michael, she said. Of course, a guy. What? I'm no longer handsome enough for you? He added in jest, although Rachel hinted a trace of hurt in his voice. Laughing, Rachel continued, I'm sure you'll like him. He reminded me of you. You have the same eye color, the same mannerisms. In a way, during the time that we were together, he helped me take my mind off cancer. I'd like to believe that our encounter helped me prepare for telling you. As handsome as I am? David asked, his eyebrows arched higher. No, incomparable, she paused. He's way hotter. David's eyes widened, and then he frowned like a little boy. I'm just kidding, she said as she held his face in her hands. You know you're the only one for me. David grinned, wondering to himself if he was indeed jealous. Where is he now? Perhaps we could go visit him, or ask him to visit you? That's the funny thing. At the time, I didn't want to make new connections. I didn't want to have another reason to be sad in case. You know. So I didn't get his last name. All I know is that he was about to propose to his girlfriend. That he's a doctor. Their eyes met. It was David who spoke first. Is he an oncologist? Maybe he could help? I don't know. I'm not sure if he will be able to help me. He's pretty young, I don't think he has much experience, and he failed to mention his specialization to me. He'll be leaving for New York soon, but he's still working here in Jersey when we separated. I'm not sure what particular hospital, but that was months ago. Did he know you're sick? Rachel shook her head and realized sadly but without regret that she lost a potential friend in Mike. Why in the world didn't she bother to ask for his full name? She should have at least memorized the plate number of his car, or his address, or anything to identify him. He didn't know I'm sick. I didn't tell him. I never told anyone else before you, she said. Well, aside from a few people I met that day who seemed to have read through my scowl. Maybe we could find him. I'll see what I can look up about him. He checked his watch. You should rest now, David said and kissed Rachel on the forehead. I'll go get myself a cup of coffee. He walked out of the room, wondering where in the world he would ever find Mike. All he knew was the doctor's name. His blue-gray eyes. His fiancé's name. That would be a start. Chapter 18 The first thing that David did was call his doctor friend and ask how he could get a listing of all the practitioners in New Jersey. He got the list of all the hospitals as well. He was thankful that aside from his friend, there was the internet, and much of the information he needed was already there. It took him only a few hours to identify that there were six doctors in New Jersey with either Michael or Mike as their first names. Why did the doctor's name have to be such a common one? Now, all he had to do was check each of the doctor's profiles, get pictures, and show them to Rachel so that she would be able to identify Mike. Rachel also said that Mike was young, and by that, she clarified that Mike was about 28. Or in his early 30s. She wasn't sure since she didn't ask him directly, but that was the age she put him at. She's right. Should they find Mike and he was an oncologist, David doubted that Mike would be able to work miracles for Rachel. David scanned the names again of the doctors and their profiles. There were only two oncologists in his list. One was 48 years old while the other was probably in his early 30s. David needed to see their pictures. If Mike was not an oncologist, out of the six doctors, only three would fit the age of 28 to 35. There was also a possibility that Rachel could have been mistaken. Maybe Mike didn't practice in New Jersey. 
He recalled what Rachel told him. Blonde hair, blue-gray eyes, around late twenties to early thirties. Michael W. Bloom. He was the first doctor in David's list. The picture that was displayed boasted of dark hair. Although the man in the picture was young, this Mike had dark eyes as well. David crossed out the name from the list. Mike R. Sanders. There were no doctors listed. He removed the R from his search and hit enter on the keyboard. The doctor that David was looking for popped up. When he zoomed in on the picture, a pudgy guy stared back at David. This Mike looked to be in his late fifties. These descriptions disqualified him. The last Michael in David's list was Michael Thomas. David entered the name and hit search. He looked for keywords that contained doctor or doctor he clicked on the first one. It showed a photo of a young man with blonde hair. David zoomed in on the picture, but he couldn't decide if the doctor's eyes were blue-gray. The third qualification was that Mike had to be young. It seemed like Michael Thomas was the doctor David was looking for. He printed the picture, looked at the printout, and turned the computer off. He would show the image to Rachel when they got home. The chemo session was probably close to over, so David had to get back. He didn't like to keep Rachel waiting. He drove fast and was back in the hospital in just a few minutes. David pushed Rachel in her wheelchair, and upon reaching the foot of the stairs, she struggled to stand up. Nope, darling, stay put, David said before lifting Rachel and carrying her all the way to the bedroom. The scent of alcohol greeted them, and he had Susie to thank for that. She never forgot to disinfect the house. David put Rachel in bed and tucked her in as he studied her now gaunt face. He clasped her hand before asking, Is there anything else you need? Um, the thermostat? Why? Are you cold? It's freaking cold. She snapped. David swallowed before moving away from her. He couldn't believe that her foul mood would manifest so early. They just arrived, and he thought the tantrums would be at bay for a while. David adjusted the thermostat using the remote control, the soft beep of the buttons filling the air. Are you too weak to look at a picture? He began. Rachel opened her eyes and looked at him. What picture? I checked out doctors with the name Michael and I was able to find one that somehow, he shrugged and continued, fits the description of your friend. Rachel's lips twitched, maybe she was trying to smile, but David couldn't really tell. The medicines were already taking her away from him. Really? That's very thoughtful of you. Let me see. Of course. Wait. The picture was still on the printer on the desk in their room. David moved to get it, glancing at the picture one more time, and prayed that this was the Michael they were looking for. David didn't understand why he wanted to look for Mike, or if the search was even necessary. And yet, he had done so, wanting desperately to establish a connection between Rachel and her friend, Mike. David handed the colored printout to Rachel. She stared at the picture, and David watched her, waiting for her reaction. She offered him an affectionate smile. This isn't him. But I appreciate it that you took the time to look for him. There's really no need. Oh. He isn't? He thought to himself. But there were no other Dr. Michaels or Mikes listed in New Jersey. David sat on the bed and looked at her. There's no one else. As I said, I wasn't able to get any information about him. There's no need to look for him anyway. She smiled kindly at him. David wanted to argue and tell her that his name couldn't be Michael. He checked all the names. He was sure of that. Or maybe, he needed to do more probing. After all, what he did was just a quick search. Okay. I was hoping that maybe he could somehow help us. But don't worry, I won't search anymore. Thank you. Rachel was so tired that her words came out slurred. Her eyelids were closing as she lay cocooned under the sheets. As though on cue, David kissed her on the forehead and whispered, Sleep tight, darling. Then he walked out of the room. They didn't discuss Mike after that, but David continued his search, using all his connections to get profiles of doctors named Mike, but none fit Rachel's description of him. David spent weeks searching, but couldn't find Mike. In the end, David decided to put an end to his efforts. After all, she had told him that there was no need to look for Mike. Aside from that, David gave in to the thought that Mike wasn't the doctor that could cure Rachel. That was impossible at this point as there had been no breakthrough cure for cancer at stage 4. 
There was no sense in finding him now. Mike wouldn't be their miracle. Chapter 19 Rachel constantly slept because when she did, it kept her from vomiting or feeling nauseated. Even having dinner became an event special enough to watch out for, because most of the time, she had no appetite. At other times, she'd be cranky to step out of the room. It was a torture that she liked chocolates because David wouldn't let her have a bite. She stared flatly at the food on her tray. There was a lumpy pile of mashed potato on her plate, vegetables on the side, and grape juice. She took a spoonful and grimaced, swallowing saliva to get rid of the metal aftertaste. Rachel remembered one incident that she could not forgive herself for. David took the initiative of cooking her favorite meals. She knew that Susie did most of the cooking because her husband was such a bad cook. David set the table, and when they were eating, she felt nausea getting to her. In an attempt to excuse herself from dinner, she stood up, looking back now, she realized it was a terrible, terrible mistake. As soon as she was up, her surroundings swirled around her, she felt dizzy and ended up vomiting right there on the dining table. It was good that David was fast enough to catch her, so she didn't fall, but he wasn't fast enough to rescue the food. After Susie cleaned up, Rachel had been angry, and instead of being apologetic about what happened, she had blamed David for attempting to feed her when he knew that everything tasted horrible to her. Jeremy had cried, disturbed by the loud voices of his parents. The noise only added up to Rachel's stress, and her head started throbbing. She shouted once more at David and surprised herself by going back to their room unaided. He leapt out of his seat and was quick to assist her, but when his hand touched her elbow, it felt as though it burned. She swatted his hand off her like a fly, and she saw that her husband had his mouth tightly shut to keep himself from yelling at her. She locked herself in her room and refused to talk to David for several days. She only saw Susie, and the exchange of words was kept to a minimum. When the pain from chemotherapy subsided, she felt horrible about what she did. She cried as she asked David to forgive her. Despite his usual good nature, he almost snapped at her, but he said he understood and that there's nothing she could ever do that would make him mad at her for long. With those words, Rachel only sank deeper into her guilty place. How could she live like this? Dr. Jones gave her six cycles of chemotherapy for her treatment plan. And added to that, there was also a 15-day radiation treatment. It was more than she could take. Rachel shivered every time she remembered what it's taking to extend her life. Drive, Joan said that she wouldn't be cured, that all this was just treatment. Her life could be longer, but there was no guarantee that the cancer cells would keep on reducing their sizes. And definitely, there was no assurance that they would never grow bigger again. She craned her neck towards the bedside table. Sure enough, the black wig sat on top of it. She touched her bare head. She never knew how naked it felt to not have anything to cover her scalp. It was something she didn't want to get accustomed to. She pushed the tray in front of her and struggled to stand up to take the wig. Her hands fell on the soft, all too shiny mane, and she smiled sadly. The wig reminded her of the hair that she might never be able to grow again. Of ribbons and mousse and curlers that she may never get to use again. But she had to move forward, so she put the wig on and checked herself in the mirror. At first glance, she didn't recognize the pale woman staring back at her. Her eyes and cheeks were sunk deeper now, making her cheekbones more prominent. Through her nightgown, she could see the traces of her thinness. She has lost a lot of weight. With the amount of food that she took, it was only to be expected. How long has it been? Six months? It felt like forever. Her only salvation from all the pain was sleep. And her husband. Poor David. She loved the dear man so much, but sometimes she wondered, if the situation were reversed, would she be able to do the things he was doing for her now? Would she be able to bear his tantrums? When he got grouchy, could she stand him? That last thought made her smile. Her first for the day. It seemed like he never got grouchy. True, there were moments now that he'd lose his nerves and shout or clench his fist or frown at her, but these were only because she'd been difficult. What was she doing to David now? Most of the time, instead of appreciating the things he did for her, she would throw a tantrum. Whether it was the wrong blanket, or the wrong thermostat setting, the wrong cable channel, the loud volume of the stereo, she'd have an outburst. 
Once, she was very depressed about cancer. She didn't want to stop fighting, but there were times that she just wanted to be over with it. When she told David about that, he tried to cheer her up. He got his ukulele and played her a song since he knew that his baritone always soothed her. But this time, it didn't work. His charm flew out the window like an old toy, and his deep voice went unappreciated. All Rachel heard was noise that irritated her eardrums and gave her headaches. She shouted and begged him to stop. David did as he was told, but she knew how much she had hurt him then, with him slamming the door on her a little too loudly as he left. She turned to the door of her room as it opened now, taking her away from her reverie, and David walked in with Jeremy. She would try to be less grumpy today. Hi, darling. You still haven't finished your breakfast, he said, surveying her food. It didn't taste good. Oh. Rachel sat down on the bed and asked David to put Jeremy on her lap. Her son looked up at her and giggled. Such an adorable boy, she thought. How's my little baby? She asked. Jeremy smiled at her and said something unintelligible. They laughed. Come on, Jeremy, what did you say? Mommy's talking to you, David said. Jeremy only giggled and repeated another series of baby sounds. David turned to Rachel. Let's take a picture, darling. I realize we haven't had a family portrait since your medication started. But I look horrible, Rachel protested. Nonsense, David said. You're always beautiful to me. Then he smiled at her. He took a seat beside her and wrapped an arm around her shoulders. Then he smiled and took a picture of them using his camera phone. He took another one. And another. To Rachel, this moment felt like it was torn from her life from months ago, back when everything was normal, and they were all happy. Before cancer became an issue. True, she had not been home most hours, but she had made sure that she spent enough time with her husband and son. She looked gratefully at the man beside her, who was now gathering their son in his arms. The pain that he must be going through might be something that her chemotherapy and radiation treatment sessions couldn't compare to. David lost weight, too, and she was saddened by that. Occasionally, she even caught him with stubble on his chin even when all else was properly shaven. He was so busy taking care of her that sometimes, he failed to look after himself. But she let her mind drift to other thoughts. She didn't want to dwell on how hard this was for all of them. All that mattered was that they're together now, savoring each second and battling the uncertainties ahead. Chapter 20 IT had been seven months since the fight against cancer started. Rachel stopped after the fifth chemo session. Dr. Jones told her that the scan didn't show a reduction in the cancer cells anymore and seeing how difficult it was for her during the first five cycles, he suggested that she stop, and he would evaluate the need to change medicines. On the other hand, the radiation treatments continued and Rachel was able to complete the entire 15. She was now resting and couldn't wait to live normally again, at least for a while, without the pain and nausea. And most importantly, without mood swings. She smiled to herself. Perhaps her hair would grow back, or was that too much to hope for? Rachel adjusted her wig. She's grown accustomed to her straight black hair now. At times, she found it hard to remember the way she looked when her hair was blonde and curly. The days went by quickly, and Rachel started to feel better. The shortness of breath was gone most of the time, but she needed to constantly remind herself that she couldn't do any tiring activity. Playing with Jeremy remained the only exception after begging David to allow her to play with their son. He was reluctant at first until she used the mommy card. Today was David's birthday, and she decided to have food delivered to their house. Rachel set the table, and she was glad to do that. Her arms and legs had become weak due to inactivity, and moving around the house would help strengthen them again. She was relieved that Susie was around to do most of the preparation, though. Like old times, they would dine together, and hopefully, there would be no tantrums. She heaved a sigh of relief at the thought and, ironically, giggled. She feels like she's turned into a drama queen over the past few months. She laughed, the sound lingering in her ears. It didn't feel familiar anymore, so she laughed again, but it didn't prevent the tears from rolling down her cheeks. She looked above, shut her eyes, uttered a short prayer of thanks, and hoped that this was the beginning of something beautiful. 
David and Rachel were out on the porch for the first time. In the past few months, he would spend his evenings on the porch, alone, while thinking of a new subject to paint or mulling things over about his wife. She, on the other hand, was too sick to even feel that she'd enjoy a moment on the porch. So this night was new to them. Sitting on a wooden bench, David's arms were wrapped around Rachel. They were enjoying the night and the feel of the cool wind against their skin. Rachel remembered Mike and wondered how he was. It was on a night like this that they talked about ordinary things, his dainty necklace, his girlfriend, New Jersey, and New York. She wondered where he was now. Has he proposed to Lee? Has he settled in New York? Penny for your thoughts? David whispered against her ear. Rachel shook her head. I miss this. I was so busy being crabby and mad at the world that I forgot the simple pleasures like just sitting beside you. Crabby is an understatement. How could you stand me? Well, behind your back, I secretly called you the Grinch, David said. Rachel laughed. Why are you always so happy? Why won't you give me a serious answer? David chuckled. Who said I'm kidding? Ask Alice. We called you names. Oh, no, you didn't, Rachel said, twisting in her seat to face him and started punching him playfully on his arms. I was teasing you, darling. Your mother and I won't do that to you, he said affectionately. Then his eyes twinkled as he added, Oh, maybe Alice would. It's funny, Rachel thought, how he can immediately switch his moods on and off from being funny to charming, to serious. His arms tightened around her from behind, and she inched closer to him. She was looking at their house, although only the front wall was visible from where they were sitting. I love this house. I'm not sure if I've thanked you enough. David planted a kiss on her shoulder. Yes you did, darling. Many times, in bed. Rachel laughed and leaned back, enjoying the warmth of her husband's chest, and feeling a little guilty that she wasn't able to sleep with her husband in a long time. For the past few months, she had been too sick to even stand up on her own, but she enjoyed having him tease her, so she didn't counter his joke. I like it that the walls are all white. And we have such a huge lawn. And look at the windowsills, they're deep maroon. I told you white would work on any color. Ah! Rachel continued looking at their house from where she was sitting until her eyes fell to the door. It was white against an unpainted wooden door frame, making the door stand out. Then she noticed a small mark on the left side of the door frame. Babe, what's that small mark? David laughed. Oh, that? Ignore it. Just for memories. Memories? David laughed and planted small kisses on her back. I told you to ignore it. Um? Did I tell you that you smell so good? Rachel chuckled, sighing happily. Don't you miss this? There were times, he said jokingly. Rachel laughed and grunted. When both of them had gone silent, it was Rachel who spoke. In three months, I'll have another scan, she began. Let's not talk about it yet. No, it's important. I know how much I hurt you during that time and what you must have gone through. I don't want that to happen again. What's important is that you're stronger now. And Alex is looking for better medicines, David said. It's not something that we can control. Rachel turned to look at David. I want you to promise me something. When the cancer cells grow bigger. If, if the cancer cells grow bigger, David corrected her. If the cancer cells get bigger and the treatment plan is going to be painful again, she paused, at some point, we both know that I have to stop. You have to promise that if I ask to end the treatments, you will let me. David's eyes looked pained, but he didn't say a word. Maybe when that time comes, he can still beg her to take the treatments. In silence, he voiced his objection. I can't hurt you over and over again, and I hate the monster that I turn into after each chemotherapy cycle. Yeah, it's like you're nursing a goblin in your belly. You're just impossible, how did I end up married to you? She laughed. David laughed too, but it was short and lacked its usual melody. Rachel knew he was as worried as she was. David had reservations about their finances. He had some money saved up, but if the cancer cells started to grow bigger and the chemotherapy cycles went on, his savings would be drained in a year or two, tops. He thought about his older sister Dorothy and wondered if he should contact her. She lived in Seattle, and he saw her only occasionally. 
He knew that she would never turn him down though should he ask for financial assistance to help with Rachel's treatment. He pushed the thought away. He still had money, and asking his sister for assistance would be the last resort. The other day, David searched the internet for foundations that helped fund lung cancer patients' treatments. There were several, and he started reading about the requirements, though he would still have to discuss it with Rachel and get her permission to contact them. He looked around his surroundings, saw the white paint covering the walls, the vast lawn in front of them, the porch, the picket fences enclosing the perimeter, and his happy wife leaning against his chest, and wondered if he shouldn't have bought the house. Had he known about her cancer, would he have proceeded with the transaction? It had taken a significant chunk from his personal savings. Rachel touched his arms that were wrapped around her, clutching at them tightly so that his embrace fit more snugly, sending all his loose thoughts into oblivion. Chapter 21 The words weren't new, in fact, they seemed to have been resurrected from months ago, bringing life to what transpired long before. And yet Rachel couldn't decide if the words still came as a shock to her because there really was something else that she preferred to hear. The difference was that when she heard it from Dr. Jones today compared to when she heard it the first time, David's here holding her hand. But not even that was able to chase away the needles of pain that started to rip her heart. Rachel glanced at David. His left hand was holding hers gently while his right hand was closed in a tight fist, white knuckles showing. The air around them felt warm, and Rachel couldn't breathe. She inhaled and exhaled slowly with eyes closed, thankful once again for her yoga sessions. I'm afraid the scans are not favorable. The cancer cells have gotten bigger. I have to check further to determine which treatment plan is most suitable for you. Dr. Jones looked at Rachel. Most probably, it will be similar to the previous treatment but with changes in some of the medicines. I'll just finalize the treatment plan. Again? Rachel said. I'm sorry, it's not what I was expecting either. There are some new growths in other areas of. Stop, David said. His eyes were glinting. Just stop. He glanced quickly at Rachel before storming out of Dr. Jones's clinic. Rachel stood up and ran after him. Babe, she shouted. She chased after him, but she couldn't narrow the gap between them as his strides were longer. Babe, wait. She shouted again. David stopped so suddenly as though he slammed against a glass door. Then he turned to face her. What Rachel saw in his face was an agony she couldn't describe that she wished she didn't have to see. At that moment, she'd rather have him walking away again. And then she would just wait for him at home. I can't do this anymore, he said. Babe. Every day, I see you go through all this pain, suffering. This is not right. We've talked about this, the only thing that could make this magically go away is a miracle. It's a vicious cycle, and I'm, he paused, choking on his words, I'm not sure if I'm cut out for this stuff. I'm trying to make this easier for the two of us. You don't understand. Somewhere along the way, you're going to leave me behind. Rachel's face blanched as though she'd been slapped, and this time, it was her turn to storm away from her husband. Great. Leave me now, why don't you? This will be so much easier. David shouted after her. You have no idea what I'm going through, David, so quit being selfish for a moment. The last person I'm expecting to hear that eventually, she paused, and her words came in a stutter as she said, I would have to leave you as you. Would you like to switch places? Because I would. Rachel rushed towards him and stopped an arm's length away. Then she slapped him hard across the cheek. You bastard. With one look at him, she started walking away again. David stood motionless as though all the words that left his mouth just dawned on him. His face twisted and he ran chasing after her. Please. It may be difficult for you, but it's more difficult for me. How could it be more difficult for you? Her words rang in his ears, a mix of annoyance and hurt. It is. It just is. You don't get it. You won't. But it is, he insisted as he trailed after her. Quit being immature, she retorted. Then she started walking away again. Rachel, I'm sorry. He shouted. But this time, Rachel just kept on walking away, oblivious of the other people who were now eyeing them with curiosity. When she still wouldn't stop, he shouted, How do you suppose a man survives his wife? 
Rachel stopped and waited. See, you don't know the answer to that, he said. Because he doesn't. Rachel turned to look at him and saw her husband's face. He shrugged helplessly and shook his head. He stood there, his shoulders slumped and sagging. His usually jovial eyes were sunken and sad. His hair, that was neatly combed back in Dr. Jones's clinic, was in disarray as the wind teased it, making it curl on ends, locks hang down his forehead. And right that moment, to Rachel, David looked like a lost little boy, and her heart went out to her husband. The images of how he's going to live without her haunted her. I won't, you know, David said softly. That was all Rachel could take, she walked briskly towards him. Oh, David, Rachel said, as she wrapped her arms around his waist and alternately arranged his hair and squeezed his body against hers. She tiptoed and grabbed his face and kissed him on the cheek as though her light kisses could take away the pain. We'll figure it out. What's there to figure out? Apparently, some stupid doctor has this all figured out. Buy this medicine, get on this treatment plan, what's next, huh? For him to tell us it's over? That's not true. He's doing his best. We know that, so don't go there with these accusations, Rachel countered. I'm sorry. I thought that we had a miracle. I thought. But, that's a fool's dream. Let's fight this. I need you, darling, please. I need you to be here with me. Please. He begged. Rachel couldn't respond. How could she? She was looking at him and fighting back her own tears. I'm scared. Oh God, I'm so scared, David continued. He wiped his tears and looked at his wife. He couldn't believe what he just did. He cursed himself silently. He probably made her more afraid and terrified by his outburst. Let's just get through this together, darling. Please. He begged, promise me. You owe it to me. It took a lot of courage for Rachel not to break down upon seeing David like this. For now, she would give him the answer that he needed. The kindest thing that she could give her husband at the moment, hope. Of course, babe. Of course. Then she embraced him and snuggled against his chest. He hugged her back, pressing his chin against her shoulder, squeezing his face against the gap of her neck as though fitting closer could make their connection permanent. She didn't know if the sudden shortness in her breathing was due to what she witnessed or her husband's excessively tight hug. It will be better, I promise. The thing with promises was that sometimes they get broken, and Rachel wasn't happy that her promise to David about her condition getting better was indeed a far cry from happening. True to Dr. Jones's initial assessment, Rachel's treatment plan was almost the same, with only a few alterations on the medicines. Rachel didn't want to start with the sessions immediately, but Dr. Jones told them that the sooner she started, the sooner she would be over with it, and she could normally live again. Dr. Jones was nice enough to not add for a while, but they both knew that was how the sentence should have ended. The days dragged, and the bad days became more frequent. Once again, Rachel fell into that black hole where every little thing irritated her. The few pounds that she was able to gain in the last three months were immediately lost. With all the pain that she was physically and emotionally suffering from, David stood beside her. Months later, the third scan revealed that the cancer cells hadn't grown any smaller. And there were additional growths again in her other body parts. She hated the details. She abhorred having to listen to what Dr. Jones had explained. On the way home, Rachel told David, I want to stop the treatment. I've been thinking about it too. It's not going to get better from this point, right? David took his time answering because he couldn't find the heart to affirm what his wife said, but also couldn't equally tolerate it to lie by saying otherwise. He chose his words carefully and said, we'll stop with the chemotherapy. He hoped his response would be enough for Rachel as he feared what she might ask from him. I meant the entire thing. David's heart thudded as his wife's words lashed upon him like whips. He swallowed before answering, it's not an option, darling. He wondered if right now was the best time for him to beg her to continue with the treatments. It is. It always has been. I can't go on like this. Being miserable all day, and driving you crazy with my moods. I want those last three months back. I don't care if they're the only ones I'll have. What I care about is to live my last days happily. It's painful, I know. But I'd rather have a short-lived fairy tale with a happy ending than a never-ending misery. David stared ahead 
to the still dark surroundings where occasionally, streetlights would appear. They paraded on the sidewalk and continued trickling in his peripheral vision as though they were stars reminding him of what he promised her before. When she asked to be let off the medicines, he would say yes. He signaled right and pulled over. When they were safely on the side street, David looked at Rachel and touched her cheek, torn whether to admonish her, or shout at her, or kiss her. The last urge won, and he found himself cupping her face, whispering, When did I ever say no to you? But David's heart was heavy, so when he reached out to hold Rachel against him, his chest felt like it's going to explode, and he wished it would, and then wished further that it would explode once more so that the pieces would be so little they wouldn't be able to hurt him anymore. David took one look at the open window, at the curtain swaying in the wind, and the unmade bed where Rachel slept, and he knew that something was wrong the moment he entered their bedroom. He rushed towards the window and looked down. The ladder to the fire escape was extended down, and Rachel's footsteps were imprinted on the soft grass of the lawn. He cursed as he hoisted himself over the window and went down using the same ladder. Upon landing, he looked around and saw her sitting behind a tree, her head covered with a scarf. She was wearing a jacket. From where he was standing, he could smell the cigarette smoke. He cursed again, walking faster to reach her quickly. Without looking up, Rachel sensed his presence. Are you mad at me? She asked. He exhaled and breathed in deeply, trying hard not to lash out. Lately, it has become more difficult. Rachel was harder to predict, but he couldn't blame her. You're giving me every right to be. She looked down on her lap and didn't speak for a while. She just played with a cigarette stick between her fore and middle fingers. I had a hard time climbing down, she started. David winced. My legs aren't as strong anymore. It took me ten minutes to get down from the window. I should have timed it and submitted it for a record on the slowest time to climb down the fire escape, she said, a hint of sarcasm coating her voice. I almost slipped. My arms are also weak. Alex warned me that I need to work my muscles. Otherwise, I'll be too weak to walk, she paused, do anything important. She was still looking down as she raised her left hand and rubbed the back of it against her eyes. David sat down in front of her and watched as she took the lighter with her left hand and played with it, flicking it on and off. A pack of menthol cigarettes was lying on the ground. Mind if I light one? David asked before taking the lighter from his wife. He took a stick and lit it before Rachel could refuse. Before speaking, he took a drag and let a thin trail of smoke escape his mouth. Rachel did the same, and as David watched her thin wisp of smoke fly and dissolve in the air, he almost laughed at the metaphor. The vanishing smoke was like his wife's life, slowly dissolving into nothingness. I don't have to tell you that smoking is bad for you, David said. Rachel shrugged. Does it still matter? To me it does. What is this, it's just another five minutes of my life cut off, or so they say, she said. You're also a smoker, you'll understand. Used to be, he corrected her. Then what are you doing now? She asked, eyes suddenly twinkling, teasing him. The shift in emotion surprised David, it took him a moment before he shook his head and puffed at the cigarette again. Rachel did the same. I want to take a moment. I'd like to stay here. A weak smile formed on Rachel's lips as she looked at him. Of course, babe. After a while, David asked, where did you even get the pack? I have a stash, she joked as though talking about smoking was insignificant. It doesn't matter. She took another puff and exhaled. She played with the smoke, puffing out small round circles. Then she threw a coughing fit. Hey, David said concernedly. Rachel coughed incessantly. David moved closer and stroked her back. Darling, are you okay? Rachel wheezed, lay back on the grass, and laughed. I knew that'd get your attention. You're just playing around? Is that what you want? He asked and then tickled her. She threw out her arms and flailed, pushing him away, dodging his fingers. She was laughing. Then she reached for his head and cupped his face to make him stop. David was grinning at her. You're a very naughty girl. Guilty, Rachel said, giggling. I don't want to lose you, David said softly. Rachel's hands froze. She turned her head sideways, escaping from David's gaze. She tugged at his head, bringing it lower to her chest, then she put both arms around him, 
felt his breath against her skin, and wondered when the last time was that a moment of happiness didn't turn sour. When she couldn't remember, she started to sob. Chapter 22 Susie looked out the window and studied the sky, there were no storm clouds above even though the news said that there would be heavy rains today. She was pleased when David talked to her about the picnic knowing that an activity like this was just what the family needed. She double-checked the contents of the picnic basket, fried chicken, sandwiches, and a few apples that she bought from the grocery. She carried the basket to the car and put it inside the trunk. As soon as she was finished, she returned to the house to make sure that the family wouldn't forget anything. Susie walked past David, Rachel, and Jeremy when she entered the house. Rachel gave her a smile, and Susie returned it. When she reached the kitchen, she wiped her eyes that had become moist. Seeing Rachel reminded her about what David shared with her a few weeks ago. He said that the decision to stop with the treatments was difficult, but it was what Rachel wanted, and they were hopeful that stopping with the medication will give them better days. David told Susie that it was a rough ride, but he learned a lot from this experience. Every day, no matter how ordinary, should be spent well. It's sad that there are things that people learn to appreciate only under dire circumstances. Susie watched as Rachel took Jeremy's hand and walked him to the car. Upon reaching it, David carried Jeremy and buckled him in the car seat. David helped Rachel to the passenger side and went over to the driver's side. With one short honk, he bade Susie goodbye. When David checked on Jeremy using the rearview mirror, he saw him sleeping. He took Rachel's hand and planted a soft kiss on it. He didn't want to let go of her hand. Not now. Not ever. At times, he found himself wishing that if Rachel would be gone, he'd still see her. Perhaps one last time, in his old age or in sickness, before he also left this world. Slowly and painfully, Rachel's condition worsened. There were times that she and David would spend their nights confined in the hospital while Jeremy was left at home with Susie. Still, Rachel refused to have the chemotherapy. David decided that it wouldn't be wise to push with that option because he had promised to give her what she wanted. Rachel was getting sicker by the minute, and there was nothing David could do with her continued weight loss. At home, she would spend most of her days in bed, sleeping, or in the hospital, recovering. He always prepared special things for Rachel. This was because he wanted her to know how much he loved her. Now that he didn't know if they would celebrate anniversaries, birthdays, and holidays together in the coming years, he became even more creative in picking out gifts for her. Today was another ordinary day, but with fears of losing his wife, David was forced to live each day as though it were their last together. That wasn't a nice thought, but it made each day worth preparing for, worth looking forward to. The other day, he was excited to finally be able to pick up the gift he ordered for Rachel. He hoped that she would like it. This entire incident in their life had been taxing emotionally and physically. Financially, her medication and his desire to indulge her with gifts were also draining him. But it was all worth it. If he could only buy her pain and keep it for himself, he would. His heart went out to his wife. He checked the box inside his pocket to make sure that he had it with him. Then he entered their room. He found his wife lying in bed. Since she hardly got up now, she asked him not to take her wig off as she slept. She said that she felt naked without it. David walked quietly and reached the bed without waking her up. He gazed at her tenderly. His eyes moved from her forehead to her brows, to her finely sculpted cheekbones, then down to her wide lips. He sat down on the chair beside the bed and gave her his usual kiss on the forehead. After a few minutes, when she still had not stirred, he kissed her again on the forehead. This time, his lips lingered longer on the forehead as he drank her in, taking every bit of her inside of him. As he pulled away, Rachel opened her eyes. Hi, darling. Ready to wake up? Rachel smiled. David knew it was already too much effort for her and his heart ached at seeing her like this. I have something for you, he said softly. Rachel watched him as he took something out of his pocket. It was a small rectangular box. The room was dim since even the lights bothered her. He gave her the box. She was looking at him, smiling, holding the box that he gave her, 
wondering in her mind what she did to deserve such a loving husband. Lately, the gifts that he showered her only added up to the long list of things to be thankful for because since she learned about cancer, everything felt like a gift to her. The air that she kept breathing, the strength that allowed her to stand up, move around, play with Jeremy, the love that she received from her husband, and, most importantly, the gift of time. When David noticed that she was just holding the box in her hands, he asked, Would you like me to open it for you? Rachel smiled at him and shook her head. There's no need for this. I kept on telling you. How many more times do I have to tell you this is really unnecessary, she said. I want you to know how much I love you. Every day. I already do. I have the best, Rachel said, hoping that this time, she made her message cut across her husband. That there was nothing else she needed. Only him. David seemed to appreciate what she said because he smiled. But would you like to see what's inside? David was excited about the gift if his huge grin was any indication. She still couldn't understand it though, how when he had something special for her, he was the one more excited about the gift than she. But she appreciated all his efforts. Each stupidly sweet one. Okay, she said as she handed the gift back to him. David smiled at her and opened the box. Rachel watched as he took the gift out. He held it by its chain and the pendant dangled, hovering over her. She couldn't see clearly what the pendant was until the light touched it. It was oval, and it glittered in several places. If she wasn't mistaken, she guessed that there were five diamonds on it. The gift instantly became a source of fascination. She smiled as a hazy memory of Mike entered her thoughts. He was wearing the same necklace the entire time that they were together. How strangely wonderful that she should have a similar one. She lifted her head slightly as David put the gift around her neck. So that you'll always remember the disco lights whenever you see the pendant glittering. And that you're the only girl I ever danced for. The only girl I'll ever dance with. She wanted to ask him where he bought the necklace. As though sensing her thoughts, David said, Do you like it, darling? I had it custom made. Blood drained out of Rachel's face. She touched the pendant, and using her thumb and forefinger, she counted the diamonds. There were five, she couldn't be wrong. She closed her eyes, trying to figure it all out. Rachel's eyes began to water. The tears made her face more alive, each one sparkling, mirroring the glitter on each of the pendant's diamonds. Part 3 Chapter 23 Rachel's Thoughts I can feel my life slipping away. The days pass by, and I just lie in my bed and sleep, wake up for a while, look around in my room, see the people I love, talk with them for a while, and before I know it, I have drifted back to sleep. These last moments, every day passed as though in a dream, the days were beautiful, peaceful, and I lay content. When I woke up, I was holding the necklace that David gave me yesterday. The chain was gold, and the pendant was oval with five diamonds on it. With weak arms, I raised the necklace to the direction of the sunlight so that I could see the diamonds glitter. And then I would remember Mike. This necklace was an exact replica of what he had been wearing the entire time that we were together. I still get goosebumps every time I look at the necklace and remember him. Could it be? Could God be so good that he decided to give me the miracle I prayed for? My prayer had been vague. To know that the ones I love will have a good life after I leave them. I was expecting my miracle to be another two years of my life, or sometimes, in deep faith, I prayed that the cancer would be totally gone. But what happened was that I got to spend almost two days with my son. A glimpse of what the future holds for him. Would that explain why Mike reminded me so much of David? Why do they have the same mannerisms? Why Mike shared the same blue-gray eyes? But why didn't he recognize me if he was my Jeremy? Why was he called Mike? Did he really become a doctor? And when Mike was driving me to the mall, who was that man I saw he called Dad? Looking into his eyes certainly made me feel a different level of comfort. The brief moment that our eyes met, I felt a connection that until yesterday, I wasn't able to completely define. I don't want to think of the answers. I leave it to God. These were his ways, and I do not want to question him. I realized that when life was fast drifting, unanswered questions were sometimes better left at that. Mike was my miracle. The one I got for keeping the faith. 
What will happen in between after I'm gone and the future until that time that I met him is no longer relevant. There were many questions about that incident, but I do not want to dwell on them. The important thing was that I had the miracle that I would hold on to until the last moments of my life. That's enough for me. I hugged the necklace close and felt a quick drift into the past and into the future, making me feel warm all over as though the bed's cover wasn't enough to give me that already. The time I spend awake is now very short. In a moment, I know that my weak body will succumb to sleep again, and I will be lucky if before falling asleep, chest pains won't bother me. This time, the comfort of David's love wasn't the only thing that will make me feel safe. The necklace and the memories it brought back were chains of faith that will keep me smiling as I yet fall into another slumber. The door opened, and David entered. He was carrying Jeremy. My husband told our son to always smile at mommy, and he's been such a good boy to obey his dad. I don't know how my husband was able to make our almost three-year-old boy understand that. David approached and sat beside me. I smiled at him and reached out to touch his hand. His hand met mine halfway in the air, and our fingers immediately interlocked, the familiarity of his warm hand blanketed me in comfort. I got my miracle, baby, I said as I lovingly looked at him. I'm sure he didn't understand what I meant, but in leaving him, I want him to know that I had all that I ever wanted in life and more. His eyes got watery, and he blinked back the tears that had started forming. He put our son on the bed and arranged for him to lie beside me. Jeremy has curly blonde hair, which he got from me. I touched Jeremy's cheeks and gazed at his eyes. They were sometimes blue, sometimes gray, depending on his eye's angle from the sun. Now I know that as he grows, they will develop into the exact color of David's. I remember how the older version of him wouldn't want to leave his dad to move to New York and a tear slid down my cheek. David gently wiped it away. He kissed me on the forehead, on the tip of my nose, on my cheeks, and lastly, he planted a soft kiss against my lips. I closed my eyes, finding comfort in his presence, in the way my body reacted to his touch. I love you, darling, was all he said. Then he moved into the bed with me. As I lay there, my husband gathered both our son and me in his arms. The clock was ticking, and with one last look at both of them, I smiled. I love you too, I said softly. I hugged him as tightly as my arms would allow me. Every part of me was aching, and I thought that perhaps it was time to go. I closed my eyes and surrendered to the sleep that was fast approaching, welcoming the pain and bidding the comfort away. Far ahead, a greater comfort urges me. The last thing I remembered was thanking God. There were still questions, but I'd like to hold on believing that I got my miracle. And with a lighter heart, I embraced my destiny. Chapter 24 The weeks dragged, and David found it hard to wake up, get up from the bed he used to share with Rachel, and welcome the morning light. He didn't want to face each day without his wife. He never thought that day would come. He opened his eyes, and in the millisecond right before consciousness fully took over, he felt all right. That there was nothing wrong. Until his eyes swept through the part of the bed Rachel used to occupy, and he realized that she's gone. A lump started to form in his throat. Rachel's things were still everywhere inside their room. The closet with all her clothes. The desk with all her stuff. The faint scent of her perfume that still lingered in the air. David closed his eyes and swallowed. Slowly, he rose from his bed and moved to where a picture of both of them was. He picked it up and gently touched the side where Rachel was gazing at him, smiling. He stood frozen, and he just wanted to be sucked into that place where she is now. Part of him told him to slink away from his life, to drink and smoke, to find a vice, a habit he could take on while he was moving on. Anything that could help him get over the loss of his wife. But Rachel wouldn't want that. She would hate him if he succumbed to any of these weaknesses just to cope up with pain. And so David was left carrying the emptiness inside his chest, to feel each shred of longing, to know what was lost to him he could never regain. His life was no longer his alone. He had to be responsible. That was what Rachel told him, especially when they had Jeremy. David belonged to Rachel, Jeremy, and himself. And now, part of that responsibility was waiting for him downstairs. Alice told David that it's all right to cry, and in the years that would pass, the wound would eventually heal. That his wife might be gone, but her memories would stay with them forever. Like a child, 
David gave in to his emotions and crouched down before sitting on the floor. He wanted to stay locked inside the room until he had sucked into his lungs, all the scent that Rachel left behind. Maybe then, the hurt would have abated. A gust of wind sliced through the room and the curtain swayed gently. The sudden motion stirred David's thoughts and brought some logic into his afflicted head. His wife was gone, but his world shouldn't stop with her death. He had to move on. He had to. David stood up on wobbly knees and walked towards Rachel's closet. He touched her clothes, remembering how each of the dresses that hung in her closet looked on her. How each time she brought home a new wardrobe and wore it the first time, he would be reminded of how blessed he was to have such a beautiful wife, and he would draw her to him and bury his face against her neck and whisper how sometimes, God allowed him to be so lucky. He opened the drawer where Rachel kept her spare clothing and slowly ran his fingers against their fabric. He tried not to cry again, telling himself that the heavy feeling inside his chest would pass. A folded stationery was inserted between Rachel's clothes. Curious, he picked it up and examined it. There's a script outside that reads, David. He took it and sat in bed. He touched the part of the paper where his name was written. Looking at it, an indescribable pain consumed him. Rachel's handwriting seemed to be forced as though she had struggled and exerted a lot of effort to write David's name. He began reading the letter. Dearest David, I know after I'm gone that you'll feel the pain of my absence. But that'll only be for a while. The days will pass and with it the sorrow too. I won't be with you now, but in the next instance we meet, there'll be no more goodbyes, no fare you wells. When I first learned about my health, I fought it. I didn't want to leave you and Jeremy. Just the thought made me strong enough to struggle against it only to learn later on that it's beyond my control. I don't want to talk about it in this letter. I want to just speak to you as we always have, or had before. The day we met was when I knew my life would change forever and I was right. Looking back, I knew that I couldn't have been luckier. You're the best husband one could ever have. A best friend. A lover. I remember a lot of things, the painter's hat you were wearing when we first met, how you looked when you finally found me in the dorm, how you reacted when I first told you I love you, and how you laughed at me when I told you about my theory. It's a silly thought that crossed my mind as I write this letter, but don't you think my theory is appropriate now? All you have to do is go back to that first moment when I told you I love you, remember how then, it still wasn't true, and maybe you would feel less hurt about my leaving. Does it make any sense at all? I remember everything, the good ones and the not-so-good ones. And the good are the things I want you to keep in mind filter the memories. While moving on, remember the good times. When you start to feel like I cheated you somehow by leaving, think of the not-so-good memories, maybe then you'd realize there was a reason I passed early. There's no good way to say goodbye, but a promise is all I have, that regardless of the distance that separates us, I will love you still. Love is infinite. The beauty of it is that it cuts eternally, and I will prove that. One more thing, There may come a time that Jeremy will have to choose between leaving New Jersey to settle somewhere else and staying with you. When that time comes, remember that it wasn't a choice between you and some other random person. Liken it to what I went through before, when I had to leave my hometown to be with you. Take care of yourself. Remember, you have my heart. You own it actually, so don't feel so sad because if you do, you'll make both of ours weep. Because yes, even in death, my heart can still feel you. I love you. Rachel. David read the letter again. Then after finishing it, he scanned it another time until he could almost recite each word and each line from it. He folded it carefully and put it inside his wallet. A remembrance for all the love that there was that he knew would stay with him. With quiet resolve, he would brave each day. Jeremy was downstairs waiting for him, and he hoped that the days ahead would be kind to take them in. Later that week, as David was putting Rachel's clothes into boxes, he came across her bucket list. Almost everything had been crossed out since the last time he checked it, a sign that Rachel was able to do most of those things. Then he got to the bottom of the list, item number 31. It read, Ride the Bike with Jeremy. When he read it almost a year ago, he immediately went to the mall and bought a bike for Jeremy. Then he asked his mother-in-law, Alice, to join them on a picnic. The highlight of that event was when Alice put Jeremy on the bike and started teaching him how to ride it. It was a funny sight, 
regardless of the circumstance. His 60-year-old mother-in-law was crouching down and instructing her grandson to pedal. All the while, Jeremy was thrashing on the bike seat and refusing to follow her instructions. Susie was in the background witnessing it all, laughing gaily at them. David carried Rachel and put her in the wheelchair. He started pushing her to where Alice and Jeremy were. After a few terrifying minutes, Jeremy began pedaling, and David started pushing Rachel in her wheelchair. It was only a few yards. When they finally stopped, he knelt in front of Rachel and looked at her. She was smiling at him. She touched his hand, and her eyes moistened without saying anything. But David understood what she wanted to say, and he smiled at her. When they came home that day, David gave Rachel her list, hoping that she would cross out that item. The following morning, just as he always did, he checked her bucket list to see if there were new items there. There was none, and to his dismay, he noted that Rachel had not crossed out that last item. A small smile formed slowly on the corners of David's mouth as he gazed at the list now. All items were crossed out. He folded the bucket list and put it inside the box that he was packing. He closed the lid, sealed it with packaging tape, and labeled it, Rachel's Bucket List. With a lighter heart, he took the box and went to the basement, where the other boxes were already piled up. Chapter 25 After One Year The days passed by so fast. Jeremy turned four, and he was already very talkative, a trait that he got from his mother. David knew that each passing day would be difficult without Rachel, he just never comprehended how much. A surge of poignant emotion rose in his chest as realization dawned on him that he had survived more than a year without her. He glanced at Jeremy through the rearview mirror of the car. The little boy was safely buckled up in the back seat. David slowed down the car before pulling over. He pressed the foot brake. Then he picked the bouquet of lilies on the passenger seat and turned to look at Jeremy. Just stay inside, okay? I'll be quick. Jeremy, a good boy, the little boy said. Don't forget the ice cream, daddy. With that, David smiled at his son and started walking towards where Rachel was buried. It was around 20 yards from where he parked the car. When he reached the place, he stood there. Uncertain of what to tell Rachel, he tilted his head up and closed his eyes. After a while, he opened them, but courage was an elusive emotion. He didn't know what to say. He shuffled his feet anxiously. Today was only the second time that he visited her because he didn't want to constantly be reminded of his loss. Hello, darling, David finally managed to say. It's eerie talking to you this way. He smiled weakly. I found your letter. I read it many times. There are too many that I think I can recite to you. David crouched down. I want you to know that I think about you all the time. If I do something around the house, I stop and wonder if you would approve. If I think you would like it, I will continue with the change. Otherwise, I would stop and reconsider. Other times, when I feel like arguing with you or just being my usual stubborn self, I'd still proceed. Sometimes, I think I do that because it will keep you alive in my heart. I more often than not picture you walking inside our house when I do something that you won't approve of. It's been a year, darling, and it's still hard. I have not, will not, get over you. All those times that we shared together would remain. At that point, David's emotions rushed out, like a boy once again, his cheeks were streaked with tears. I should have let you win our arguments. I shouldn't have been too stubborn at times. But you should agree with me that with each one that we had before, that brought us even closer together, right? I should have let Jeremy carry your middle name. You had always wanted that, but I was convinced that I should honor my father's memory by giving his name as Jeremy's middle name, he laughed dryly. And now, I just want more reminders of you, he paused to wipe his tears. Don't worry about me. There are moments that I'll be weak, but let me go through all this. I'll try to be brave for you, and for Jeremy, and for the other people we love. He put down the bouquet of lilies on the grass. This is for you. He stared at her tombstone solemnly. I miss you. I miss you so much. David turned to check on the parked car. He could see Jeremy looking at him. Now that he had talked to Rachel, he decided to come for his son and bring him to his mother. The walk back to the car seemed long and he appreciated the distance. Come on, Jeremy, 
he said as he opened the back door of his car. We're going to say hello to your mommy. He unfastened the seat belt and picked Jeremy from his seat. They walked hand in hand, Jeremy hummed a song that David couldn't quite make of. They sat on the grass, covering the burial ground. David pulled Jeremy closer against his lap. He brushed his lips against Jeremy's soft curly blonde hair and Rachel's face immediately came to mind. Jeremy stared at the grass that was growing where his wife was laid to rest. Daddy, when's mommy coming back? David felt a prick in his heart. Not today, sweetheart. Grow up to be a good kid and mommy will come right back. David smiled kindly at his son. Their blue-gray eyes met, and in that instant, he remembered what Rachel said the night before she passed away, the night that David gave her a gift. Rachel was surprised when she saw the necklace, and when he told her that he had it custom-made, her surprise turned to astonishment. She wasn't able to say anything at first, aside from thank you. He couldn't understand her reaction until after a few more minutes when she asked him to hold her. They were both lying in bed, she cried and kept whispering to him, thanks. He listened and held her. For hours they were like that. He remembered looking at her and falling in love with her all over again, even though she already had black hair then and was so much thinner than he would have wanted. Thank you for giving me this necklace. I won't be able to wear it for long, I'm afraid. She was crying. Shh, darling, stop, please, he said. He tried to console her and to wipe away her tears with soft kisses against her cheeks and her eyes. You don't understand. These tears, they're not because I'm sad. You've made me very happy, and I'll be leaving you in peace. David almost choked upon hearing her words. Let's not discuss this, darling. Knowing that you like the necklace is enough for me. I'm happy too. Rachel smiled at him, and once again, he looked at her soft gaze and melted. I think about Jeremy. I, she paused as though searching for the words to say from memory. I may not be able to see him grow, and I may not have a lot of memories to leave him to make him feel how much I love him. David tried to stop her by kissing her and holding her close, but she pushed him gently back. Babe, this is important, she said softly. She closed her eyes for a moment, and to David, she seemed to be racking her mind for some fond memory. Then a small smile formed on her lips, which made her left dimple show. Give the necklace to Jeremy after I'm gone. Tell him that I'm sorry I wasn't able to give it to him personally. Tell him that I'm sorry I wasn't able to say a proper goodbye. And then, Rachel paused as if searching for the right words. She smiled once more. When he feels that my love for him is ebbing away, all he has to do is wear this necklace, and he will feel me. One day, this may bring us together, so he must wear it, so that I will know it's him, and I can give him a hug. David looked lovingly at her and cupped her face before kissing her. Let's not talk about this. You have to promise to do that. Her caramel brown eyes were gazing at him, and whenever she looked at him in this manner, he wouldn't be able to say no. Not that he would dare to, his wife made a very rightful request. Of course. When he's old enough to understand. Could you take it off me? David stared at her. I want to hold it. With deft fingers, he unfastened the necklace, and then he handed it to her which she took with her left hand. She clutched it to her breast as though giving a part of herself to the necklace. Then, she snuggled against David's chest. He tilted her chin and gazed at her eyes. No words would come out of his mouth. He was just looking at her. Rachel reached out to touch his cheek, tracing a line down to his chin with her fingers. And baby, you'll do just fine. With his wife's words, David almost cried. He realized that there were moments that cut him deep, just like this one, and when the tears didn't flow, that's when he felt himself the weakest. The wind blew, and Jeremy shivered on David's lap. It's time to leave. David had nothing more to say to his wife. He was glad that Alice was still strong even at the age of sixty. She helped him arrange everything, from Rachel's wake to the burial. Sure, Rachel had a memorial plan, but he couldn't handle that before. David stared at the tombstone. Even the marble sign was beautiful. His mother-in-law really had a flair for art. It read, a loving daughter, mother, and wife. One of God's finest miracles. He smiled. Then he continued reading the script until his eyes fell upon her name. Rachel Michael Smith 
David opened the back door and motioned for Jeremy to move closer to him. Then he carried him and strapped him securely to the baby car seat. Daddy, Jeremy's special? Of course you are, he said. You're so special that if you had only been older and became a doctor, you would have found a cure for your mom. He smiled and gently arranged Jeremy's hair. He tucked his son's soft blonde curls to the back of his ear. He closed the back door. Then he went to the front and climbed in the driver's seat. Daddy! Jeremy yelled from the back seat. What's a doctor? David couldn't help but smile. Now he had given Jeremy another fixation. He was sure that Jeremy would continue bothering him about it for days until his son found another thing or another question to fixate on. A doctor is what I would have been, he paused, had I known that my paintings could only freeze a part of your mom, and being a doctor could have meant being with her for a longer time. Then after a while, he added, perhaps. He winked at his son. Jeremy didn't seem to understand, but the wink his father gave him was enough. He smiled back at his daddy and kept repeating doctor like a chant. David drove on, and with one last glance at the side mirror, he bade Rachel a temporary goodbye. Epilogue New Jersey, 2035 Mike drove back to his father's house. The two days that he spent with Karen had been fun. He still couldn't believe that he could meet someone and be friends with that person so easily. He wondered if she was safely home now, and hoped that her limp would be gone soon. Inside the car, Mike looked at his father's house and felt proud. It was so much bigger now than when he was a kid. The white picket fence was gone, leaving only holes on the ground that weren't fully covered yet. The house was no longer white. When he took over renovating their house a year ago, he followed the advice of a construction agency consultant to cover the walls with plaster. That meant that they wouldn't have to repaint the house every two years or so. The plaster would last longer, the color he chose was light gray. The roof was now blue as contrasted to the red that he remembered from his childhood until his college days. Once outside the car, he stared proudly at the result of the massive remodeling. There were only two areas in the house that his father didn't let him touch, his father's bedroom and the basement. Mike started towards the porch and saw his father already waiting for him there. The days pass by so fast now, the old man thought. He watched as Mike approached him. Looking at his son, seeing him all grown up made him realize that the years had been kind to him, to both of them. This morning was like any other mornings that he spent on this porch except that today, he couldn't believe that he saw his son with a woman who looked exactly like his wife. And smiling to himself, he couldn't believe that God might have answered his wish from a long time ago, that he would get to see her one last time. Dad, it's so nice to have you back, Mike said and kissed his father on the cheek. Mike pulled a chair and sat on it. How's Aunt Dorothy? As usual. She's complaining about her arthritis. I said that there's nothing she can do about that now and that it's a blessing. A constant reminder that she's still living, he said and chuckled. Who's your friend? A lady I met a few days ago, her name's Karen. The old man smiled. I could have sworn she looks like your mother. Yeah. You could say that again, he said. In fact, if mom's hair were blonde, I would have said that it was her. A flash of sadness crossed the man's face. How heartless of him to remove all of his wife's pictures from their house after she passed away. It was his mother-in-law who suggested that he put all of his wife's pictures and things in the basement after seeing how hard it was for him to move on with all the reminders of his wife inside the house. He put her things in boxes, labeled them appropriately, and temporarily placed them in the basement. It was only while he was getting over her loss, but it took him years before he was able to move on, and by that time, he didn't want to retrieve her things and rearrange them in the house. When he missed her, he would go to the basement and while away the hours looking at their pictures and remembering how it was between them before. The only remembrance that he gave Mike was a family picture taken when his wife was already sick. And she was wearing a wig then, a straight, black one. Mike was still very young when his mother passed away, and he probably didn't remember his mother being blonde. Son, there's something I have to show you, the old man said. His wide shoulders hunched a little as he started walking towards the basement. He wondered how Mike would react when he saw the basement. 
Mike couldn't stay mad at his father though because he's already old. Mike would certainly forgive him. Mike curiously followed his father. When he realized where they were going, his smile vanished, and his forehead creased in worry. They were going to the basement, and he had never set foot inside it. Not that he hadn't ever wanted to, or hadn't tried. The thing was, he had. He was only seven when out of curiosity, he took the basement keys. He thought that his father didn't see him. He'd been very quiet, he remembered. When he was sorting through the keyring with a dozen other keys, he wasn't able to open the door immediately. Finally, he heard the click signaling that he had found the right key, but when he looked back, he saw his father. He had never seen his father so sad. For a grown man, for someone who looked so strong, it felt wrong that at that moment, he looked so weak. Mike stopped what he was doing and ran towards his father and upon reaching him, hugged his legs, and cried. He kept on apologizing, promising that he wouldn't do it again. His father scooped him up in his arms, and they left together. Since then, Mike had been true to his promise. Dad? The old man inserted the key to the basement and opened the door. Then he gestured for his son to come in. Are you sure? Mike asked. He doesn't know what to make of his father's gesture. It didn't feel right to invade something that was so private and caused his father so much pain. The old man nodded. He had the look of quiet forbearance. Mike entered reluctantly, although there was a part of him that couldn't wait to get inside. When he passed through the door, the smell of dusty and dingy cartons filled his nose. His father turned on the lights. There were boxes at the far end. They caught his eyes because they were piled in a very organized manner and labeled neatly. He saw some of his mother's things unpacked and fittingly arranged in cabinets on the left side of the basement. He suddenly understood. He knew that his father fell apart when his mom passed away. Mike started inspecting the basement. On the right side of the basement, his father's paintings were neatly hanging on the wall. Perhaps these were the paintings that he made before he decided to pursue a career as a chef, a career his father never ever dreamed of. Or at least that was what his father claimed. Mike never believed him. His father was the best chef in town now. The basement looked like a gallery to Mike. He started walking around and examined the paintings. Mike was onto the third painting, skimming only each work when he came across one that made him stop short. It was his mother's portrait. She had caramel brown eyes. She had a wide mouth. She had a dimple on her left cheek. And she had curly blonde hair. He looked around on the tabletops and found framed pictures of a younger version of his parents. He grabbed a couple and choked as his gaze swept the images of his father holding his mother. This was probably when she was still well. Back when she was the spitting image of Karen. Mike turned to his father. The old man was smiling gently at him. Mike didn't realize that he had involuntarily touched the pendant of his necklace. Then as though they have a mind of their own, his hands moved to where the clasp was. His left hand found the lock. He pressed it and immediately released the necklace. He took the necklace off and held it in the palm of his right hand. Then remembering where Karen slept, he ran out of the basement, taking almost three steps of the stairs as he strode towards the guest room. He paused outside the guest room, hesitating at the last minute. Then he pushed the door open. His gaze fell upon the maid bed, then to the pillow where she had laid her head. He picked and smelled it, trying to remember her. Then as though calling out to him, he glanced at the bedside table. Slowly, his left hand pulled the drawer open. Inside, a leather-bound journal stared at him. He picked it up and thumbed it open, leafing eagerly at the pages. As he did, the business card fell down. He snatched the card eagerly and read his mother's name, Rachel Smith. A small smile formed on his lips. His right hand squeezed the necklace tighter, and in the ball of his fist, he kissed it. It was time to stop wearing it. The necklace had already brought her back. He was smiling, his heart overflowing with joy, but it didn't stop the tears from trickling down his cheeks. A few days with his mother were what he had. A few days that mattered. A few days that certainly would not ebb from his memory. The End Thank you for listening to The Necklace, written and published by Jane Vergara.
If you like this miracle, please click subscribe to show support. You may also hear on Kofi. Please check out the details on this YouTube page. Thank you and have a great day.